Hello everyone I hope you guys are having a great day and I'm bring you guys a new video of what if Naruto was in the gate universe. It's going to be different but still a good what if. Hope you guys enjoy and don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel for more what if videos. It was all nice and cozy in the chill room as the lads of many SAS operators were relaxing in the room reading the newspaper or watching the TV with a game on. Cups of tea were laid out onto coffee tables along with snacks. One person was just about sip his tea when suddenly. You lost them, came a roar down the corridor. Everyone stared blankly at the door in silence until one person dropped his mug of tea from the sudden shout. Down the corridor was the superior officer of the base Lieutenant Colonel McMillan who was facing his angry subordinate and friend Captain John Price. It was an accident Price, we had no idea that could happen. Accident my bloody old arse Macmillan. Do you have any idea who they just sent through that goddamned portal? There were three people sent through there you would have to elaborate on which one. My adopted son Macmillan, the blonde-haired blue-eyed lad that I was going on about for years that would do me proud as a father for his son. Macmillan eyes widened. Oh bollocks. Bollocks indeed mate. It's not that price, even if you have adopted him his biological parents are still searching for him. Is that Namike's fucker still trying? I thought he learned his lesson not to do that back in central London where his group of hired thugs were tasked in abducting Naruto three years ago would have made him think twice. He almost caused an international incident where they shot up Heathrow Airport where my son was there at the time disembarking from his flight from Japan. It got so bad that the SAS had to be called in. How he got away with it I will never know. Yes and I recalled that Naruto had cleared most of the thugs by the time teams were given the green light to engage. Yep I taught him well. And you should believe in him that he will be fine. He is not a child but a proud member of the SAS. Yeah you're right sorry for shouting. No offense taken mate. Macmillan nodded to his friend. And what of his biological mother? Kushina Uzumaki and her twin daughters have taken the correct approach and are currently earning his forgiveness by not bribing him back into the family but giving him the space that the needs and a heartfelt apology for his neglect. She was foolish, yet she still has a heart in her. Not only that she still has her fiery personality in her as it was announced back in Japan that she divorced that bastard's arse and split up the companies that were the Namike's main fortune and income was coming from. Really, when was that? Price asked. It was announced two weeks ago back in Japan. It all happened with an infamous scandal about Minato Namikaze having an affair with some Haruno slag, British slang for slut, who was the head of family branch company that was allied with the Namikazes. Macmillan said with a smile, I take it Kushina's didn't take tis well. Said a chuckling Price. On the contrary it was the opposite, she took it even better. The lass gave him a deserved ass kicking and divorced his arse and legally split up the company along with the Senjus and some other family companies that were mostly allied with the Uzumakis and wanted no ties with the Namikazes ever, and Kushina denounced her Namikaze name to just Uzumaki now. Macmillan smirked. Wow, do you think the lad will forgive her now? Probably. But the problem is it's because that is why she wants to see him about it. Macmillan suddenly went from joking to serious in a sudden 180 degree turn. Wait what price was suddenly caught unaware. You heard me price, I heard she is in the UK, right now. Macmillan said gravely. Price glanced out the window for a brief second. So where is she now, he asked. We don't know. Macmillan shook his head. What the hell do you mean you don't know? She is the CEO of UZU Corps for Christ's sakes doesn't she have an escort? She disappeared from her hotel room along with her daughters in London two days ago leaving a note saying that she will be right back and do not look for her. And they did, Price said incredulously. Price they knew she will be fine because she was ex-Special Forces also known as the Red Death and she. Crash, where the hell is my son, Databane, yelled out a furious female down the corridor. What the hell, gag. Slam. Who the bloody fuck let her in, dot. Crash, arg. 
Who cares about that? What I want to know is how the hell did a civilian get in this base? That's no civilian ghost, that is one angry tomato head beast of a woman known as the Red Death that is storming our base. Commented a Russian accented man. Boom, that unfortunate person came through the office door and in came an angry mother with two daughters frantically trying to calm her down and apologize to everyone that had been caught up in her fury. If Macmillan and Price's experience in Chernobyl and Pripyat was bad and scary, then this woman came close to that experience. As the saying goes hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Good morning Mrs. K. Death stare air I mean Ms. Uzumaki. Kushina gave out a huff in annoyance at that title. And walked up to Price and held him by the collar and lifted him effortlessly in the air with superhuman strength. And pulled out his Colt M1911 and held it up to his head. Price. You know where my son is, tell me now, she roared in her maternal fury. Click, drop him, said a Scottish man with a mohawk holding a P226 pistol against her head. Stand down soap, she's friendly, commanded Price Air sir, she tore up most of the base in her rampage. Was anyone killed, said Macmillan. No. Good, mark that as a training exercise for expecting the unexpected. Soap McTavish sweat dropped and looked out the door to see the carnage she caused with multiple elite men buried in walls and bent over window sill when they were launched through the glass and even one guy was dangling from his head being buried in the ceiling. Tables and chairs were flipped over and some smashed apart and the TV had a gaping hole in the screen of where someone's head used to be in and a ceiling fan off the ceiling and crashed on the floor there. Yes sir. He said as he left dragging out Nikolai to go clear up the mess. Go Manassai. Go Manassai. We are sorry for intruding and causing Amos but we wanted to see our NII San. Said the two twins one that was a long-haired natural red head like Kushina and the other a natural blonde-haired girl in pigtails tied down to the back of her head and the pigtails were trailing down her back. Kushina was dressed in her Armani brand business suit with a white shirt underneath the jacket that meant the word, serious business, but could still look sexed wearing it while she was kicking your ass. The twins were wearing a white button-up shirt that clung to their figures and short skirts and the blonde was the only one who wore stockings while the red-haired twin wore white knee-high socks. In hindsight they were adorable in the way they apologized as they were both crying tears at the amount of trouble their mother was causing. It's all right little lasses she is just concerned for Naruto that's all. Kushina put Price down and calmed down a little bit. So you do know where my Sochi is at, she questioned and not toning her level of glaring down. I'll have you know that he is legally my son as well. Price pointed out. TCH I will admit you are much better father figure for him than that bastard back home. Now, now mind the language. Your children are present, said Macmillan. Whatever, now answer my question where is my Nara Chan, dot. Demanded Kushina when her maternal fury instincts kicked in again. Price and Macmillan were now sweating nervously in their spots. Kushina was now tapping her foot on the floor impatiently. Well? I'm waiting. Erm Kushina I don't think I am authorized to say this. Cut the bullshit and tell me, databane, she yelled even further annoyed. All right we'll tell you but this must not be mentioned to anyone outside especially to the other countries and the Namikes. This is a class S secret. Do you swear on your life and your daughters that this will not be uttered to anyone? Kushina and the daughters both nodded. Good, now I hate to say this, but yesterday at 4.32 p.m. Naruto is declared MIA, announced Macmillan. Back on the outside of the office as the operators were clearing up they heard a loud gunshot and angry screaming and shouting. Three men, Soap, Ghost, and Roach, charged into the office weapons loaded with G3 and an M16A4 assault rifles and a G36C carbine. Price. Macmillan. Soap shouted as they breached through the door weapons loaded. And what they all saw was Kushina being restrained in a full Nellan hold by Price and the twins were trying to wrestle the gun that was in her hands and she kept firing off a few shots. Macmillan sat there unflinching but had a small cut on his cheek and the window behind him had a hole shot through it. 
Kushina was cursing at Macmillan at the news of her son's disappearance through this enigma that was simply known as the gate. And she cried her heart out for the blonde son that she had worked so hard to earn his forgiveness that she may never get back. And so did the twins at the thought of never seeing their N.I.I. Chan ever again even if they haven't interacted much they still loved as a brother. Naruto. Kushina wailed in sorrow. As she collapsed onto the floor of the office heartbroken at the loss. The three men slowly lowered their guns and gave a silent prayer for their fellow brother in arms. They knew he would be fine, because he is the one who dares. Unknown location, the other side of the gate. Despair, the one emotion that I have experienced the least. Not once have I ever felt so helpless in my situation with no help coming my way, I was alone in this unknown place with no reinforcements or a rescue party coming any time soon or never at all. What was the whole point to this mission anyway? Oh yeah me and my team were sent to investigate an anomaly that was this gate right here. Well it was all really interesting at first until I volunteered myself to venture through the gate and by the time I got to the other end of the gate, it collapsed. The connection from my world to this had just disconnected all of a sudden and the gate simply fell apart and collapsed, fan-fucking-tastic. Before I continue my name and rank is Sergeant Naruto Uzumaki call sign Maelstrom of the 22nd SAS Regiment. Now you may be wondering why a Japanese like me would be in the SAS, well to answer that I am part English on my mom's side of the family but she is born in England and raised in Japanese while my father was fully Japanese. I lived over in the UK with my adoptive foster parent who was high up in the regiment over in the UK and he is born as a natural British man so I got in easier that way believe it or not normally it would be very difficult or impossible. I was in the regiment and in the UK just to get away from home mostly, so I lived in the UK since I was 15 years of age with my foster father and then later I signed myself up for the military. Because I proved myself to be fully capable of pushing further on. My foster father Captain John Price then signed me up for the SAS because he believed I could handle the extra strain despite my younger 17-year-old body at the time. The officers were skeptical at first but then later they were convinced till I blitzed the selection process trials over in the Brecon Beacons with all of the grueling marches over the steep hills and cold weather for over 40 miles while carrying a 60 pounds Bergen rucksack carrying all of my equipment and stuff. Next was the jungle phase of training that took place in the jungles of Belize over in Central America where I had to live there for weeks in simulated enemy territory while keeping myself and my equipment in good condition. Then came the escape and evade capture training where I was given barely anything but an old vintage WW2 coat and then given minimal instructions to reach the waypoint scattered throughout the countryside without getting captured. Despite my hard effort in evading capture I still went through the interrogation phase where even though they were just acting and it was all a simulation it still felt real. They would try to be friendly at first and try and lure you into a conversation where you could eventually slip up and mention the information they are looking for. Then if you prove to be more persistent than their expectations long enough they turn towards the aggressive approach and shout out derogatory remarks about me and my family but mostly about my mother. At that point I had almost failed because I still held an emotional attachment to my family despite me leaving them, well mostly my mother and sisters. My mother was partially to blame for me leaving but she never meant it and would in due time would earn my forgiveness. My sisters were not to blame as they still loved me as their precious Nichan but they were still affected by the ignorance that involved in my upbringing in the Namikai's household. My brother Menma was an ignorant fool as well as an arrogant bastard who never deserved the title of heir to the Namikai's own company. It was always about him my parents have been doting on their eldest son to take over the company someday along with my sisters to take over the Uzumaki branch company UZU corporations which was systematically larger than the Namikai's own company since the Uzumaki clan were a sister clan to the Senju but due to a shortage in numbers they had to merge clans which made them even stronger. But the Namikaze clan was just one man who was orphaned at a young age who happened to be a genius and was adopted by my perverted godfather who is a very successful author in adult literature that had earned him millions and supported Minato into his rise to fame and success. While he was good at what he does but that's just that, he wasn't a good father. To him his company and country came first but where did family come into the equation? 
Technically my family is involved but mostly it was raising a suitable heir to the company and all that shit. Minato focused on Menma the most while my mother Kushina focused on the twin sisters, to be honest they were both a good choice as heiresses to the UZU Corp I will admit, neither one has no fatal flaws that could say otherwise. While UZU Corp was technically larger than the Namikaze company the people of Japan treated my father as if he was royalty and they loved him and my brother as if they were king and prince. But I was left with nothing, no inheritance, no support in what I wanted to do, not a fucking thing that could help me with my life. That's where I chose to leave as it had all gotten too much to bear with the constant disregarding of my existence. So I fled to the UK somewhere in England so I could start anew. There I had met Price who then took me in as his own son and taught me all I knew. Naturally my mother and sisters were devastated that I had fled from home and the country and they were heartbroken from it and had cried their hearts out for days, begging for forgiveness. At least they tried to earn my forgiveness but I don't think they will ever have the chance to do so now. My brother the prick that he is I doubt he even cared because in all honesty he can go stick his stupid head in a lit furnace and I'll watch him melt his own face off. He was too stuck up and selfish for his own good that it was sickening to an Uchiha level. Minato now decided that he cared but only because he would lose face from the company and tried to bring me back at all costs. He tried to bring me back through the legal means but I assured that it would not work because I had then legally changed my name over to Uzumaki and then moved and became a citizen of the UK and the EU so I had luckily escaped that one for the time being but I knew that he would definitely try again and this time use more underhanded methods of bringing me back like that one time back in Heathrow Airport. He wouldn't care if I hated him more than I already did only to prevent me from running again and in his mind bring shame to his family slash name. Yeah I like to see you try now asshole because you're all the way over there, while I'm here trapped in a strange place that I have no fucking clue of where I am. Naruto scowled to himself as he glared at the broken gate. He wouldn't be able to find information about me anyway considering I am an unknown SAS elite commando. Anyway after the third test of where I was tortured through the less physical and more psychological means like the stress positions and the waterboarding exercises. Man did I hate the waterboard exercise, stress positions is where you put a prisoner against a wall with their legs bent and their hands restricted and they are not allowed to move from their position despite how much pain you are getting from the sore achiness of your joints and muscles and waterboarding is where you either put a rag or a towel in someone's face and then to proceed to pour water over the towel cutting off the victim's air supply. This gives the victim the sneeze of drowning. I thought that it was over but Price decided to add an extra training where he took me to MT Everest for mountaineering training and after that I was made to do learn maritime combat like in the Navy SEALs and the SBS, Special Boat Service, except he mixed in both training regimes, then there was Arctic training over in Siberia and desert training in the Nevada desert. All of that I had to do in one year and three months. Hard? Definitely, impossible? Depends who you're asking doable? Why do you think I'm in the SAS to begin with and how I got into this situation? I was told to investigate this anomaly located somewhere in the Scottish mountains, somewhere in a cave that was carved out to fit this massive structure inside. The gate, thing was ancient and corroded with erosion by nature to the structure. Despite its age, there was energy emitting from the gate that was still running. We sent a small quadcopter drone through the gate to investigate on what's on the other side and minutes later reported that that it was clear to go through. I volunteered to check out the other side first as a precaution along with two others who sadly didn't make it in case something goes wrong. And as we were about to reach the other end of the portal, we was forcibly pushed out of the portal by an unseen force against my back and we crashed into the cave wall that was on the other end of the gate and I was knocked unconscious. Till I came round to my senses I realized that the gate's connection to my world had been cut off. And I was trapped in unknown territory. And my two other teammates had died from the impact as they both landed wrong, one was new same as me and the other was an officer. Both necks have been dislocated from the impact, poor sods I could really do with some of their help. And that's the story of my life so far. Now I have to find my way out of this cave and find out where the hell I'm at. Luckily we came through with most of our equipment, all of them were the important stuff that we needed in a close quarter combat to long range engagements. 
I have packed my L85A2 with and 4XA COG scope with a reflex sight fixed on top of the scope and an underbarrel HKAG 3640mm grenade launcher. A Mossberg 590 shotgun as a secondary with a bungee sling, the Sig Sauer P226 as my side arm with the suppressor and mounted laser pointer and three knives such as a cookery machete, a Sykes knife for multipurpose and whatnot and a survivor hunting knife with the serrated edges and a tomahawk for CQC or wood cutting. While we were in the mountains over in Scotland we didn't have time to switch BDUs due to the urgency in this particular mission to switch from our black kit into our disruptive pattern material or DPM camo BDUs that would be suited for the terrain, while there were no forests in the mountains and it was on home ground so we thought it wouldn't be a problem. So I packed the BDUs into my Bergen. The other two had their weapons, ammunition and equipment with them which was fortunate for me as I would have plenty of supplies to last me for a good long while. Didn't want to leave valuable equipment behind for someone else to find so I took what I could find. What the new guy had with him was what I found essential in dark places such as this place and one of my absolute favorite submachine guns, an MP5 with a torch handguard and a retractable stock but no reflex or holographic sights but that's okay. It was only a standard MP5 not the built-in suppressor variant but I was okay with that. He had the same pistol as me so keep that one for spares and the extra magazines. He also seemed to have borrowed a unique sledge hammer called the Cobber Hammer or a tactical breaching hammer from one of the operators, sledge I think he was called, well mostly I guessed it was his if the sign written in bold on the side of his hammer, property of sledge, gave it away. On the top was a very sturdy and strong forged head fixed on the top that can deal maximum damage with minimal slip on the target area. The handle was made from molded fiberglass that creates a strong grip that greatly reduces slip when swinging and hitting, and at the pommel end of the hammer was a forged crowbar. All in all it was a very good hammer to ignore and it could prove very useful. The officer had with him was more for a sharpshooter loadout such as a 417 Hong Kong dollars loaded with a 20-round 7.62mm magazine and 20-inch barrel, collapsible bipod, attachable suppressor, and a scope for medium and long-range engagements along with a spare scope with night vision capabilities. They both had their water canteens filled up recently so I took the extra water. Food is mostly ration packs and they were already in the Bergen. But the problem is that I don't have any tools to cook them with, only a flippo lighter with spare lighter fuel and four boxes of matches. Grenades wise I was sorted. Plenty of frags and flashbangs, some smoke and C4 explosives, emergency flares for immediate extraction that lasts for ages which was quite useless for the extraction part but in dark places such as this it was quite useful. And I was also given a type of gas given to me by smoke, it's like CS gas but a deadly version of it. What's in it? He said it's best if I didn't know, I wonder how secure my respirator is? I still had my mountaineering equipment such as a grappling hook, Far Cry 4, with a strong rope attached to it, a carabiner clip, a full body harness that was custom made for the black kit and a petzel to allow me to operate hands free while I am hanging from the rope and I have to engage hostiles while I am hanging from a rope. Ice picks? May be useful so I will take them anyway. I had the standard issue S10 respirator gas mask with filter lenses to protect my eyes from bright flashes from a flashbang or brightly lit areas and spare oxygen filter canisters to keep out smoke and harmful gases I have salvaged from my teammates' equipment. Okay, check that as I am currently wearing it with the hood over my head and mask. Black flame retardant body suit with hood and thin lightweight and flexible gloves with Kevlar knuckle caps and a balaclava with no mouth hole with a skeleton jaw neck warmer ghost mask that had been gift from ghost, cheers man. Kevlar body armor complete with knee, elbow and shin pads, never leave without it. And the best part about them is that they are non-restrictive, almost. I still have my favorite PDA that looks like a militarized iPhone 6 slash Samsung Galaxy S6 only it is solar rechargeable, awesome but no internet, crap, well I can still listen to music and do other shit I can do with it like record my findings. Tactical vest and my tactical all-terrain boots, uh huh. Weapon cleaning kit, don't want no weapon jams no excuses just clean it.
and conveniently the mini drone was still here so could possibly connect to it and use it for my own uses. All of this including my black kit with body armor minus the Kevlar helmet and a Bergen that was luckily with me. This could prove really troublesome to haul such weight around the place. The fortunate and unfortunate is that most of my equipment such as cooking utensils and camping equipment was all set up back on the other side of the gate, I still had my rations and water which was lucky. I kept the three-throat two-way radios but I wouldn't be using the anytime soon. So pretty much all that was in my Bergen was food, water, tools, weapons and ammunition. There may come a time where I may have to be forced to abandon the Bergen rucksack for the mobility if I am caught in a conflict. I only took the necessary stuff like ammunition, rations and supplies and left the rest seeing that I already have it. And I placed the bodies beside the gate. I couldn't really bury them in a cave now could I so sadly I have to leave them here. Looking around I noticed that the exit of the cave was caved in so I couldn't leave through that way way unless I would want to blast my way out but I am not that suicidal. Fortunately there was a passage leading directly further and deeper into the dark cave which I suspected wasn't. So I paid my last respects to my comrades and brother S in arms and headed off further into the tunnel or whatever the hell this place is. Making my way through the darkness with an MP5 in my hands with the flashlight on and the gas mask still being worn on my face but the oxygen canister detached and the hood still covering my blonde wild hair that I refused to cut. I realized it actually was not that difficult to haul around so much weight as I previously thought but the feeling was still there digging into my shoulders. I still couldn't find anything noteworthy in this place apart from the gate that looked oddly Roman on both sides of the gate. Later I found inscriptions in the walls that looked strangely familiar to Latin used by the ancient Romans. But I wasn't sure as the writing was severely faded and chipped out from the erosion. Then I hit a dead end of the tunnel, bollocks. I said in frustration, but then I noticed that there was a draft coming through the walls. So pulled my sleeve up from glove-covered hand and held my wrist towards the wall and hovered over the stone wall until I felt the draft coming from small cracks in the form of a doorway. I pulled out the trusty custom sledge hammer and tapped the wall surface and heard that the wall wasn't that thick at all and I raised the hammer and gave a mighty swing and struck the center of the wall, the hammer head proved useful and efficient in its hits as it was designed for non-slip contact against surfaces, that way each swing will hit harder and deeper into any stone and wooden, and weak and thin metal surfaces. With the first swing I made a hole big enough to fit my head through. I peeked through and brought out my torch slash flashlight and saw that I was definitely not in a cave. In fact it looked like a mine, if the pickaxes, wheelbarrows, mine carts and hoppers gave any indications. And the mine was huge. Like Lord of the Rings mines of Moria huge and deep. I couldn't tell how deep it actually was even if I flashed my light down there or tossed a flare in there I still couldn't get an accurate calculation. Most mines I would know are just open pits that can be seen from high above or even from space, but this one looked like it was carved out through a fucking mountain how the hell did anyone do this? I gave a few more swings with my sledgehammer and I knocked down the wall with ease and stepped out of the tunnel. When I stepped out I wasn't quite ready to see of what looked like an underground city built around pillars supporting the ceiling of probably an entire mountain. Play Devil May Cry 1 Soundtrack Castle Stage. Asterisk Whistle, Asterisk Impressive Place They Got Here. Could do with some skylights though and let some natural light in. I mused to myself in my inspection of the place. I looked around and saw that I was on a part of a cliff edge that was used mainly for mining, Looking over the edge was just a deep dark abyss and most likely there would be buildings down there. Even if this place used to be a city or whatever the hell this place is, it was creeping me out with all of the darkness and everything abandoned and an abandoned city cannot mean anything good. Although I digress this place could also ruins but the building looked a bit more recent like only a few years had best or a decade at least. I then saw an old light-up torch that used in cave exploring in somewhere like old ruins lying on a torch stand carrying three more torches with it. And it was standing right next to a burnt-out fire pedestal. I grabbed a torch that still had some of its rags on, so I brought out my flippo lighter which I conveniently had with me, I don't smoke it's just useful to have one. 
I flicked the lid off the lighter and ignited the lighter under the torch and watched the torch set alight and illuminate the area around me covering quite a good area. Satisfied with what I had I snapped the lighter shut and set off with a torch in my left hand and an MP5 in my right. An idea that had sparked my curiosity about how deep this hole goes, so I grabbed a flare and lit it alight and threw it down into the abyss below. After seven seconds I heard a thud and all I could see was a small speck of red light shining in the darkness. Cammy, how deep is this place? How the hell do I get out of here? I wondered while flashing my flashlight around my area nearest to me and I could see some stairwells leading further down into the darkness and some bridges that led to the other side and into the city. Only problem was that the bridge that connected to the city was gone and there were no other ways except going down and across to the other side stairwell when I looked down with my flashlight and saw the other stairwell. Well, looks like I'm going down into the darkness. Looks at the old crumbling apart stairwell with no safety handrails and look like it would collapse underneath me with one step, who's the idiot who designed these stairs? I sweat dropped as I took one light step on the stairwell until the edge of the stair had cracks forming and shifted slightly while rubble was crumbling off of the stairs. Nope, fuck that. I'll abseil down. I said with a shrug and shaking my head. I pulled out the grappling hook and rammed one of the hooks into a stable ledge that had good grip and was certain that it would not give way. With a nod with satisfaction I stood over the ledge with the bergen dangling below me by a spare rope. I had it dangling below me because I needed the space to operate the rope and the MP5 hanging from my side in a sling, the torch that I was still holding despite the difficulty of abseiling down with barley any light source and a pistol in the holster that I could whip at any time, but that is mostly for any hostels that show up. But in this dark environment like this abandoned ruins what are the odds in that happening? About two minutes of abseiling and using up a lot of rope to get down to the bloody bottomless pit that I had myself going further into, I could not see the amount of rope I had left to abseil and I could only see the light of the flare getting closer but I felt that it was only halfway. While paying attention to the distance of the flare I felt my right elbow hit something strong and sticky. I tried shifting my arm but the strange substance was pulling it back. I shined my torch over my right arm and found that the sticky substance was a giant strand of web that I had gotten stuck on. Strange? This looks like a, web. I mused to myself, while I was getting more curious with the web I brought out my MP5 torch attachment and shone the light out nearby and saw what looked like a network of oversized spider webbing. And as I turned my head to the left I came face to face with a skull wrapped in web along with its body. The skull appeared to be screaming in either agony or helplessness. He also appeared to be wearing one of those Roman cuirasses armor. What the hell? No spider's web is not that strong to support a human body nor is it strong enough to haul such weight around. I said bewildered at the sight. I even noticed that there were bodies around that looked more recent like only a few months or one that looked like he had been killed today with a look of pure agony like something was burning him on the inside. Moreover I was getting bad vibes about my current situation here, I feeling that I was in such a bad spot right now and I should get to the bottom, now. As if a sixth sense had been ringing in my head I suddenly over to the right to dodge an incoming stinger that plunged into the cliff face from what looked like a, oh shit that is a giant spider and that wasn't a stinger it was its leg that looked like it would penetrate through three or more different guys in one stab. From one look it had spindly legs, multiple eyes, and venomous calissary and a bulbous abdomen. And it was looking at me like I was dinner. First I was sent through a gate that suddenly cut off the connection to my home trapping me here in this mining city under a mountain and now I am trapped in a web with a spider planning to eat me, how time flies. Ha! Huh. Get it. The spider screeched at me, preparing for its attack. I am so asking for a pay rise if by the time I get back home. I shouted in annoyance as I prepped up the MP5 by switching off the safety and slamming on the receiver ready and loaded. Come on Inzy Winzy Spider, cause here comes the maelstrom to wash the spider out with bullets. I smirked behind the gas mask. It gave of another screech as it charged across the web raising its large body up and bring down two long legs to stab me. Play Seldweller, Switchback, Detroit 2000. 
In a nick of time I swung to left this time to avoid the two long legs and I locked the petzel crawl in place so I could operate hands free. I had a bit of trouble because I had awkwardly placed the torch in between my legs because I needed to use my hands to operate the rope while abseiling and using my weapons. While the spider was distracted I fired into its abdomen wounding it severely and the spider shrieked in pain but quickly ignored the pain because of its increasing anger and continued to try and tear me off the rope. I didn't give it a chance to come closer as I gave it a short burst illuminating the darkness around me in bright flashes while the bullets peppered its face with multiple holes and tearing a few chunks of its head off as it collapsed lifelessly into the abyss. I heard another spider crawling up the wall underneath me so before it could get the jump on me. I jumped back and the spider missed me when it charged. The spider now confused at what happened to its prey until it felt that something land on its head. The looked up with its eight eyes and all of them were staring down the barrel of a HK MP5. Ratatata, the submachine gun roared as it blasted out a barrage of 9mm bullets into the spider's many eyes and into its head. The spider fell lifelessly into the abyss and I landed safely with my feet on the wall. Another spider had appeared in my line of sight slightly to the right as the light of the torch had reflected off of its eyes that gave his position away and I swung around and open fired on the spider's position that was creeping along a web that was leading straight towards me. The bullets tore through his face and killed it instantly. I gave a short breath of relief but as I was about to take out the now empty clip out of the MP5 my guard had slipped slightly as another spider had appeared out of nowhere which surprised me all of a sudden as I did not hear him coming despite its large size and it had knocked me into the cliff face wall, knocking the empty clip out of my hand and pinned me to the wall. It constantly tried to bite a chunk out of my head or shoulder with its large venomous appendages near its mouth that also had sharp fangs for teeth. I held a firm grip on the arachne's calissary fangs as it tried to pierce me but I kept on pushing the spider back with all of the strength my trained body could give me. Despite its size I managed to hold it back for quite long while I was also using my legs to push that massive face away from me. It had gotten quite close to my face and I had a good view of its mouth as it hissed at me and spat at me straight into my gas mask, lovely. Deciding that I had enough it invading my space I pulled out my tomahawk and struck it straight into one of its eyes with the pointed bit of the tomahawk. The spider recoiled and pulled back lifting me up with him as I still had a firm grip on the axe, flipping me over onto the spider luckily the torch had landed with me on the spider's back singeing its carapace. I recovered my footing and balance on the spider and I gave the tomahawk twist bringing more agonizing pain for the giant spider as it had its mouth wide open I brought out a frag grenade and pulled out the pin and quickly threw it into his mouth only for it to swallow the grenade just before it could recover and attempt to throw me off of its back. Then I grabbed the torch and petzel, setting it to release and jumped of the spider before its head exploded in a shower of arachne spider gore. I quickly locked the petzel before I abseiled down too fast. The held firm grip on the rope and I flt my body lurch from the sudden pull of my harness, I was safe for now but the problem was that I was swinging around uncontrollably and too fast which could potentially dislodge the grappling hook from way up there. Song End Soon I collided into something that acted as an air brake that stopped me from swinging around. Oof. I said as I felt myself winded by the sudden impact and felt that my face slash gas mask had landed into something soft and squishy. I noticed that I had stopped frantically swinging around like fucking Tarzan. But I am stuck to something that looks like a web cocoon and I am having difficulty getting out of the web. I had to give them credit in making something so incredibly annoying, it's like a child with its feet trapped in deep mud. And as I shifted my left hand next to my face in attempt to push myself off of the web-like cocoon, I swore I heard a moan when I was pushing. Getting confused by the sudden moan I gave another push and I freed my head but I heard the moan again, this time it was louder. I was now really confused until a sudden realization popped into my mind, wait a minute. Soft and squishy, that could only mean, squeeze, nyan, the same voice moaned again and led me to face fault. Erm. That sounded human. Deciding to not waste time I pulled out a Sykes knife out of the holster on my forearm. And cutting through the web. 
While the web was strong enough to hold a spider it was surprisingly easy to cut through at first but the sticky residue of the web was covering up the blade and I had to clean it off so it wouldn't interfere with the knife's cutting. At last I cut through a quarter of the web off of one side of the cocoon and grabbing a handful of the web I tore it off, and what came next almost made my nose exploded in a shower of blood inside my mask. Two exposed F cup and glorious T.I. I mean breasts that were fully tanned but exposed. Until I felt a chill go down my spine when looked up and straight into an eye of a woman who was silently staring at me in an unnerving promise of pain and torture. Her tanned face was calm and stoic like that of a warrior, but I could tell that she was not happy by the look in her piercing ruby-colored eyes or eye as her right eye was covered by a white eye patch and the small blush forming on her face. I could see that some of her hair was silver but most of it was covered by web so I couldn't tell how much hair she had. And she had a on her left cheek trailing down to her jaw. Oh shit. Someone's still alive in there. And I accidentally fondled her, crap she looks like she wants to murder me, quick say something that will defuse this situation. I mentally yelled comically. Air, how's it hanging, I said casually. Really? Out of all things to say to calm her down why did I pick that? Her reaction was blank as she raised her eyebrow in slight confusion to what I said she continued to stare at me until she looked around and noticed that she was hanging from a web and gave out an analysis of the situation. Oh, we appear to be hanging from a web. That is actually is troublesome. It worked. That old pun actually worked. No it probably didn't because I think she didn't understand what I was saying, but I most definitely understood what she said right there, that is almost unmistakably Latin but with some differences. I heard loud noises above us, I assume that was you, she asked me. Okay I understood that but how do I speak it, I know Latin sort of but who the fuck speaks it in the 21st century, no one. Fuck it I'll go with the flow. Yes that was me up there with the giant spiders. Did you have to make so much noise? Whatever you did up there could be heard from leagues away. I am surprised that it didn't attract every monster in this mine. Few safe, I exhaled slightly under my breath inside the mask. So I'm not alone in this mine, mountain, or whatever this place is called. You don't know about this place, she tilted her head and lifting up an eyebrow. I shook my head in denial. This mining city used to be a great dwarf city of Khazad Lodhar, made it up using Khazad from the LOTR Khazad Dumb and the Fantasy City Generator. But over a century ago this city fell to an unlikely alliance of spiders, goblins, and even orcs and even aggressive mountain trolls that invaded the city and slaughtered the defenders and driving out the inhabitants leaving them without a home. The Empire however heard about this and turned their backs on the Dwarven Kingdom, they were more interested in the riches within the kingdom than the people within the city, so tried to conquer the city for themselves. But ultimately it ended in failure, they were in unknown territory and fighting in the darkness that gave the monsters the advantage they took to slaughter the soldiers. The campaign ended in disaster and the general who led it was executed for his disgraceful failure. After that the city laid here forgotten and abandoned, used as nests for these savage monsters. However that didn't deter everyone from entering this place, once the stories were told about the dwarven city's riches in treasure, precious gems and gold and even rare metal ores a great number of people jumped at the chance to gain the riches for themselves. Most of them were adventurers who were overly cocky and confident and ignorant of the place's dangers within because they didn't research well enough. Or even mercenaries hired by the greedy nobles of the empire or other kingdoms who had the no edge to know about the place but the nobles didn't give them the accurate information or didn't share any of the knowledge about the dangers with the mercenaries at all. And that misinformation inevitably killed them, she explained. Wait dwarves? And did she say goblins, orcs and even trolls? Not only that but she said nobles, as in aristocracy? Where the fuck am I? I yelled in frustration in my head. So are you one of these adventurers or mercenaries? I guess you could call me an adventurer but I didn't come here for the treasure, we have our reasons for coming here. Who's we? Suddenly her eyes lit up in a slight panic. Oh no Cathal, she shouted behind her. 
Who? My partner she is on the other side of me, and she's been bit not long ago. And she's passed out. How long has it been since she was bit? Mountain spider's venom is slow acting only taking effect in 20 minutes. So we have 18 minutes to get her down, which is going to be tricky. I sighed. I severely doubt the rope or even the hook will hold. Suddenly I felt a jerk on the rope pulling my harness and slightly lifting me up. And then I felt myself drop with nothing holding me. And then I saw that the rope was falling and then the hook falling past my view. Oh you have got to be kidding me. I said in frustration as I mechanically winded up the rope with a device that was hooked to the back of the harness until the hook reached the base. The hydraulic hook and rope that was new tech that was designed to abseil down anything and be able to extract the rope quickly and without the hassle of doing it manually. What's happened? Those bastard spiders dislodged the hook that was holding me up against the cliff safely, now I have lost my support that's holding me up safely. And now the only thing that is holding me up is this web and you. She blushed as she noticed the close proximity between the two of us with our chests pushed up against each other and with my right hand holding onto her exposed shoulder that was near her exposed chest and my left hand carrying the torch that was the main source of light to see around, and her hands were constricted by the web. It also didn't help that my pelvis was so close to hers and I hope she is wearing something under that web otherwise I would die in embarrassment or shame, maybe both. Then suddenly I felt the web drop suddenly as if it was collapsing. Then it dropped again, this time I heard a snapping sound. Over there, she said looking at the direction where the sound came from. I brought up my MP5 and shone the torch in the direction of the web until I saw one bloody spider that had been really sneaky and crept up on us and instead of attacking, it decided to cut off the web that was supporting me and the two trapped in a web. Those crafty eight-legged shit stains I said mentally in my head. I saw one of its leg hovering over a large strand of web and was getting near the thread of web in preparation to cut it whilst it was staring at me. No. I told the spider. The spider continued to stare blankly at me and its leg got even closer. No, 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 don't even think about doing it. I warned it. The spider ignored me and was now grazing the web ever so slightly. Now, now Mr. Spider, don't make me shoot you, I said in a sing-song voice while pulling out my MP5 and pointed it at the spider to intimidate it. The spider must be intelligent enough to understand what happened to its brethren. But this spider apparently wasn't as it continued to ignore me and was now starting to cut into the web. Suit yourself. I shrugged and pulled the trigger, until. Click. Eh. I said in confusion until to my horror and face fault behind the mask as I made a realization. Where is the ammo clip? I muttered in my mind as I noticed an outline of what was supposed to be an ammo clip secured into the gun and was supposed to load it. Until I re-winded back a few minutes ago when I was battling the spider and one of them had crept up on me and. Ah. Uh. I looked down into the abyss and mentally shouted in my head, that ugly fuck knocked it out of my hand. Now I was staring blankly at my gun and disbelief behind the mask was etched onto my face, not one has this critical rookie mistake had never ever happened before and would never be tolerated in the regiment. If the guys heard this they would never let me live it down. I looked back to the spider only to see it give out an eight-eye smile and a spider equivalent of a savage grin as it had already cut through the web and was now holding us by a thread and then let go of it sending us down into the abyss. Phew. -woo. Kaiowea. We both screamed as we both fell into the darkness down below. They say that life flashes before your eyes the second before you die, where life had almost hit me in the face, literally. For a brief moment I felt a small stretch of memories hitting me, reminding me of all the moments I had experienced in my stupid life. My childhood, my pre-teens then coming up to my late teens. Showing nearly everything I have had to suffer to get to this point of where I am at now only for the memories to fast forward straight to the present as my death was denied. But in that small moment I had remembered a few memories of the happiest moments in my life. My fifth birthday of where I first remembered spending the time with my mother and two sisters, Mito and Naruko. Minato and Menma were not present as one had work at the company and the other didn't care as he spent his time with his friends. 
but it didn't matter to me, somehow I knew they still cared, they were just misguided and that memory had shown me proof of that I had remnants of what was left of my family, to be put back together again. The second memory was with my foster father Price and the lads from the regiment back in Hereford I was 17 at the time of my graduation and I was the youngest recruit they had, so the lads had to throw a party for me for that. Macmillan, Soap, Ghost, Gaz, Roach, Nikolai everyone, they were just a blast to have around. And the third memory was where I was transferred to join the counter-terrorism unit Rainbow Six that had been reactivated due to some incidents. I was nominated to go along with four others from either the same regiments or from somewhere else. We were picked due to our specialties in attacking and defending roles. I was partnered up with another old-timer like Price and Macmillan but equally as dangerous as them, he goes by the alias Thatcher and like Price and Macmillan he also participated in several notorious operations and was a veteran of three wars, he saw action at the Battle of Goose Green during the Falklands conflict, participated in Operation Nimrod of the Iranian Embassy siege as a part of Team Blue in 1980, and was also assigned to Unit Bravo 20 of the SAS during the Gulf War in 1991. Pretty impressive I do say so myself. Thatcher specializes in anti-electronic warfare with his state-of-the-art EMP grenades that will knock out any electronic gadget or plug within a specific radius and in an instant it sends out 12,500 volts per meter. Next was Sledge to which I now currently have his hammer that had been previously been borrowed by my dead teammate who was named Lloyd, the officer I was with whose name was Holt had also borrowed a few special gas grenades from another fellow operator Smoke. Sledge specializes in breaching with his hammer as he was known for his strength, while Smoke was a defensive operator that is uses his specially made noxious gas. And finally there was Mute, well he pretty much lives up to his name alright. The guy barely talks and only does so when necessary. Mute had also developed his own piece of tech that is designed to knock out or jam radar signals and bomb charges all of that in one portable box. The team I was transferred to were geniuses in their own rights, through experience through years of service along with knowledge in other respected fields. The other teams of similar counter-terrorism units were selected through those reasons alone. The third memory was with me and everyone in Team Rainbow. Granted they didn't think much of me at first and wrote me off as a green newbie, the recruit. But I soon proved them wrong where I saved their asses multiple times. Those were the last memories I had experienced before I was forcibly pushed back into reality. I opened my eyes as I was brought out of my short unconsciousness and I blinked from the surprise to see that I was still alive and I hadn't met a gruesome death, okay, talk about cutting it close. I mentally sweat dropped as my face was staring at the floor about a meter away from my face. After the spider had dropped us down the into the pitch black darkness mining trench with me and the two trapped females, at least I assume the other one is a female? That nerve-tormenting experience of free-falling without any safety ropes or parachutes I really thought that this was it. But luckily for us and unfortunately for that bastard spider way up there along with the other spiders, they have unwittingly threaded so much web down in the trench that the further we fell down the more web we had been caught in further decreasing our dropping speed. The web still tore off from the wall but it was enough for us to slow down to reach the bottom with a small thud on against my face. Ha ha ha. Thought you had the last laugh didn't ya, bitch. I've had people trying and failing to kill me for years, but kudos to you as you came pretty close along with a few others. I said mockingly while looking up where the spider was way above us but it couldn't hear me so I settled for flipping the birdies at it. This is not the time to be mocking the spider. My partner will not last much longer you must help her, the silver slash snow white woman said sternly at me as if she wasn't affected by the near death experience but I could tell she still was, she was just good at hiding it. Alright but do you want me cut you free first so you could help? Would take too long to cut through the web, forget about me and focus on her. Fair enough. I shrugged and got to cutting with my stronger and sharper hunting knife that I though would be better in this situation with the serrated blade and cut myself loose first and turned the cocoon over and saw an outline of a large humanoid figure. She did say her partner was a she right? Looks a bit too large to be an average female. I analyzed. Oh well less thinking, commence cutting. 
I cut around the outline and then began to peel off the web on the top half and what was revealed was a quite a shocker, scratch that it made me doubt my ever dwindling faith in realism. This place was messing with my head that's for sure. Are those horns on her head? What are you waiting for? She is turning pale, stop gawking and help her already, the silver-haired woman who was peeking over the shoulder on the other side of the web cocoon. Oh crap sorry. I quickly snapped out of my stupor and immediately went to work. You said she was bitten right. She nodded, a spider managed to punch through her breastplate with one of its fangs. So I doubt that her wound was deep but the venom still got into her wound. I know it didn't inject much into her but even the smallest amount can still kill her but it is more slower depending on the amount of venom was injected into you. She explained. Right I know exactly what to do, now that I know it is venom related and, wait did you say breastplate? Yes. I looked over to her breastplate and saw that she was wearing a leather type of breastplate that was styled in a weaved over pattern. It was done quite well to be honest and saw and I saw what happened to be the hole that was mentioned right where her left breast is. Ah, uh, shit. What kind of cruel and benevolent god would throw me into this kind of situation? I've never had a good experience with female contact for years. Well I digress back in the academy in Japan there was just a lack of good females quite a lot did really like to grate on my nerves. After that I went back and forth into the field and into the counter-terrorism unit where I was selected for the United Nations International Counter-Terrorism Program Rainbow Six lead by this unknown woman who is simply known as Six that had reactivated the program due to the recent and sudden increase in terrorist attacks around the world. One of these groups was this so-called ISIS or Islamic State that had risen up into power recently in Syria and Iraq that had been the one of the big contenders and is increasing in power only in vast numbers. Then there were these unknown terrorist organization known as the White Masks, not much information was known about them as of yet. Then there were these rumors going on back in Japan that another group had been on the rise, Namely the Yakuza's were getting quite restless lately and were giving the Japanese authorities a hard time and Japan's SAT, Special Assault Team, had to be called in to handle these situations. Then there were some shadowy rumors going on that were being looked into. I have met a few women overseas that were operators same as me that I worked alongside with. There was Eliza Cohen aka Ash in America's FBI SWAT who was originally born in Israel but transferred over to FBI bringing her knowledge of demolitions along with her trusty grenade launcher loaded with a special breaching charge. Then there was Emmanuel Pichon aka Twitch of the French Counter-Terrorism Unit GIGN, National Gendarmerie Intervention Group. Her specialty was her custom-made drones that far outperformed the civilian and military provided variants. Then we got to Germany's GSG-9 unit, Border Protection Group 9, where they have Monica Weiss aka IQI.Q was like Twitch in a way where she is also pioneer and she had designed her own prototype that is the Red MKI while she was a PhD candidate at Caltech. That device of hers allows her to track down electronics like mines, C4, tripwires, IEDs and all sorts of nasty things that has a wire or runs wirelessly. And last was the recent addition to the team that was transferred from the Canadian JTF-2, Joint Task Force 2, whose was known as Frost, didn't get her name though unfortunately. Her specialty was laying out traps like the one she made out of a bear trap that she nicknamed the Welcome Mat. They were perhaps the best and most interesting women I have ever met. Back on Earth, Team Rainbow's Secret Headquarters. ACHOO four female operators sneezed simultaneously. Hmm. That was weird. Said a puzzled Ash. Ja, indeed, said IQ who was just as puzzled as her teammate. I think this is what's known as in Japanese anime slash manga logic that somebody must be thinking or talking about us, explained Twitch cupping her own chin. If that's true I hope it's Naruto. Said the newest operator Frost. After Frost said that all women blushed when that name was mentioned as if it was taboo but in a god way. Frost you have barely known him for two months, how could he have such an impact on your life that quickly? Ash said to her Canadian teammate with a raised brow, wasn't it the same with you? In fact you warmed up to him much more quicker than Frost did. 
I.Q. pointed out suspiciously. And it was just under a month. Added Twitch who the both of them had known Ash the longest. Ash immediately blushed at the memories that had happened with her experiences with Naruto. Sage shut up. Okay maybe I do like the kid as he has proved my opinion of him wrong and that he was so much more, I can remember that I was being quite harsh to him at first just because of his age. We were all like that at first. Even I had my first share of ridicule when I first joined the GIGN which made me into a bit of a hypocrite. And what do you mean you like Naruto and don't kid yourself out of this I know which way it was meant for. Said a now stern twitch who noticed her behavior pattern. I, air. Ash was scratching the back of her head sheepishly and laughing nervously. Why so serious all of a sudden, it's as if you have a crush on him. I.Q said to Twitch to which she had a small but noticeable blush that didn't escape the German operator's eye. Oh don't tell me. Alright I will admit it. I'm in love with him okay. Twitch was now a bit irate that she had to admit it out loud. You too, yelled the three women only to suddenly look at each other and notice that I.Q had suspiciously joined in on the matter. Monica. You like him as well? Ja, it's true. IQ sighed not bothering to hide it. But you're nearly thirty. Hey I have needs too you know. And I'm not that older than the rest of you I'm twenty-seven where some of you is twenty-two to twenty-five inch countered IQ. Would you look at that, we certainly have gotten ourselves in a predicament, chuckled Frost at the irony. We, we all have feelings for our favorite blonde. Replied a sighing twitch. Who would have thought, agreed Ash. Well, what now? IQ voicing out the thoughts of the other three operators. I suppose we could confess to him. Mused Frost. All four of us? And how well is he going to take that? I.Q raised an eyebrow at that idea. Outside of the room was Thatcher and Mute listening in on the conversation or bickering as they called it, Thatcher was chuckling in amusement. That bloody foxy lad I tell ya. He always has the knack of surprising all of us and especially at attracting the strongest people to him. Even those four have managed to find love especially in this type of work where it is very brutal at times, goes to show that you can find love in the strangest of paces. Commented Thatcher. Mute nodded and turned to Thatcher. Do we tell them? They deserve to know as with the rest of the lads in the team. Thatcher sighed. He was our good friend Mute to all of us. Such a damn shame, he was such a good lad he didn't deserve that fate, I doubt he is gone. Mute said monotonously, as you said he always surprises us with his unpredictable nature. In due time he may do something we will least expect. Che you got that right, and by the way that's the first time I heard you speak longer than a full sentence. Chuckled Thatcher. Mute turned his head away, don't get used to it. Thatcher chuckled at his response and turned towards his right and saw one of his teammates sledge on the floor drawing imaginary circles muttering about his precious hammer. Oh suck it up sledge it's not the end of the world. That was my favorite hammer, why the hell did I let that twat Lloyd borrow it, now he's gone and lost it and fuck knows where that's gone, grumbled sledge like he had been robbed of his favorite toy. Why can't you get another one then? Said a now present smoke. Unlike you. Thatcher and Mute. My tool was one of a kind that I had it custom made out of my own money and the materials to make it were expensive. Whilst your equipment you can simply make more. Don't you have spares? I do, but that was my first and favorite hammer. Bloody hell make you act like you sleep with the hammer in bed at night. I actually do. Christ Sake Sledge do you care more for your sodding hammer than the lad Naruto? Don't misunderstand I do care for him I really do. In fact I trust him a hell of a lot more with my hammer than that dick. Good enough, now we need to tell the team. Wasn't this supposed to be a secret? asked Smoke. We're his mates Smoke, brothers and sisters in arms whatever you want to call it. The bond we shared together should never be underestimated. Soap understands this too. Said Thatcher. Couldn't agree more old man. Smoke and Mute nodded, 
Thatcher chuckled and went off to tell the team the news. My hammer. Muttered Sledge only to get a smack on the back of the head by Thatcher. Pack it in Sledge we gotta go and tell em. All right, I'm coming. He got up and followed as they all went in to stop a possible at fight and turn it into something more meaningful where they would come to an understanding or escalate the situation into something worse with his absence in the world. Cut back to Naruto. Ha, huh, good times it was with Team Rainbow. I'm going to miss those lads in my regiment and those guys from Team Rainbow. Pretty much they were the only female contact that had been good so far, granted the reception was not good at first but it eventually settled down and we got along just fine like a house on fire. And that was after I had joined the SAS, before it had been pretty bad. Before I was 15 the school slash academy was a hellhole. It was voted as one of the best academies around in Japan but once you really see it on the inside it was the devil's play school. The teachers were good at teaching but they were corrupted like that of a politician in parliament. They can screw you over if you happen to look at them funny or disagree with them. The academy was riddled with bullies who prey on the weak to certify their own egos. The popular boys and girls flaunt their statuses around that I couldn't give a fuck about. So I was more of an outcast in that place, but I couldn't care less about them. To hell with them. But even after all who made me suffer, there was only one person who didn't. This girl, Hinata Hyuga. She was, well, odd. She was not how I expected her to be with her being an heiress to the Hyuga name. I expected her to be more like most Hyugas and snuff me down like I was an insignificant piece of dirt underneath their shoes. Yet she didn't. In fact she was the kindest and innocent looking girl I had ever met, even more surprisingly that she was a Hyuga. Maybe I could've. No. I can do nothing to change that, the past is behind me and my home is too far away from me to make a difference now. Focus on the now, the future and the task at hand. Speaking of the task at hand. I had unclasped her breastplate that seemed to be really tight around her chest area. Until I found out why, the buckles that were holding the chest piece around her chest was holding back a pair of honest-to-god Q-cup-sized breasts. That and she was quite tall to which I suspect she is around 230 centimeters or slightly taller. I pulled down my hood unfastened my gas mask and removed it off my head freeing my wild sun-kissed golden locks of hair that still held its natural wildness despite wearing the hood over my head. Naruto's sweat dropped at the size of this large horned girl's breasts but at the same time kept up with his professional attitude on the situation. Not going to be caught off guard off guard this time but he did get a few light hues of red emanating off of his. Right now, where is the bite mark? After a quick search for the bite mark it didn't take long to find it. But when Naruto found it he instantly blushed and deadpanned with sweat drops added to it. Oh why did it have to be there? Naruto mentally face-palmed. Third POV, Lime Alert. To what he was referring about was where the bite mark was at, right next to her nipple. Do I really have to do this? I don't know if that method works or not. Fuck it I'll wing it and take responsibility later if this works. Naruto resolved himself and positioned himself on top of her like he was straddling her. He grasped onto her left breast in a firm grip, he took deep breaths and exhaled, you can do this Naruto, no one will know of this. Just focus on her life right now, that's all that matters. He thought to himself in assurance before he lowered his mouth onto the bite mark also covering her nipple. Mm no. The horned girl known as Cathal moaned as she stirred slightly from the contact and Naruto sucking with his powerful lungs. What Naruto was doing was actually helping her to some extent. As her breathing was almost getting weaker from the venom but it now had stabilized, sort of. She was more taking in sharp breaths from the pleasure she was feeling but she had no consciousness to know what s actually happening as she was still knocked out. Nnngh, she moaned louder this time. Question mark, the silver-haired woman heard her partner moan out but didn't know what was happening back there so she tried to loosen the web a bit so she could shift herself so she can see what was happening behind her. 
After a few moments of shifting around she looked over her partner's shoulder and what she saw made her instantly blush and face fault at the sight of what this handsome blonde male was doing to her partner. She couldn't find the right words to say to this man. Back with Naruto he managed to gather some venom in his mouth and proceeded to spit it out of his mouth. WWWH what are you doing to my teammate, she managed to find the right words this time. Naruto face faulted at being caught red-handed but managed to hold the blush down to some degree. Okay this is not what it looks like I swear, this is a method in removing venom from either wounds or bites. Won't you also be affected by the venom as well? Technically no, venom and poison are two different things. Venom works by injecting itself into the bloodstream to take effect where poison you have to either ingest or inhale it to take effect. I would be affected by the venom if I have an open cut on the inside of my mouth or my lips. Are you sure this works? She raised an eyebrow while she was still blushing at his actions as he went back to sucking the venom out of the nipple. Asterisk, spit. Asterisk, nope, never done it before. But it does look to be working. See her skin colors brightened up to its normal light tanned color, with a little tinge of pink on her cheeks but I think that's down to fever. The silver-haired woman only sweat dropped at that comment. You think, she mentally deadpanned. As Naruto was sucking more venom out he began to subconsciously massage her breast and caress it, getting more moans of pleasure from the unconscious cathal. Naruto who was unaware of what his actions was doing to her as he was getting a little too into it, Cathal's nipples had hardened from the stimulation and something stirred within her chest, specifically her mammary glands. And with another suck from Naruto and without warning of what came next, Cathal's nipples exploded as she came from her breasts, squirting out milk into Naruto's mouth and face. M.O.O., she cried out in ecstasy. Naruto resisted the urge to swallow as it could contain remnants of the spider venom and spat it straight out while coughing from the sudden milk spray. The silver-haired woman was looking at the scene with a blank face but on the inside she was blushing up a storm and her mind had shut down temporarily. Lime end. Cough, never in my life have I saved someone's own life in such a bizarre way. He mentally face-palmed. He could still taste the milk in his mouth. Mmm, tastes quite nice actually. He said to himself as he wiped the milk off of his face with high-gloved hand and sucked the milk off his fingers. Huh, said a surprised voice below him. He then looked and deadpanned and began to sweat nervously, crap did I say that out loud. Cathal had awoken to a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, whiskered stranger wearing dark clothing or armor she couldn't really tell. And she woke up to see him straddling her and as she looked down to her bare chest she could see he had one of his hands still pressed onto her chest and they were both leaking milk. And she looked back with her blush increasing intensity as she could see milk splashed over his face and a small milk trail running out of his mouth. RRGH, she growled. Air this isn't what it looks like at first, but you're welcome by the way. Naruto attempted to negotiate to her with a smile but she didn't seem convinced at first when she saw the state he was in as her blush was flaring up furiously and her lips were trembling from barely controlled anger. Get the hell off of me you pervert, she roared as she ripped her arm out of the web with unnatural strength and shoved me off of her in the center of my torso with her fingerless leather gloved right palm of her hand. Thank Kami I was wearing Kevlar underneath. Well, it looked like a shove at first glance but to me the force that I felt was like getting punched in the stomach by a heavyweight Olympian weightlifter and that was only a shove, a punch from her would feel like? I'd rather not go there. The force from the push had launched me into another patch of web on the wall so luckily I had a soft landing, but unluckily for me I was now stuck again and with Cathal had freed herself with her ludicrous strength and pulled out her weapon that was a man-sized D warhammer with a spike on the tip of the hammer from the web-like cocoon. When she released herself she had revealed her full height to me and it fully explains her appearance. She stood at around about 7 feet 7 inches or 231 centimeters so she was defiantly a big girl alright. But what caught my attention were her legs. One they were covered in fur and two she had hooves instead of feet, cow-like ears and a large pair of horns on her head, she also has a tail, no, being serious, a tail. 
She had long black messy hair with a patch of dirty blonde hair on her fringe that was wild looking and that she kept most of her hair in a ponytail with black and white stripes going down the length of it down to her mid-back. Under each of her eyes she has a thick black stripe marks or something like that. Two long black bangs on each side of her face reaching down to her neck. She had bar-shaped pupils that were horizontal and her eyebrows were shaped like tick marks. She had her woven leather breastplate that had been taken off earlier that was more like a bra to her that protected yet supported her chest area. She also came equipped with some plated steel pauldron added onto the shoulders with an added white fur collar and leather gauntlets, leather quisses, and lastly a black leather with added white fur and dark steel plated tasset. She didn't have anything protecting her abdomen as I could clearly see her lightly toned six-pack abs and slender hips that complemented her well considering her appearance of a seven feet seven inches woman. And ironically there was a cowbell attached around her neck on a choker. Naruto was suddenly brought out of his analysis as a spike that came from her warhammer had embedded into the wall beside my head as Cathal had stabbed the tip of her hammer deep into the mining trench slash chasm wall with noticeable cracks forming around the hole. Naruto's sweat dropped at the sheer strength she had when wielding a man-sized warhammer effortlessly. Naruto was suddenly yanked out of the web by Cathal who grabbed onto his collar and brought him to her face level and glared at him straight into his eyes. Who the hell are you to do that to me whilst I was out huh, she demanded. The man who just saved your life and I can see that you're practically fine after that spider bite, you should still be weakened even after I got that venom out of you. Since when was sucking on my, breasts a method of removing venom, she said while blushing and still felt vexed about the whole ordeal. It is a common method where I come from, but that does not imply that you have to do that to get rid of the venom it's where the bite was located and your bite mark happened to be where your areola was. Naruto rolled his eyes at her comment while holding back a blush of his own. But you didn't have to do that, why didn't you use the anti-venom slash poison antidote? She asked him. Wait, what? The antidote, we keep them with us for situations such as coming across venomous and poisonous animals, insects and reptiles. Why didn't you use one of them instead? That's the first I've heard of them. I said while narrowing my eyes in the direction of the silver-haired woman who was attempting to hide herself behind the web cocoon. Unfortunately for her, Cathal had caught onto his meaning and walked over to the cocoon and ripped the silver-haired woman out of the cocoon. Guy slain. Why didn't you tell him about the antidotes, she yelled at her partner. The woman who was now officially been named as Guy slain was another bizarre sight to see. While she did look remotely closer to a human but at the same time she wasn't. When I looked at her face to face when I was, ahem, pressed, against her on the cocoon, I couldn't really see her ears as they were covered by the web. If I were to guess on what animal she represents it would most likely have something to do with a cat. I would say probably a white-furred cat but this Geislane has a silver mane of hair along with the ears and she is mostly tanned. But her appearance was what got his attention while Cathal definitely would catch the eyes of many perverted males but this Geislane might as well be wearing nothing at all. She wore suspenders over her shoulders with a leather belt wrapped around her back with both ends of the belt barely covering her decency and another thin strip of belt connecting the two ends but were currently disconnected hence why she was currently naked but they didn't seem to notice me watching. She wore a grey shin length form fitting trousers, an open black leather coat with a fur collar and a pair of light brown sandals. It didn't come to mind, I'm sorry. Asterisk sigh asterisk do you still have them? I still feel woozy. I think Akane had it last. Okay, so where is she? From the looks of it, she was sandwiched nngh, between you two. Naruto had pointed out to the two while he looked inside the cocoon and he indeed saw somebody else in there so he ran up to her and pulled her out with a grunt. Cathal and Geislane felt like they had been slapped in the face by the sudden remembrance of their third teammate that they had forgotten. Whoa! Akane! Cathal's face faulted in shock at the sight of her friend and partner Akane that had been pulled out. I forgot she was in there with us. Geislane's sweat dropped and looked away in guilt. Don't worry she's fine, she's just passed out from lack of air. 
but her breathing is pretty shallow, Naruto reassured them as they exhaled in relief. How will we wake her up? Well I have another method or two but don't worry I won't give her CPR. CPRR, they both said in chorus as they were both equally puzzled by the name as they both tilted their heads with a question mark above their heads. What's that? Kathy asked. You don't know what it is, how can you know, you know what never mind. Naruto suddenly cut off as he was reminded about the possibility of him being in another world was more than likely turning true. CPR, or cardiopulmonary resuscitation is a life-saving technique useful in many emergencies, including heart attack, near drowning or lack of air in the lungs that causes someone's breathing or heartbeat to stop. How do you do it? Two ways. One is the place the heel of your hand and place the other hand on top of that hand and put both of them on the breastbone at the center of the person's chest. Place your other hand on top of your first hand and interlock your fingers. And keep on adding compressions to the chest at a steady rate. And after 30 presses to the chest you give him or her mouth to mouth. Mouth to mouth as in a, Geislane trailed off as the two imagined what it would look like in their heads but for some odd reason the person they were saving was none other than Naruto. They both imagined a scene that went something like a theatrical romantic play. They never went to one but they heard what it was like. The scene was them doing the chest compressions and calling out his name dramatically and Naruto laid there lifeless. And then they both reached down and captured his lips passionately and Naruto had awoken like a bad rip-off of Sleeping Beauty but reversed, saved by the demi-humans in each separate dream. And then it trailed off to something more raunchy and erotic as Naruto proposed to offer himself as gratitude to his saviors and then the scene transitioned to a white bed that was in each other's thoughts and sounds of rocking and moaning was present. No, it's not what you're thinking said a voice from outside of their daydreaming. Pop, went the dream bubble. As they were both brought back to reality with bright red blushes and drool coming out of their lips and their eyes brightened up. Naruto deadpanned at the two. I would ask what was up with your thoughts considering the looks on your faces, but I think I will pass on that one, he said as they looked away from his gaze with bright red blushes. And no mouth to mouth means exhaling air from your lungs into the other person's mouth and straight into his, her lungs while pinching the nose while that person is unconscious. Oh. Ah. Uh. They both said simultaneously out of slight embarrassment. Gah. What the hell was I thinking? Why am I having such lewd thoughts about the man who just fondled and did, well that to me moments ago? Well I would admit he is good looking even for a human, it's like looking at a high elf with that blonde hair of his. Oh gods, my chest is swelling up even from thinking about him. I knew I should have milked myself before I headed out to this stupid expedition. Cathal rubbed her head in frustration. Geislane however had a more calm look on her face, but took a few glances at Naruto with a small blush on her face, must be the primal instincts kicking in again, she though at first but then brushed off the thought and asked him. And what is the other method you're suggesting? Naruto walked up to his bergen that was stuck to the cocoon but had been separate from Cathal's shove. He took out his knife and cut the web off that was stuck to his bergen. Give me a minute. Damn web's bloody annoying to get off, it get everywhere. Naruto muttered as he cut of the last remaining web off of his bergen. He then opened up one of his many pockets in his bergen to see if he still had his gift from D.O.C. back in Team Rainbow Six. Ah here it is, he said while pulling out a tactical medical kit that can be used on the field and was filled with medical supplies that can deal with most of the wounds, illness and other things. He even had sent him a pack of his specialized epinephrine in a saline solution that he uses in his dart gun of his but was in a syringe. Naruto didn't go for the epinephrine but instead went for a small bottle and pulled the top off of it. Geislane could smell the salts really strongly even if she wasn't standing close to him but she felt as if that bottle was burning her sensitive nose but at the same time she felt her senses were really awake and aware despite the lack of sleep she had been feeling. She immediately pinched her nose and her tears were welling up around her eyes. What is that? Smelling salts, why what's up with you? Naruto asked her with a bit of concern in his voice. I'm part cat, 
we have a keen sense of smell and that bottle you have in your hand feels like my nose is burning. Oh crap that's right, sorry. Well the purpose of this bottle is to arouse a person from consciousness by jump-starting his breathing pattern. What the salts gas does is it irritates the nostril membranes and lungs, so much so that it triggers a sharp inhalation reflex, bringing in more air and thus more oxygen. This can result in improved alertness. When a person passes out, they sometimes lose consciousness due to decreased blood flow to the brain. Sniffing smelling salts can raise a person's blood pressure, heart rate, and oxygen levels, helping brain activity in reactivating the sympathetic nervous system. Huh, they both said tilting their heads. Naruto sighed. It brings people back from unconsciousness or faints and dizziness. Oh. They both said while hitting their left in the palm of their other hand. Why didn't you say so? Said Cathal. I did, apparently my explanation was too complex for you. Are you calling me stupid? Cathal frowned. Never said you were, it's just that I am qualified to use medical supplies and thus I should know about this sort of thing about the human body and the effect some of the supplies would entail. So you're a healer? Geislane inquired placidly. Not necessarily, I'm not officially a healer but where I come from it is called medic. These are tactical medical supplies that a foot soldier may carry while they are in the heat of battle while the field medic is right behind where he carries the most supplies around for the wounded soldiers who were brought out of battle. They are filled with supplies that either cleans up open wounds so it won't end up infected or help ease the pain during a battle so you can keep on going. I only know so much as I learned from the best but I still have a lot of catching up to do. He explained while walking up to the third party member. Naruto cut off the web that was covering her face and he was in for yet another surprise. Holy crap the otakus back in Japan will bust a nut over this shit. Naruto's eyes widened at the new silver-haired person and tanned like Geislane but she her ears were skin but pointed outwards. Okay so it's a dark elf this time, it's official I must be tripping balls right now. Naruto stared at the dark elf in wonder. Aren't you going to help her? Geislane reminded him. Air right. First time seeing a dark elf? Cathal inquired. Actually it's my first time seeing both of your kinds as well. Naruto replied back honestly to both Geislane and Cathal. Cathal raised an eyebrow, you serious, where have you been? Living under a rock. She said sarcastically. Hopping through gates from one world to another. Naruto replied back simply while holding the bottle under the elf's nose. Air, what? Cathal blinked. And Geislane's eyes widened slightly. Gasp, gah, she was interrupted by the dark elf's sudden gasp and launched herself up clutching her nose in irritation. What in Hardy's name was that? It burns, she yelled out in aggravation. You're welcome. Naruto said it simply like it was no big deal. The dark elf turned around to face Naruto in a glare, who the hell are you? The dark elf was five feet four inches in height and her hair was kept at neck length swept back so the back of her head was spiky leaving two strands of hair as bangs running down her face. Her body was athletic, lean and slender with her bust size being a D cup. But her appearance had stricken me as quite odd. She liked to wear quite a lot of black either that was a bit revealing around the cleavage and thighs most of it is covered by a cloak but I could see that she had a red collar around her neck. Naruto only raised an eyebrow at her tone. Well that's not nice, considering I helped you regain consciousness in this forsaken place shouldn't you be more grateful? Naruto said apathetically. The elf only snorted rudely and smirked, why should I? Do you expect me to open my legs and offer myself to you in gratitude? Naruto snorted back in distaste, no, a simple thank you would have sufficed. Don't go comparing me to some hormonal teenager desperate for some bedroom action. The elf only rolled her eyes and replied back, okay thank you for bringing me back to consciousness, I'll owe you that much. That's all I'm asking for. Naruto nodded while packing his medical kit back inside a slot of the Bergen and secured it in place. You sure you don't want anything else with that, she said suggested flirtatiously. Is now really the time for that? 
Naruto looked at her funny to which she giggled. I'm just messing with ya. No need to be a stubborn virgin about it. Don't bring my sex life into this. Naruto sighed. So you admit to being a virgin? Well it's more like I have a major lack of sex. Eh how come? She inquired more. Didn't have the time for it, but I don't see how this is any of your business anyway. Oh come on who was your first? As if I'll let you know that one. Oh come on, I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. Darling, you are perhaps centuries older than I am, how in the hell are you going to remember your first time over these years? Hey I'm not that old, I only just turned 190 years old. Naruto snorted in amusement, are you kidding me? That is still old. You are like the equivalent age to 19-year-old human. The dark elf only pouted in return. You're mean. Naruto only laughed, don't blame me, blame yourself for walking right into that one. Naruto said while smiled at her. The dark elf smiled in return. You know, I actually like you. I mean you're actually a pretty decent human being despite all the ones I have met before in our experiences. Naruto's eyes widened, so there are humans here as well. Now that's a surprise but also a slight relief that makes me look less alienated in this world. But what does she mean by despite their experiences, he mused over their comment and decided to inquire about the particular statement. Why what makes me special over the rest of the human males in this world? The three glanced at each other and I noticed their discomfort about the topic. Well no offense to you, but it is generally the males of your race that commit the worst acts against people like us, women too are not spared by these acts but it comes in rarity. Naruto scrunched up his face in distaste, she's not false in that regard. It is generally the males who have done worse acts and crimes than the females. You mean like racism and prejudice? The dark elf sighed and nodded. There's that and worse. Geislane stepped forward, this mainly applies to the likes of the Empire and some of the other kingdoms that have treated our races unjustly. But the Empire commits the worst acts against us. What do they do? Naruto asked not liking where this is going. Empire? Kingdoms? Shit why do I have to be in a time period where the human race is just plain stupid and so hateful all the time? They gather slaves from the other tribes of other races even gather slaves of their own races. And there have been times where they resisted but the empire retaliates with skirmishes against them, the empire wanted to convince their people that the races that resisted against them are evil and savages, which is why so many of your kind have become paranoid about us and the other races. Other reasons are out of greed and profit. Geislane said stoically but had a hint of sadness in her eyes. That's just messed up. Naruto said with malice and anger lacing his voice. The two demi-humans and one elf had raised their eyes in surprise at his sudden tone change. This empire as you call it and its people are sick. The people are poisoned by uncertainty of not being able to see the real troubles of this world, they debate and they doubt on many things, they are always questioning themselves and others, always unwilling to see what is right before them. While the leaders are consumed by corruption that is so blinding it hurts to see it. They feel comfort in their positions in their blatant ignorance and power to do what they want, and in their negligence they have failed their country and its people. Hearing that slavery is practiced here sickens me, they think they can take our freedom away from us, for what right do they have to oppress and tell us how to live, what authority do they hold over our very lives, just whose life is it anyway to make them think that they can just play with it carelessly. Our lives cost so much more than a price that they don't seem to understand how precious it really is other than their own. He explained his reason for their actions with a scowl on his face. The three non-humans blinked in surprise at Naruto's conviction and how much he said about his own race. To think that you hate your own race that much, that's a bit extreme don't you think? Naruto shook his head, I don't hate everyone in my race. There are a large majority of innocent people that don't deserve it and some I do indeed hate for their actions against innocence. It's just I have seen and know of their kind all too well, so what is it that you do? I'm a special kind of soldier, part of the SAS, the elite force, the commandos, operators, or the unsung heroes. 
you point us where to go, even if it is deep within enemy territory or ordered to rescue high-value hostages using whatever means necessary, we will do and we will get the job done. Naruto explained while switching weapons to the 417 Hong Kong dollars equipped with a suppressor and a knight. SAS, all three said in union with question marks above their heads. Wait, why be an unsung hero? Why? If you have fought in battles and done such honorable acts and one shouldn't you be rewarded as a hero? The elf asked him, as she knew that someone who is a centaur and the entire female centaurs as per their culture value and respect heroism and acts of valor the most would like to meet this person. Simple, it's because it is forbidden for our identities to be revealed. Once the job is done, we don't stick around and bask in the glory of victory and bathe in the cheers of the crowd and receive a thank you and such gratitude from the victims. No. We just get the job done and vacate the area and nothing else. He explained nonchalantly while loading the magazine into the semi-auto sniper rifle and pulled the bolt back and released it till he heard the click. Wow, that is almost sad. Said Akane who felt pretty small but could not comprehend on why anyone who would not care about recognition or fame. Not really it actually makes perfect, it's more along the lines that if we did reveal ourselves then there is a chance that our enemies will track us down seeking vengeance against us or our families. But that's cowardice and dishonorable, have they no shame? Geislane raised her eyes on why they would do such a thing as her culture was that nobody threatens and murders family. And? It wasn't enough to stop them from doing it, you take something or someone of theirs then their response is to no doubt to return the favor back to you. To them honor is just a word and a pretentious term to install rules of fairness in the battlefield. The code of honor is always ignored during the battlefield. It's either you kill or be killed. Naruto gave her a cold dark look while the three stared into his deep and seemingly bottomless pits of oceanic blue eyes that have seen many things. All three girls widened their eyes of when they stared into his eyes, for someone so young they half expected him to be an overly cocky and arrogant soldier flaunting his status of being the best of the best. Instead they saw the eyes and posture of someone who has seen it all, a true warrior. Then Naruto brightened up and smiled, well then perhaps I didn't introduce myself earlier my name is Sergeant Naruto Yuzuki my price and it is a pleasure to meet all three of you, now shall we all get going miss. The dark elf shook her head and smiled back with interest in this enigmatic blonde. Akane Zeo Warain. She answered back pleasantly. Geislane Dita She nodded in a greeting kind of way. Cathal of the Minotaurus clan. Cathal gave out a wave. That's a pretty simple name for a clan. Naruto pointed out. So are the rest of us in our clan. The reason why our clan leader named it that is that our clan is run mostly by female minotaurs. This sounds quite like an Amazonist tribe where they have strict rules regarding males entering their clan. And what of the males? She sighed and rubbed the back of her head. Same reason as the centaur females, we got sick of them. The males are overly brutish and aggressive by nature, over time they just turned into vulgar, crass and violent beasts that values raw strength over all just like the militaristic centaur males. All of the male counterparts are born as part man and part bull so in common sense they would be acting more like a wild beast but for the women we are mostly born as a lactating type like that of a cow, always carefree and easygoing. But there are some females born with bull-like attributes and can be quite aggressive but they are loyal to our clan. Naruto deadpanned at her story, somehow that does not surprise me. Geislane stepped up and raised her hand. We have the same problem with my race as well but not almost as bad. There are alpha males the leaders of the pack in our tribes and sometimes they have many disputes and fights for the role of alpha male either to impress someone of our clan or out of desire, when it gets to mating season it gets quite hectic and annoying. The males are very territorial regarding their females and will attempt to scare you off or attack you if you approach any of their women or a female they have marked as their mating target. Naruto only sweat dropped at that one and couldn't help but ask, did you have any air? Yes and no. Huh. Yes I did get a lot of attention especially from the males but I turned them all down, 
they didn't like it and instead they decided to take me by force. In the end they all lost. She said coolly. Yuch. The pussies got the boot, literally. Naruto smirked inside his head and turned to Akane. Do you have problems with your males? He asked her. Nah our men are civilized and fun to be around, but I never see me being with one of them for some time. She responded with a shrug. Fair enough, it's your life. Naruto nodded. Hn, she nodded back with a smile. Well it was fun chatting despite what happened earlier. Cathal gave a light glare to Naruto who only whistled innocently but had a sweat drop forming on the back of his head. Why what happened? Akane raised an eyebrow at Cathal who looked away to hide her blush. It's nothing. Geislane interrupted with a smaller bush forming on her face as the memory was still quite clear. She looked up from the trench as her ears twitched. We need to get moving, the spiders are on the move. And all that shouting earlier might have alerted a couple of them here. If so then we can't take the stairs or climb up the wall, one it's too unstable, two they would be waiting for us up there and three we mustn't use any light lest you want to be caught further on inside this trench. Naruto explained. Eh. But we won't be able to see. Akane protested. Well I suspect she will be fine. Naruto pointed out to Geislane. HM. How come? Cats have more sensitive vision capabilities than an average human that allows them to see in the dark quite well. Geislane only nodded. But what about us? Akane asked. Actually it is just you. Cathal commented. Eh why? I can also see and move in the in the dark just as fine as Geislane. But I can't see well in the dark. Akane pouted while mustering something about demi-humans and their animal traits. Don't worry we won't be completely blind, which is why I have this. Naruto tapped onto the night vision scope attachment on his semi-auto sniper rifle. This tool allows me to see in the dark but also allows me to use my weapon at the same time. But wouldn't that attract unwanted attention? I have that covered too. Naruto pointed to his suppressed barrel. This is called a suppressor, this suppresses the noise greatly but does not silence it completely, it can still be heard but if an enemy was further out he wouldn't be able to hear weapon go off with the suppressor attached. Alright I will take your word for it. She nodded and took point. We will go through the mining trench, she pointed down on the floor where we noticed that there were rail tracks for the mine carts. If we follow these iron bars we should be able to reach a slope. Wow the dwarves are pretty innovative. They've already invented railway tracks. I muse to myself in interest. Is that what they are called? Geislane tilted her head. It was made specifically for the mine carts in transporting loads of rock, metal ore and gems in greater quantity and faster than the use of carts that you people usually use. But the range and the positioning of said tracks are quite limited so you have to build quite a lot of them to support railway transportation. Wah, that's amazing. Kathy's eyes shimmered in fascination. How do you know so much about these dwarven contraptions? Because we invented them back home. But I thought you said that the dwarves invented it first. In your world yes, in mine we humans have invented and perfected it. Are you saying that you are not from this world Naruto? Geislane inquired as she was suspicious of what he had meant. Yes I am, and I am not joking about this. Eh. Cathal and Akane face faulted in shock. What did you use to get to here? Geislane questioned sternly. Some giant structure like a gateway portal from one world to another. A gate? That is exactly what we are looking for in the quest detail given to us by the client. Tell me where is it? Directly above us and hidden in a wall that I smashed my way out of and unfortunately you won't find anything of use up there, the portal's gone and the gate is too damaged to keep on supporting the portal. The only thing you would find up there is my two teammates who didn't make it through the portal's collapse. Naruto said solemnly. What were their names? One was new so I only knew him by his alias name Lloyd and my commanding officer Falcon who was leading the front of our investigation. 
what's with the alias names? In Special Forces Tams that's what we refer ourselves as so our enemy won't know what our name was. My alias name is Maelstrom. Geislane only sighed at the news, well I don't know how our client will react to this but we will have to take his word for it, it is too dangerous here and we need to leave. Couldn't agree more. Akane agreed with her cat-like teammate. I can smell the rottenness and decay of this place, I can tell the orcs are near. Disgusting things. She said in disgust. Naruto deadpanned, I know I'm the type to not be prejudiced and I absolutely disagree on racism, but I can tell that these orcs are going to be a major problem. To be sure I should gather more information about them. Why so hostile, what made them to be so hated? You don't know? I know of them through some means, but I want to know what you all think of them. Naruto proposed to them. Akane shrugged and Geislane told him of her opinion or facts about the orcs. Orcs are violent warmongering savages, they have always based themselves as scavengers and opportunistic carnivores, while they do possess a low amount of cunningness and a low intelligence when compared to other more intellectual species. Orcs do possess a crude culture of their own, but they are more violent by nature as they will fight ferociously if compelled but they tend to lean more towards more chaotic slash destructive behavior. The Empire likes to collect these orcs and use as them as expendable pawns way up front for their soldiers on the battlefield. On their own they form up groups of malicious marauders that prey on innocent villagers and pillage them to satisfy their own bloodlust and don't even get me started on what they do to the women. In fact we are risking ourselves greatly in coming here where there are large concentrations of them somewhere in the ruins or the mines, so far we were lucky not to encounter them yet. But I do not wish to think what they would do to us if we were captured. She grimaced at that possibility. Naruto frowned at that explanation, yep I expected as such that information is bang on accurate alright, I've seen many depictions of orcs like the ones from Lord of the Rings, Warhammer, Warcraft, Elder Scrolls, anime and manga and weirdly I will admit to it I have seen hentai of that orc shit, it was sent to me by a friend and he made me watch it. Don't remember the name of it because I didn't bother watch that shit again. Who the hell wants to watch someone getting raped by a mythical creatures? They are a type of race you love to hate all the time if you ask me. Ahem, well then if you don't want to get caught then I think we should get moving, oh and before we go. Naruto pointed his semi-auto sniper upwards and looked into his night vision scope and fired off a round from the suppressed barrel, for seconds later the body of the same spider that dropped them crashed into the cold unforgiving ground with its insides exploding from the impact and spider blood sprayed all over the floor. Kia. Akane yelped from the sudden noise as she couldn't as she wasn't allowed to use any kind of light source lest she wanted to be seen from the orcs or spiders. Well depending on this type of spider I hope by its biology that it can't see in the dark that well. What was that? Akane asked also quite alarmed by the sudden noise. That's the sound of me saving your life. Naruto said simply as if it didn't matter that he shot a spider about so far up. But what is that weapon? Geislane asked in curiosity. It's a weapon where I come from but I will tell you more of that later, I will take point. Naruto said while making his way to the front with the rifle in his hands and also rummaging through his side pockets of his bergen and fished out his specialized PDA. He fiddled with his PDA to attach it to the side of his rifle on the rail system of his rifle. And then he tinkered with the features of his PDA to select the motion sensor, he could also switch it to heart bet sensor but that only works on beings that have a beating heart. Spiders do have hearts but their circulatory system works differently to humans, the motion tracker just has a longer range. The main problem with the older models of the motion tracker is that it couldn't tell you where it is picking up movement from like is it above or below, and it cannot pick up stationary targets. Now with new updates those drawbacks have been solved and it does not act like a sonar system and it can keep track on the moving target wherever it goes and it can give you early warnings if something has crept up onto you. Another problem is that it emits sound when it is on and tracking for movement so I had to plug in my earphones for that problem, or I could simply turn the sound down, I've seen alien isolation with the motion tracker and that thing emits sound loudly whenever something is nearby and the xenomorph can hear it, so just turn the damn thing down if it is causing a problem for you. 
I turned on my motion tracker and popped an earphone in my ear and looked through the scope and surveyed my surroundings, above me and in the distance to see if there were any more spiders. There were none in sight. Good, we appear to be in the clear for now. I gave out my analysis. Geislane stayed silent as she listened closely for any signs of noise. It's unnaturally quiet, but there are no signs of any more spiders nearby. She nodded to Naruto confirming his observation. Are you sure you can see through that? Akane asked while looking at the gadget in interest. Trust me this thing is a lifesaver. Then we will follow your lead. Geislane nodded to Naruto. Who in return nodded back and started to walk forward with the three of them followed his lead. Geislane behind him followed by Akane and Cathal taking the rear. Intermission Naruto and the two demi-humans and Dark Elf made their way further into the trench while the light was getting dimmer around them. And it was getting harder to see with how deep the mining trench was. Akane had to stay close to us because she does not possess great night vision despite being supposed immortal beings but in a sense they are more related to humans in a way. So far the tracker stayed quiet and I didn't see any abnormal anomalies in the scope either, so far everything was quiet. Crunch, until I stood on something. Hi. What was that, Akane jumped in fright. My bad, just stepped on something. Naruto said to calm her down. I looked down to see what I stood on through the scope only to look at a screaming skull of a strange fanged creature. The skeleton still wore its decaying and heavily rusted armor but this skeleton had its chest cavity caved in by my foot. Excuse me mate. Naruto said to the skeleton and lifted his foot out of the skeleton's chest. As soon as he said that he felt a comforting on his shoulder he looked back to see the shadow figure of Cathal. I'm sorry for your loss. She said in condolence. Wait, what? What are you on about? Naruto raised an eyebrow in confusion. You have lost someone dear to you, in demi-human culture losing your mate can be a hard loss to get over. Cathal said in a comforting way. Naruto's reaction was to simply facepalm. Oh for foo. No Cathal I did not mean as in this guy was my lover, and I am not gay. Secondly mate is a slang term for friend from where I come from. Eh. But I though he was your dash dot. Cathal I am 19 years old and nearly 20. He's a skeleton and he's several decades old, how old do you bloody think I am? Naruto pointed out in a mock rant. He he he, sorry I can only see the shape but not what it looks like. Cathal laughed in a light-hearted manner. Naruto only rolled his eyes and looked through the scope to observe his surroundings to see an aftermath of what looked like a battle. There were skeleton corpses everywhere. Damn. What is it? Akane asked. We seem to have encountered one of many aftermaths of the great battle. He looked into the scope again and widened his eye at how short and stout the skeleton was. Most, if not all of these corpses are dwarves what's left of the soldiers and miners in this city. Naruto brought out his torch from his MP5 hanging from his side and turned it on. I though you said we were not supposed to use any source of light? I'm just taking a quick look around and then I am switching it off. He said while switching on his torch. The torch lit up like a sun in the night sky that has been turned on by a flick of a switch, hashtag. The girls squinted their eyes suddenly focusing themselves from the sudden light. Ah, that's bright. Cathal said uncomfortably. Geez it's like a mini sun inside a small tube or handle. I quite like it, said Geislane as she felt captivated by the light. These guys sure had it rough. Naruto said while ignoring the comments. The girls looked at where the light is pointing at and their eyes widened at what they saw. The stories of the battle were tame compared to the reality of the aftermath right before you. There were piles and piles of deceased dwarves of the great city, killed in multiple ways according to what the skeleton and armor damage shows like for example death by stabbing, slashing, hacking, crushing or even shot by arrows etc. There were skeletons that were not dwarves however, but were taller and larger. 
They also look to be wearing cruder armor and weapons compared to the higher quality of metal that the dwarves had in their weapons. These beings look to have a mix of weapons and armor that looked like it originally didn't belong to them and a wide range of weapons that was crafted in such a shoddy and crude way. Their skulls were thick and large and they had sharp teeth protruding outwards like it was made for predators. So these are the warriors of the last stand of Khazad Lodhar, they deserve a proper resting place not just dumped in a trench and forsake them. This is just disrespectful, and the dead can be very vengeful if not laid to rest properly. Geislane commented with a cold frown. Oh you have got to be kidding me, now of all things it's supernatural bullshit. Seriously that shit is not cool. Naruto sighed in frustration and a deadpan. Akane pulled out an arrow out of a dead dwarf's chest and analyzed the type of arrow. Both orc and goblin arrows and weapons were used here. There also are hints of ogre and troll weapons and corpses lying about in some places. Geez it's like a nesting area for all of the worst and vile scumbags in this place. Sadly that is what this place has degenerated into. Geislane nodded and Cathal shrugged, I wouldn't be surprised if a few of the aggressive minotaurs were here, some are not as civil as the other races and can be much worse than an orc. All that is doing is putting more unwanted pressure on us, we're already in enough trouble as it is, she added. I switched my torch off and navigated through the corpses, watch your step. I said to the girls. Intermission. Ten minutes later at least I think it has been, I can't really see my watch and I don't really want to mess with the PDA unless I miss something in that short moment. How long do we have to keep moving for? Naruto asked Geislane behind him. We should be able to reach a steep slope soon. Just keep on following these, tracks as you call them and you should find it, she answered. And true to her word we met a steep slope but it was more of an incline for the tracks where the tracks went up a steep slope. I wondered on how the dwarves could even get a heavy load of mine carts up there filled with loads of metal ores and gems. My answer was to look on the left track that had groups of five mine carts left abandoned but still had its tattered cover on it. The mine carts were old and rusted on the metal parts along with worn wooden parts that made up the frame of the carts. They had not been used in a long time and it still had a delivery to do which was why it was waiting for its turn to go up the incline. From the looks of the mine carts they looked large and similar enough to the open-top mineral wagons made out of planks of wood or as they were called in England, coal trucks from the 1920s, 30s and 40s that you would find in those preserved British heritage railways that the train enthusiasts seemed to love. Naruto walked up to the wagons and climbed on top of it and lifted the tattered cover off. It was filled with many metal ores, some that were similar such as iron, copper, gold, and silver were the most recognizable metals among the rest of them. But there were metals that he was not familiar with and they looked somewhat off. Moo! Cathal squealed in enthusiasm. So many metal ores and there are even the rarer kinds too, Asteria would love this as well as I am now. Cathal had raced over to the wagons and easily towered over them and was peeking over the top and looked at the metal ores with sparkly eyes. Naruto chuckled at the sight, somebody's excited at the sight of metal. Asterio is a minotaur same as me who is also my friend. I first worked at farming for some time but then later she introduced me to blacksmithing and I got just as good as Asterio is. If we bring some of these metal ores to her she will know what to do with them. Hmm if you have that much faith in your friend then I will believe your word. But what are these metals anyway, specifically those? He pointed to the rare metal ores. Ah those metal ores are the legendary mithril ore and ebony ore. In these lands they are they are more desired than gold and silver by all people from the common people to the nobility. Mithril even in its purest form is actually rather soft and malleable. It can be used for a whole range of various alloys to produce extremely lightweight. Hard and durable armor but its main disadvantage is that while somebody wears something like a chain mail vest they can indeed be saved from a stab or a slash but the impact can still probably kill you depending on where they hit and how hard with hard hitting weapons like blunt weapons such as a mace or a war hammer. 
Ebony is the opposite of the lightweight mithril and acts as the absolute defensive armor but depending on the wielder or wearer of ebony armor and weapons it can be quite heavy. Ebony needs to be and only be worked when heated as it will develop small cracks that eventually shatter the material if you hammer the ore cold. And unlike most of your common armors, ebony will not alloy with iron. It must be used purely. She explained sagely. Naruto instantly face faulted, so pretty much it's like a mixture of platinum, titanium and tungsten but can be molded into wearable armor but the those names though, this really a fantasy wonderland but can easily kill you if you're not careful. I can picture anyone gunning for this opportunity even the governments from my world wouldn't pass an opportunity like this, the possibilities in this though. Well I would probably pass on the mithril as it is too bright of a metal unless I could cover it up somehow, I would probably make armor plates out of ebony for my vest for spares. Hmm Cathal did say that her friend is a skilled blacksmith. I wonder, he mused to himself. Cathal how good would you say your friend is at blacksmithing? Naruto asked her. Cathal smirked, without a doubt one of the best in this world, she was actually apprenticed by dwarven blacksmith who was a master at it before he passed away which why she is so good at what she does now. She has trained me but I am nowhere near her level of expertise. She said proudly of her friend. In that case we should take the iron ore too. Why would you want the cheap iron ore? Because iron ore can then be smelted into steel which is four times thicker and denser than regular iron. Exactly right Naruto, so you know some knowledge about metals huh? Cathal said to Naruto curiously. I know plenty enough about metals and I have the knowledge of how to make some of them, ones that are useful to be precise. Steel has a wide range of possible uses so if possible I could make even stronger grades of steel that could give the metals a run for their money. He responded, well if it's possible or I would need to find alternate ways in making them seeing as there are no steel works around. Huh so you say there are stronger types of steel, I would like to see that, Cathal chuckled. Well that's if I have the right tools to make it. Naruto sighed and jumped off of the carts and walked up to the front of them. Naruto saw that at the front was long strong chain attached to the coupling of the mine cart slash wagon and it went straight up the inline. Naruto brought up his rifle and peered through the scope, at the top of the incline was a familiar looking mechanism. So the dwarves use a winching mechanism, huh? Most likely it is hand cranked or uses a waiting system. Naruto analyzed in his head. Ooh we should take some of the ore, that way this quest won't turn out to be a total failure. Cathal suggested. Yeah Geislane we could be hitting it rich with this amount. In case if you have forgotten we would be painting a huge target on our backs, the humans don't take kindly to us demi-humans that well. This human doesn't mind us and neither does clan formal. Akane shrugged. I was referring to the empire and the nearby kingdoms and vassal states, they would rob us blind if we were to live like royalty. Bloody hell is it really that bad? It's like early 20th century racism where they deny any privileges to foreign races but worse. Naruto scowled adding more distaste for this world. If it's really that bad then you might as well just use the ore into something useful for yourself instead of selling it for money. Naruto added his insight. Akane sighed but nodded, Cathal nodded with glee and Geislane nodded at his insight. I suppose it would e worth the trouble and we can visit Astoria after this. Cathal and I still have our carrier bags so we can good amount of these oars, Naruto do you think you could lend us your bag it looks like it can carry much more than ours. Geislane asked politely. Naruto nodded as he can trust these guys with his bergen, for your information it is called a bergen, now I'm going to go up there and scout out the area while you lot load up the oars and don't forget to pick up the iron ore again. He threw off his bergen and giving his shoulders a quick roll around with a satisfying click he opened up his bergen and picked out a few weapons to take with him. He picked out the L85A2 with the underslung grenade launcher and the Mossberg 590 both slung behind his back and the MP5 to his side. All guns had plenty of ammunition in the pouches of his vest and various places and the rest was in his bergen. Okay I'm trusting you with some of my stuff here and don't nick anything out of it, I would know otherwise. Hey relax blondie you can trust us here. 
But you are going to look through my stuff anyway aren't you? Naruto raised an eyebrow at Akane. Maybe, she said teasingly. Naruto rolled his eyes and picked out a few emergency flares. See these, in case if you have an emergency down here like an enemy pops up. Lift the top off of these and strike the top of the lid onto this surface here. I will take a few of these for myself and will do the same. Naruto explained while demonstrating the use but did not light up the flare. Geislane nodded and accepted the flares, what do these do? It's a warning to each of us, a signal that will notify either of us depending on who lights it first. You will know once you see it in case if I use it. Naruto explained to her. Geislane just accepted his response and went to packing the oars into the bags. How will you contact us if it is clear up there? she asked further. Then I will flash my light down the trench a few time, you should see it easily. If you see a red light then that means danger. He answered to which she nodded. Naruto grabbed onto the chain and gave it a good pull to see if it is sturdy enough despite all of the rust, fortunately it remained strong and firm enough to support his weight. Naruto began his traverse up the steep incline with all of his weapons strapped behind his back in slings and holsters. This much climbing was nothing to Naruto but painful for any normal man, but Naruto didn't mind and kept on going ignoring the slight fatigue and pain he was feeling in his legs. But he soldiered on up the incline until he reached the top. Once he reached the top he had a thought, I guess I could have given them a radio but then that would mean teaching them on how to use it, on oh, never mind they should be fine down there. Naruto shrugged. Naruto looked around and indeed he did see an oversized winch mechanism with chains wrapped around the wooden cylinder. How the mechanism worked was that there were two tracks where one side goes up and the other goes down. Naruto guessed that at the top is where the ores and minerals get unloaded and then send the empty carts back down the incline where the carts that are full will be brought up the incline with a strong chain attached to the coupling but the coupling looked severely rusted and looked as if it could break from the strain. The carts that were left abandoned at the top of the incline had a block positioned in front of the wheels preventing the carts from moving when the coupling is detached and also preventing any accidents if the chain is broken. And also the winch operated mostly from some sort of gears that operates from a hand crank that would require a two or more man job to operate, otherwise you would need the heavy load at the top going down the incline while the empty carts gets pulled up by the weight. While he was surveying the surroundings and the winching mechanism he was suddenly hit by a strong smell one that was really familiar coming from the mine carts. His curiosity getting the better of him he went up to the carts and lifted the covers off the open top and was greeted with a familiar substance. Holy crap they even have gunpowder, do they even know the uses of this? I have so got to take some of this. He found a large copper pot nearby as some of the containers were in his bergen down the incline so he had to make do. He scooped up the black powder that wasn't ruined into the copper pot and sealed it with military duct tape that I conveniently had with me and taped it on my side and slapped it on, that thing is not going anywhere. I wonder how the girls are doing down there, he thought to himself. Naruto soon got his answer as then suddenly felt and heard a rumble and a demonic screech he heard down below. Naruto felt concerned for them and rushed back over to the edge of the incline and saw that the red flare was lit and flashing furiously down at the bottom while the person who couldn't see who was wielding it was waving it frantically as if they were calling for his help and they need it now. Naruto wasted no time and grabbed his sniper rifle, folded out the bipod and laid on his torso. He set the rifle up comfortably and peered through the scope. He saw that it was Akane who was waving the flare quite frantically and her face read that she was desperately in need of help. She held on to the flare for a few moments before she was forced to drop it by a rather large entity charging at her, and this strange creature or whatever this thing was made my eye widen in surprise and shock. I could see it was glowing red hot like lava. Play devil may cry, phantom boss theme. From the looks of this unknown entity it was some sort of oversized tarantula or scorpion he couldn't really tell which one as this creature held similarities between the two. It has the carapace and tail and stinger of a scorpion and a body and face of that of a tarantula. Think of Phantom off of Devil May Cry 1. 
Its carapace was dark like obsidian and its joints and unprotected parts were like it was flowing like molten lava but at the same time wasn't as it sort of looked like some kind of dark energy and also its tail is made entirely of it. I could see that they would need my help for this as they probably won't be able to handle an opponent like that for long without strong backup. But the problem is that I am too far away from them and the only thing I could do is provide sniper support from here. But would it be enough though? Naruto thought critically to himself. Naruto lined up a shot towards its face as it was attempting to aim for a lunge at Cathal as she had let her guard down slightly and briefly leaving herself open. I fired a shot at its face but it didn't penetrate but only chipping a piece off the carapace shell. The demonic-looking tarantula was thrown off from his attack as the bullet had actually hurt him. Then he left himself open for Cathal for her to swing her hammer directly to his face, effectively stunning him for a moment for Akane and Geislane to charge in with Akane firing off a volley of arrows at its face one hit its eye and then blinded. But in the end it only served to piss off the giant arachnid more and was twice as aggressive as before. Naruto fired off several more shots into its face and tail to prevent it from attacking but after each shot it looked like it was ignoring the pain from getting pieces of its carapace shot off from his sniper rifle. And then it looked up at me with those menacing red eyes and I knew I was only making it angrier with each shot. This method is taking too long to kill it, I know I am hurting it but pain won't kill him quickly enough for them to survive. I need something more powerful and the grenade launcher won't cut it because of the distance and I might hit them by accident, plus I can't see them down there due to the darkness. He mused to himself. Suddenly he thought up of an idea that was risky but could work out. He got back up trusting the girls down there to hold out long enough for him to hatch his plan. Naruto ran up to the carts and brought out a small clump of C4 and stuck it to the front of the carts. Naruto then noticed that there was a block holding the carts in place by the wheel on the track attached to a rope, nice and convenient he thought. Naruto gathered the end of the rope into his hand and primed the C4 ready with the trigger being his PDA system like how mobile phones were used to arm nitro cells back in his job with Team Rainbow. He got back into his position before and kept a lookout and waited for the right moment. But then another thought popped up into his head, how am I going to warn them though? I don't want them getting caught up into the blast, he thought while scrounging around his head for ideas. Fortunately he found a solution uh, he remembered that he had on part of his radio with him add that the others were in a small pocket in his bergen, and one of them was still on according to his radio that he could see a green LED light shining on his radio controls for the second radio that was still on. But they were still in the bergen and they don't know how to use it, secondly they were used as earphones. But then Naruto had an idea, Geislane is part cat, therefore she has sharp hearing so she would most likely be able to hear my voice over the radio. Naruto muttered to himself as he tuned into the short mid-range radio. Naruto successfully connected to the second radio and began his message to her. Geislane, if you can hear me push that thing onto the empty tracks. I repeat push that thing onto the empty tracks. He ordered down the mic. And now he waited and watched on the battle down below, watching if they had heard and understood his message and will see that order through. With Geislane, Akane and Cathal several minutes before. What a useful bag this Berg, Burger, Bugger, Baka, ah uh, what was it? Cathal scratching her head in confusion. Bergen, Akane corrected. Cathal snapped her fingers together, that's the one, ma I was close enough. But still I like the size of this, I would think this bag was made for me. Cathal said admiring the usefulness of the Bergen and its size and strength. How can he carry so much weight around when it is full? Akane questioned. Must be a pretty tough man to haul such weight around during his travels, from the looks of those weapons and equipment they must be quite heavy, even for a human that is still impressive. There have been some humans who could do somewhat others would call impossible feats to attain, superior strength would be one of them. But the human males would often think that strength is the most important aspect to have in battle. But for Naruto I believe he has many aspects he thinks that are equally important to have. Like what? Akane inquired more. Endurance, the ability to strive further in any difficult situations where most would have given up. 
I could see it in his eyes, the exhaustion and the pain he is going through. He is simply brushing it off and paying no attention. Now that you mention it, he did have those dark rings around his eyes. He long has he not been sleeping for. Akane nodded feeling a bit concerned about the blonde SF operator. Even the best warriors need a good night's sleep. Cathal added in her thoughts. Says you, you sleep like log for hours sometimes. Akane teased her. Maybe it's because I do most of the heavy lifting in this team that I get rather tired and need a good rest sometimes. And you're the one to talk slacker, Cathal countered with a shrug and finished packing the raw metal oars into the bergen and hoisted it onto her shoulder snugly. Hm fits me perfectly. Cathal said cheerily ignoring Akane's pouting and ranting to Cathal. Geislane who had just finished packing suddenly heard a noise as her ears perked up sensing the nearby potential threat. She let out a hiss to warn the other two to be on alert. They responded by drawing their weapons, Cathal with her warhammer, Akane her bow and Geislane her long sword. They waited for a while and whatever Geislane had sensed as she knew it was coming closer but where? Then she noticed a dim light coming closer to them up above them. The light looked like a burning ball of molten rock, but it wasn't a rock as legs had spread out of it and landed with a might crash onto the ground. The legs started moving as the demonic beast started moving forward. The three girls were now sweating nervously, W what is that? Cathal asked while gripping her hammer tensely. Akane answered also as tense as her partner, a demon, from Hardy's realm of the underworld. But that can't be, why is one of her demons here? The demonic arachnid crawled up to them while impaling his legs into the ground. Bah! More pathetic little things crawling about where they don't belong, always sticking their noses into where they shouldn't go. Akane stepped forward and confronted the demon, demon of Hardy. Why are you here, demons are forbidden to enter our realm. The arachnid only laughed, Baha. According to Hardy she could care less of our absence in the underworld, and I happen to like this place that those pathetic greedy and selfish dwarves built for themselves, so made myself at home right before I and those savages took their homes from them. The three girls widened their eyes at the revelation, so it was you who lead the invasion. The demon only tilted its head, who, me? Nay and not my thing, that would be the orc warlord Osric the besieger. He was the mastermind of this invasion even for a mindless orc he was a somewhat decent tactician I will admit. Who or what are you demon? And what are you doing here? Geislane confronted it with a glare. Fay. Watch your tone weakling or I will as the humans call it step on you like a bug. As for what I am called I am known as Baratham. As why I am here, to simply kill the one who killed my spider brethren. I quite liked them and then I suddenly find them dead with holes punched through them. Now who was the one responsible for all that? Baratham said hoarsely with malice oozing out of his voice and his eyes brighten up into a blood-red color. The three of them all slightly flinched at who he was referring to and said person was all the way up there in a safe spot, they were in big trouble now. What should we do? Fighting it would be difficult. Demons although are rare but they can still be killed, we need his help. Geislane announced. You mean dash. Akane take this stick and do what Naruto has said earlier. Geislane gave Akane the flare. What makes you think he hasn't run off already, Akane narrowed her eye in skepticism. I doubt he would do that, if he was then he would have forsaken us to die earlier. Akane nodded and accepted the flare and made her way over to Incline removing the top of the flare, cover me, she called out to her companions. What do you think I am doing? Cathal replied with a grunt as she smacked the demon's leg away with a loud clang. Baratham felt disgruntled at the slight pain he felt from the hit as nobody had laid a crack on his shell before, some scratches before but they were nothing. Gah! You wretched degenerated bitch of a cow! Nobody has laid a crack on my shell in centuries and none shall survive to even boast about it. Geez your compliment flatters me. Cathal said uncaringly at its murderous tone. Akane took the chance from the demon's distraction she hurried over to the incline and pooped the cap off and held the stick and cap both together. 
remembering what Naruto had said earlier and swiped the top over it. She at first didn't know how hard she needed to swy and kept swiping out of frustration until at last as she pressed the cap in further and harder, he flare lit up like a second sun in the darkness. She waved it around hoping to catch his attention but she couldn't see him up there. Unfortunately Baratham had noticed the sudden bright light and headed over to her instead. Akane dropped the flare onto the ground and dive rolled out of the way as it charged at her but its charge was interrupted by Geislane who dashed onto his back and impaled her sword into one of the cracks. Wrath. You bitch, I'll enjoy killing you and maybe when I am done I'll enjoy wiping out your race so they can meet Hardy in the underworld. Baratham howled out into a fit of rage. Geislane jumped off of the demon but then noticed that her sword was heating up and running red. We need to kill it fast before the demon's own body will melt and deform our weapons. Easier said than done, where is Naruto we need his help, Alkane fired off an arrow. Into the unprotected open cracks of the shell only hurting him little as the arrow would only melt and set a blaze on impact so it didn't prove much usefulness, it's his shell that's his weakness but also his strongest point, if we break it apart then he will be finished. Geislane announced to them. I can't shoot through that shell with my arrows alone, they're not strong enough. Akane said to her shaking her head at the revelation. What about your spirit magic? Surely you could enchant your arrows. Cathal pointed out. Yes but I am not willing for every living thing in this mountain to swarm us when one of my enchanted arrows go off, that move is too loud. Akane shook her head in denial. Cathal had parried a strike from the demon arachnid as it had used its stinger made of magma and molten rock, the impact had knocked her off balance giving Baratham the chance to strike. Cathal. Geislain and Akane both shouted to their companion as they feared for her life. It wasn't until they heard a pinging sound and a shatter against Baratham's face that had threw off his attack way off and shards of his face had exploded off of his face. That intervention had saved Cathal's life. Arg. Who was that? He roared and raged at the fact that somebody else was apparently present in this fight and he hadn't known of his presence. Wrath. Cathal counter attacked by smashing her hammer with a great swing directly in the demon's face, cracking its face even further, almost splitting it. The demon flew quite a distance away, smashing into the trench wall in a daze. Akane and Geislane saw their chance to strike as Akane pulled back the string on her bow with three arrows positioned and she fired all three at Baratham's face. Fortunately enough one of the arrows had a direct hit into one of his eyes effectively blinding the one eye out of eight. Geislane couldn't get close enough in time as she was forced to retreat as the demon arachnid had went into a fit of rage. Akane however turned to Geislane for answers. What just happened I just saw something hit that demon in the face and shattered a piece off of it, not to mention Cathal wouldn't be alive if it hadn't been for that intervention. Geislane looked up to the top of the incline intently and saw a figure way up at the top, I suspect it was Naruto's doing with that peculiar weapon of his. I heard a small brief sound like air being blown out of something at the top of the slope, so it must have been him. Cathal also looked up the incline and gave a mental thank you to Naruto, I suppose I could forgive him for earlier, maybe I should repay him with anything he wants from me, or of me. Cathal briefly blushed at that though but shook her head and focused back to the task at hand. Suddenly there were several more pinging noises coming from his face as pieces of his shell was crumbling off and even another eye had exploded from the impact. Baratham then looked up the incline, so that's where you are you little shit. I hope you are sitting comfortably up there as you watch your whores die painfully as I melt off their flesh and you can only watch helplessly and then I will be going after you next once I am through with them, he bellowed his promise of pain. The adventurers grasped onto their weapons more tightly at the threat against them and their friend. They were about to go in for another attack until Geislane's cat ears had twitched as it picked up a voice coming from one of pockets in the Bergen rucksack, backpack. Geislane could clearly hear the voice and recognized it as Naruto's. Wait. Naruto says we must drive it onto the empty line tracks. Wait, but he is all the way up there. I heard his voice coming from the Bergen. Eh, how did he get in here? Cathal turned her head to the Bergen, oh I I I Naruto, you in there. 
Cathal called out to the Bergen. Cathal opened the one pocket that the voice was coming from and picked out a wireless radio earpiece and then held it against her ear. Asterisk BZZT, asterisk I repeat again, you must push that thing onto the empty rail tracks. Once it is on there you might want to take cover behind those mine carts. Preferably I would want it stunned or immobilized before it is in the right position BZZT, Naruto called out on the earpiece. What did it or Naruto say? Akane asked. Drive that demon onto the other tracks and make sure it stays there it seems. Geislane answered calmly and collectively. How in the hell does he expect us to do that? He has a plan and he needs us to carry it through. But it won't be easy. I know, but we must do it. Geislane dashed to her target in a zigzag maneuver and the arachnid demon eyed her intently determined to impale her at the right time before his concentration was thrown off by a another silent bullet striking against his fong and shot it straight off. The arachnid recoiled as it howled pain and that lead to Akane gaining the chance to let loose her volley and shot another arrow into one of its eyes the spider jumped onto four of its legs screeching in agony. Cathal then charged like a rampant bull and swung her hammer over her shoulder and head and struck the head of the hammer onto Baratham's bottom torso. Baratham lost his balance on his four kegs and tumbled backwards from the brute force of the hammer strike had sent him tumbling on his back like a vulnerable turtle on its back. Back with Naruto. Naruto saw the whole thing as he was supporting them with sniper cover. He worked in sync with Geislane without her knowing that he was and shot off one its fangs and then let the other two do all the work from there. Until he saw that they did exactly what he told them to do, he saw his chance. Now. Naruto yanked on the rope and the wooden block flew off the track preventing the mine carts in place. With a squeak, rattle and roll of rusted metal they slowly moved out of the shed where the winching mechanism was stationed. Just as the trucks had reached the edge of the incline that was going down. They suddenly stopped where they were. Naruto face faulted at that anticlimax. Oh for fuck's sake, it's still connected to the winch, he said aggravation. Secondly the winch was jammed due to the metal parts being heavily rusted. His brief moment of anger was soon interrupted as he then heard a straining noise coming from the winch that was coupled to the carts at the back. From the sound of it, the couplings that were chains were so rusted that it couldn't handle the weight. One of the links on the chains were slowly being torn apart by the weight until snap, and then they were off, thundering down the incline going faster and faster. Hurrah! Naruto cheered as he peered through the scope waiting for the moment. Back with the girls. Erm what are we waiting for exactly? Cathal questioned hiding behind the minecart stationed at the bottom and all three of them were peeking out of cover at the demon who was thrashing around in pain and frustrating attempts to upright himself. He didn't say. Geislane answered. I swear to the gods if he dash, Akane grinded her teeth. Be patient and have faith in him. Geislane reassured her dark elf companion. Erm gals the demons getting back up. Said Cathal in worry as she gripped onto her hammer. Ah shit, he took too long. Akane cursed as she primed her arrow to her bow. Wait, I can hear something coming down. Geislane stopped them. Baratham soon upright himself and laughed, Baha. You shout V ran while you had the the gloves are coming off, and this time there is no holding back. Baratham spat out in anger as a few globs of lava flew out of his mouth from his threat. He would have charged if he wasn't distracted by a sudden sound that sounded like metal screeching and clattering. What the hell is that NOI dash, he turned to face the noise but he soon came face to face of the mine carts that had thundered down the incline at such a speed that it was a surprise that it didn't collapse or derail itself halfway down. The mine carts collided into his face with a force that tripled the force of Cathal's hammer swing. When the leading cart crashed into Baratham's face the rest followed through on the force doubling the impact it gave and then the mine carts were soon flipped up and derailed intro the air and landed on Baratham burying him in shattered frames of the carts as well as their loads of black powder. The three had seen the whole scene enacting and were speechless at the convenient timing at the sudden intervention. 
until they heard a beeping coming from the wreckage of the carts and spilled black powder and Baratham covered in a heap of it and pieces of the cart resting on top of his body. Asterisk Boehm, a mighty explosion roared from the wreckage and the detonation had ignited the black powder into a massive inferno and flew upwards in a giant fireball. The three were startled at the explosion as the blast had rocketed past them and blasted against the carts almost uplifting them. The explosion made Cathal jump in fright while covering her ears while did Akane did the same with hers. Geislane however was rolling on the floor clutching her ears as they were super sensitive to sound. You're welcome by the way. Song end. Akane stomped over to the mic that Geislane had in her coat pocket, ignoring the unusual device's appearance she shouted down the mic, what the hell was that Naruto? I believe that was the sound of me saving your life. His tone sounded suspiciously close to smugness. Well it's a good thing I can't hear that particular sound properly as my ears are ringing you bastard. Akane ranted. Well you're alive are you not? Geislane is on the floor writhing in pain as her ears are really sensitive to sound, Cathal looks spooked and I am really pissed. I am so going to kill you Naruto. You would have to come up here first. Oh I intend to, she growled. No seriously I mean it. Why? Just look up. Akane did exactly that and saw that the fireball had ignited the mass amount of web that covered up the vast majority of the mining trench. What they didn't know was that the giant spider's web fluids were highly flammable apparently. The fire had lit up the whole spider's web throughout the whole trench like a torch and paved its way through the whole trench like an inferno. Burning every corpse both alive and dead that had been trapped in the web and every spider along with it that was currently in the trench. You need to get up here fast that would no doubt alert everything in this mine and the city nearby like a lit up beacon in a desert in the middle of the night. And whose fault do you think that was? Quit your dawdling and get up here immediately. Who do you think you are to order me dash? Move it now. Naruto roared down the mic and she could his echo from above. Akane looked put the incline in surprise to hear someone raise their voice at her in a commanding voice. Akane he's right, we need to get where he is. Geislane grasped onto her shoulder and was now recovered from earlier. Akane scowled still feeling upset. Alright fine we'll meet you there, and don't you dare think about abandoning us here. Don't worry I have no desire to forsake you to the wolves, I will cover you from up here. With that weapon you used against Baratham. Geislane asked him, Is that that what they call him? And yes precisely that, he answered. Geislane nodded and went up to Cathal, snap out of it Cathal, we need to get moving. Cathal shook her head as she returned from her brief shock moment. Huh. Erm yes sure. She got herself out of the small episode of shock and hoisted the Bergen comfortably on her shoulders. Wait how are we going to get Cathal up there, I don't think the chain would hold her weight. Are you calling me fat, said Cathal to Akane indignantly and slightly offended. Just tell her to use the rails as if it was a ladder. Naruto cut in to offer his idea. I suppose that could work, but is it stable enough? Geislane thought over it. The iron bars will hold out fine, it's the wooden planks you need to watch your step on. Other than that you should be fine, Naruto assured them. All right then, Akane you go first and cover us on the way up, Cathal you're next as you are carrying the heaviest load I will stand behind you to assure that you won't slip. How confident are you to support the weight of a minotaur female carrying a warhammer and loads of metal ore in my bergen? We cat people are excellent climbers, that is why we have such strong bodies. I am probably the strongest of my clan perhaps even my race despite my father being human and I could and will carry my best friends up this slope even if I have to if it kills me to keep my friends safe. She said in both pride and in conviction. Her friends smiled at their friends' loyalty to them. Then get climbing I am picking up movement of multiple hostels up here and I can hear battle chants, war cries and battle drums, they are preparing for war up here and they are calling for our blood. All right we will leave our protection to you. Copy that. The three adventurers hurried to the incline while Akane went up first, she ascended up quickly and gracefully by jut jumping up the planks. 
Cathal wasn't as quick but scaled up the tracks pulling her up and using the rails as a grip to throw her up. Even with all of the weight she is carrying it didn't slow her down and exhaust her. Geislane would have been the quickest climber but she was the second strongest so she volunteered to watch the rear in case anyone loses balance and grip on the tracks. While the three ascended up the tracks at a fast pace, Naruto was keeping the girls covered at the top of the incline and the trench. His eyes were scanning his surroundings and also keeping an eye on his movement sensor and switching it to heartbeat sensor in case he missed anything. Naruto counted at 7 then 15 and then it jumped up 35 hostels coming their way. And what's worse is that the girls are in an open spot where they could easily get shot at due to the web catching on fire it has illuminated the whole trench thus alerting pretty much anything nearby. Naruto however was fine as the shadows blended in with the black kit very well but he decided to put back on his S10 respirator and his hood over his head to cover his sun-kissed blonde hair. Come on, come on you maggots. The spider's nest has been destroyed, find the ones who are responsible and catch them. I don't care how you do it, flay em, gut them, eat em alive I don't care warboss Osric demands this. Naruto heard shouting and clattering of boots and armor coming from over the in the distance as he could see probably a whole platoon of them which is probably a scouting party or the guards of this place. Their accents sounded a lot like how Tolkien's orcs sounded except they are speaking in this world's language. The orc's tone was rough, hoarse and aggressive like a wild beast. There they are, on the slope, a goblin archer screeched. Oh they look tasty. A fat piggish orc said while licking his lip. And juicy, another said smacking his lips together. Forget food, they like really ripe for good use he he he, an orc said lecherously. Don't just stand there ogling scum, capture them, ordered the scouting leader who was wearing blood-red scavenged iron-plated armor with spikes on the shoulders and a serrated and jagged blade. Oh do we really have to kill them? It will be such a waste. Aim for the legs, they don't need those. Yeah all we need is the top part. Just as a few archers and crossbow users were lining up their shots. Ready, aim, fi dash, the leader was just about shout out his order to fire until he was interrupted by a a 7.62mm NATO round penetrating through his cranium and exiting through the other end. Air leader, said the leader's second in command as he tapped him on the shoulder, the orders, he tapped him on the shoulder and the orc turned around revealing the gaping hole in the back of his head and then fell into the fiery abyss below. The leader's dead. I am in command now, archers fire the arrows. You lot scout the area and find the scumbag who was responsible. Asterisk PSSHT. PHWIP, asterisk another silent shot was discharged out of the sniper rifle hitting an archer who had tried to fire an arrow at them. Naruto was trying to give the girls enough time before they arrive in the deep end safely, he doesn't want them to get wounded early. Naruto then turned on his mic, Jislane be advised I have spotted several orcs trying to take pot shots at you, they are focusing their aim though and attempting to immobilize you. Typical orc behavior, they always want the females alive so they could violate us later. And then keep us for later uses for other orcs. What would likely happen if they were to find me? Then you would be the lucky one out of all of us as they don't like males so they just simply kill, torture for amusement and eat them alive. Therefore you would be getting a swift death which I find that more preferable. Maybe for you but, wait are there females amongst their kinds like the orcs ogres and trolls? Oh fucking hell, don't ask that I'd rather not know, he quickly knocked the images out of his head. Or they would give you to the more aggressive ogre and troll females so they could rape you. Geislane said bluntly. Yep I think I will just be killing myself if it comes to that. Actually from what I have seen the females are much more better looking than the males, most of them do look a bit brutish but they still have their feminism. Akane added her thoughts in to make me even more confused about the situation just so she could tease me. Wait is this a good thing or a bad thing you are talking about? And do the orcs have females? Depends how you look at it and know the orcs are made differently to breeding, but the female ogres and trolls do tend to get really wild when they are in the mood from what I have heard. If you were a weaker man then they could snap you like twig. Akane joked. 
Okay that is a bit too much information, and how the hell am I in a better situation than you lot? You have a chance at dying honorably if the orcs kill you first rather than getting your mind broken from the endless rape. Geislane said again bluntly. I may still get the same treatment as you lot, but honor has nothing to do with this, and this is our lives on the line we are talking about here. I will be damned and dead if I let them take you for their sick pleasures. Naruto holstered his sniper on his back and brought out his L85A2-SA80A2 bullpup assault rifle with grenade launcher and the magazine taped together so they could be flipped over to the next magazine if one runs empty. Listen get to the top and go, I will attract their attention over to me. Are you crazy, are you planning to get yourself swarmed? Geislane sounded shocked that he would suggest such a thing. It's not like it has happened before but I still got out of it in the end. Take my bag and go. Naruto don't you can't fight them all on your own. She warned him. The regiment that I serve does this stuff all the time, it is what we do. We have always fought against the odds even in dire situation when the tables are turned against us. But we are the ones who will always get the job done, always staring at the face of danger and even death. Hence why we always stand by our motto, who dares wins. He said to them before turning the radio off. He pulled the bolt back and armed his rifle, attached an oxygen canister to his respirator filter and checked over his equipment. He made sure he secured most of his weapons to his back so they won't get in the way but will be easy to switch weapons. He then rushed to where the orcs are at fully intent on taking them out. And he didn't care if he was going in loud. He reached a chest-high rock that served as decent cover and immediately went into a crouch behind the rock. Just before the orcs and goblins could shoot another volley out, Naruto lined up his sights on his AG-36 40mm grenade launcher and fired at their feet with a high-explosive grenade. Bang! The explosion echoed everywhere and the orcs were spooked by the sudden explosion as the grenade projectile exploded underneath the unfortunate ones, tearing their legs off from the blast added with the shrapnel. Some of them were even launched in the air and fell into the abyss as well. Hey! What just happened? The second-in-command roared out of his rag face mask and spiked helmet and scratched and dented armor that was painted over with blood. Then suddenly multiple shots were fired killing the archer and crossbowman with instant kill shots to the headshot and upper torso, some of the orcs who were pumped up full of adrenaline and rage took a few shots to the torso but they refused to go down. Asterisk bang. Bang. Bang, asterisk Naruto fired one shot at a time in semi-automatic for accuracy and conserving his ammo unless he was forced to go into full auto. Then the orcs located the sound and saw the flashes coming out of this strange weapon like a staff spitting out powerful concentrated fireballs. Each shot coming out the barrel had illuminated the area around him. When the orcs had a good look at him they could tell it was a man due to the physical structure but the apparel was odd and quite frightening, its eyes were pitch black and so was his body blended into the shadows. But the orcs were very stubborn creatures and they rarely back off in a fight, it's just one man get I'm you bunch of gits, the now orc leader of the party roared out his orders to which the orcs roared out their war cry, why, come and get some of this you ugly barstards, he taunted while gesturing his hand in a come over here if you think you're hard enough motion. That did the trick as they were goaded into charging without any form of strategy as the orcs only knew one strategy and that is being battle fodder and charging the front in multiple waves. Naruto stood up and advanced slowly while picking off the orcs one by one making sure to aim for either center mass or headshots only as the orcs seem to be quite tolerant to pain when they are pumped up on battle adrenaline and would take some concentrated shots in the right places to take them down for good. After eleven orcs were gunned down, Naruto switched mags by flipping the mag over and slotted the other taped mag that was on the bottom of the now empty mag. And this time switched the firing mechanism to full auto as they had gotten closer and they were bunching up together. He sprayed his whole mag at the clumps of orcs as their armor proved nothing towards the onslaught of a 556 by 45 mm NATO rounds punching through their flesh and armor like nothing. Naruto had then could smell the rotten odor of the orcs through his mask and he realized that he hadn't fastened on the canister properly to let the air be filtered through and quickly switched it so it was. Bloody hell, you stink, 
he insulted them while making the gesture as if he was pinching his nose and wafting the air. One pig-faced orc got close enough to attempt to cut him in half but Naruto just rammed the barrel into the pig's snout, squeal piggy. S-Q-E-E-E, -E -E, the orc squealed in rage just before Naruto blasted his snout and the back of his head off, spewing chunks of the orc's brain matter and blood on the orcs behind them as they stood still in shock. Damn, that's nasty. Naruto commented in disgust as he pulled out the barrel to see blood added with the pig's snot on his barrel and proceeded to wipe the barrel clean on the pig's rags. The orcs snapped out of their stupor and let out another roar and continued their charge. Naruto swung round and brought up his rifle only to hear the sound of an empty magazine and chamber. Crap, sod that. New gun. He cursed as he switched to his sidearm and shot another orc in the face as it tried to gut him with a pike. Try harder, you smelly green bastards. He said insultingly in his muffled voice. He may have contradicted himself as a hypocrite when it comes to racism but all bets were off if they were attacking him. After a few orcs had been shot down he decided to switch to melee and unsheathed his kukri in his left hand and a tomahawk in his right. Blue Stali Ultranum instrumental or with vocals, take your pick. Crops, trees, orcs. They all fit the same category, they all get cut down. Naruto commented as he sidestepped an orc's overhead swing and heel kicked the orc in the back sending him down the trench and the orc howled all the way down to the bottom until he crashed onto the floor. Six orcs came at me at one two with scavenged blades that were battle-worn an axe, a club a mace and a dagger for a goblin. One orc tried to go for a stab into my gut but Naruto struck his hand off with his tomahawk and stabbed him instead in the worn our leather cuirass with the sharp cookery blade cutting straight through proving the useless armor no good against the sharpness and high grade of steel that this was made from. Then he twisted the blade and forced the blade out of his right side and he swung it round and cut through anther orc at the joint of his arm that was holding an axe meant for him and the orc howled in agony while he clutched the stump of where his upper arm used to be. The gutted orc collapsed on his knees holding out his guts in his hands as they spilled out and Naruto put him out of his misery by driving the spiked tip of the tomahawk into his skull. Another orc tried to bring down a heavy club onto him but Naruto countered with a high kick into the beast's jaw with finesse and power that shattered the orc's teeth and stunned his sense. Naruto clutched onto the tomahawk hard and brought the spiked tip out of the twitching orc's skull and aimed the blade of the axe into the bigger orc's own. Only for the orc to regain his sense and with surprising speed the orc grabbed onto the arm Naruto had his tomahawk in and squeezed tightly forcing Naruto to let go of his tomahawk while roaring into his face sending out spit onto his mask. Let go you bastard! He shouted back to the orc and he slashed the orc's hand off and the orc bawled out as it recoiled in pain as blood poured out of the amputated limb. Naruto slashed both of the orc's kneecaps at the soft part at the back, completely immobilizing him as he crashed down onto his knees. Naruto grabbed onto the back of the orc's head with greater strength that overpowered the orc's own strength, and he unsheathed his sykes knife and plunged it straight into the orc's throat, and then he pulled it out again, and again. And again and kept on doing it picking up the speed like he was a blur then he started slashing open the stab wounds as more blood splashed out of the wound and Naruto made no cry or shout as he was cutting open the orc's neck with a five inch blade. Have never seen anything like it, this one man had killed most of the orcs in their party barely under a minute and he was overpowering on of the biggest orcs in the party third in command due to the large size of the orc and to see this orc overpowering him they were not so sure and they started to feel fear from him. The leader sensed the fear off of his subordinates and had seen the whole disappointing fight of his orcs against this wretched human. Gah! You're all useless, I might as well do this sodding thing myself. He unsheathed his own jagged sword and picked up the former leader's own sword that he had dropped earlier. He stomped over to the masked SAS operator standing tall and acting big. And big he was, certainly bigger than the one he had killed. The orc he had killed was around 6 feet 2 inches. This one was 6 feet 5 inches and built like a heavy weight boxer. He then started spinning his blades all theatrically like a windmill that made Naruto sigh at this tedious display. Naruto didn't move a muscle to which the orc had dumbly took it that he was intimidating him. 
You think you are the biggest and baddest round here I? But look at you all petrified, can't move a muscle. Well you shall feel the orsish might of my dual-bladed style that has slain over a thousand me, bang, he was interrupted by a loud discharge of Sig Sauer 9mm pistol and a very unimpressed Naruto. The orc had been silenced as the bullet went through his skull and out the other end hitting the inside of his helmet. Shut the fuck up. Can't you tell that I wasn't even paying any attention to caring about your empty threats, well technically you can't because I am wearing this scary mask you see. Naruto said coolly with no hints of interest in what the orc was saying. The orc just slowly fell back and crashed onto his back. The orcs all shuffled back nervously at the powerful weapon Naruto wielded. Naruto turned back to the petrified-looking orcs. Oh, sorry was he your leader. The leaders are dead. They were the strongest in our group. How can a mere single man kill many of us in short time? That is no mere man, that is a demon. It's a black knight of Emroy. Naruto tilted his head at that. Who or what the fuck is Emroy? Naruto muttered to himself. The orcs were about to turn around and run until the herd war drums banging on in the distance and they all could see multiple lights of torches irradiating passageways and bridges. The drums were also mixed with battle chanting. Listen the rest of the boys are coming. Yeah why are we running when we now have the numbers? The orcs that were considering about running suddenly regained there and turned around to face him again only to see an absent Naruto who only left an outline of his appearance and the tomahawk was missing from where it had landed earlier. Where'd he go? The orcs scratched their heads. Naruto had left by the time the horns had sounded and the drums were beating. Time to scarper. He said to himself while running in the direction of the ruined city. While running G over a bridge that lead away from the incline where he knew where the girls were at. Right I know if I go in the direction of the city it would lead them away from the girls, but why haven't I seen anyone yet? He thought to himself while running through the streets as he could hear them gaining on his trail. Hello, this will do. He went into an alleyway that was like a maze. Naruto didn't go through the maze like an idiot but instead he jumped up and climbed the wall and onto a building like a parkour free runner except that they were not carrying all this weight behind their backs. He then laid still and kept quiet. He heard them marching up to where he was at and then passed the building he was on believing that he went through the alleyways. When they were gone Naruto took off again and went to find a vantage point somewhere preferably high up. He looked around as he could clearly see his surroundings better than in the trench. Naruto then saw that the closest and biggest building was a coliseum, that place had plenty of cover to move about Naruto thought for sure. Naruto got up from the roof and looked out for any more incoming orcs or any other creatures for that matter. Finding that the coast was clear he decided to jump from roof to roof to dodge the tricky mazes of the alleyways. After a few roof hoppings Naruto had lost his footing as the roof had gave way underneath him and he crashed through the roof, cursing his luck as he landed in a room which was probably the dining room he got himself back up on his feet and brushed himself off. Ow, that hurt. He mumbled to himself. And that was when he noticed a shadow on the wall in front of him one was his shadow and there was another shadow of a person behind him and the figure was raising a club. Realizing the danger he immediately ducked down. HYAA, came a voice that swung the club but missed as it only hit air. Strangely it sounded female and a rather cute one too. I quickly whipped out my sour pistol and spun around to face the possible threat and to add to my shock was another humanoid creature, an ogre, but female. I had pictured in my mind that the ogres were just as ugly as the orcs. While some orcs looked normal like Tolkien's orcs but there were some that were classed as pig men and had the head of a pig. It was more like I had strangely pictured Fiona out of Shrek but this ogre's skin color was light a natural tan instead of unnatural green skin. The ogre was tall. Nearly as tall as Cathal but few inches shorter but more slender in build than Cathal but her strength was nothing to laugh at if she could carry that club around like a stick. Her head. But this one had denied my expectation of that by a long shot, who are you? You do know it is bad to trespass on people's property. 
The ogre said sweetly but it was hard to picture her as sweet innocent being when she about took off my head with a club with metal studs on the end that was most likely scavenged or borrowed off of some place or someone. Well I do apologize for that but I am on the run from multiple orcs wanting to tear me apart. So it was you they were after. Said another voice this one was a more stern and militaristic authorizing tone as she told the ogre to stand down but turned to look at me with a serious look. Thanks to you we were almost caught due to your rampage we heard earlier. Well how was I supposed to know you were in the city, and for your information that was entirely my plan to draw most of their forces here in the city so they won't find my air temporary traveling companions. Are they friends of yours? The ogre tilted her head cutely. We only met today. Naruto shrugged. They were good people and I couldn't just allow them to be caught so I volunteered myself to be the distraction so I went into the city to draw most of them here. I didn't mean for you to get caught in it as well miss. HM, I am Lady Ezra Ko Vela Captain of the Order of the Rose Knights. She stated out rather proudly in her own noble light. Speaking of light her armor was too fucking shiny and gaudy for my tastes that make me want to tactical face palm at the fact that it makes her a living target. Her armor looked more ornamental than practical with all of the floral designs on it, and, picture the manga armor of the Rose Knights instead of the anime as the manga had more detail to it, because it looks more appropriate for a knight order with that armor mainly consisting of children coming from noble families. The knight who I could now see when she stepped into the natural light was a light purple Herdheim hair style that went down to her back with indigo colored eyes. Everything about her screamed nobility. Nice to meet you Ezra I am Dash. That's my lady to you commoner, a feisty orange haired had interrupted me and pointed rudely in my face. She had her long bright orange hair did in a knotted bow that tied her long hair into a ponytail. So? Naruto shrugged uncaringly. The knights twitched in vexation at his uncaring attitude especially the purplet who was displeased and the orange haired knight who was furious at his blatant disrespect. Sue such rudeness, I demand you to show respect for your betters this insta dash dot. She demanded. No. Naruto interrupted her not caring at all. What do you mean no you filthy peasant? Now Naruto felt that this tie of character in a person he would love to make suffer the most if given the chance. Exactly what I meant, as in no, no bloody way, not a chance in hell and sod off you muppet. He casually said, How dare you? W.A., she murmured as I stepped out of the dark corner and into the light, showing all of the four knights and ogre in the room my appearance. I'm sorry you were saying. W. What are you? Some sort of demon. Come again? I'm as human as you lot are. Naruto just looked at her funny. Not with a face like that, she said rather uncomfortably with Naruto staring at her unnerving her. It's a mask you dolt. He deadpanned behind his mask and tilted his head and held out his hands. Jerer, then why can't we see your eyes? Naruto moved his hand up to lenses and detached the filter lenses revealing his deep cerulean blue eye that looked so captivating to anyone that stared into them. Cool trick huh? He chuckled at the reaction and popped the lenses back onto his mask's eyepiece. May we see your face? Ezra requested of him. Why? Because I want to know if we can trust you? You will have to earn that right first along with my respect, Ezra. Naruto didn't have the time for games and he didn't care if he was pissing off the four knights in the room and this world's authority. You've already wasted enough of my time already, you either tell me what the hell you are doing here and with miss, what's your name miss? Naruto turned to the blonde-haired ogre. I'm Tyanishia, but please call me Tio instead. She replied back in a light-hearted way and gave a cheerful wave despite the tense situation that the knights were emitting. Nice to meet you Tio, and back to the topic and who are you, where did you come from what is your reason to be here exactly? Naruto nodded to her out of respect. He liked her for some reason, always able to remain calm by being light-hearted despite the situation, there must be some sort of misunderstanding with this ogre as it seems that not all of them were pictured as bad as they sounded to be. Who are you to dare to order us? Sergeant Maelstrom of the British SAS and we always dare it's in our fucking motto, 
it's how we win. Says. Never heard of them, and where is this this country you speak of, the leader mused to herself and then asked another question. Far, very far. Wait you only gave us a title and not your real name, why won't you give us your name the orange-haired girl butted in rudely. Because I don't know who you are affiliated with and for and for all I know I'd rather keep my head low around here. So you're a spy. She accused. Hardly, I'm just scout, well I was. Naruto scoffed. That still makes you suspicious. She said not convinced with his response. My reasons for being here are my own now quit wasting my time or I will be straight out of the door. Naruto now had enough with the rough treatment and constant diversions of the topic. Are you crazy you can't just leave us here, what if they come back, the young knight said in shock and felt uncertain about the orcs. Your knights are you not? You have a blade at your side, outside there are orcs. You can easily figure the next part out if they get in here, he said in a mock of uncaring making his way to the door, to plant the seeds of doubt and fear in their minds. A common trick used to give way information. Wait, please help us. Tio pleaded to Naruto who stopped and turned to face her, Tio was the first to give but not out of fear it seems, but more out of concern for somebody else. Now Naruto was not one to turn a blind eye on those who were in need even those who were of a different race. He just does not like having his time wasted by people who were ignorant and arrogant who think they were above anyone else. Even the authority with some of the fresher forces in the police and army caused him some problems earlier on in his career from time to time stopping him at the most inopportune moments during some operations because they thought he was cosplaying and snuck over the police lines and into firefights. It only took a few rounds of beasting them verbally and sometimes physically if they didn't get the message. Naruto however did spare some of his time if they were to just shut up and cooperate. For what reason should I help? I'm already in the deep end enough as it is. We're escaping. She said simply. I understand the knights but why you in particular? Because I helped them. Did you now? With what exactly? She motioned for him to come over to him and Naruto followed. Captain, a knight said nervously while gripping the pommel of her sword and the captain responded by raising her hand in a stand-down motion. Tio lifted a mat off of a pair of trapdoors that she opened them and it lead to a basement. A basement full of scared, crying, and a few traumatized girls. They looked up to the basement doors when it opened and let's just say that Naruto's mask and the breathing certainly did not help the mood. They shuffled away from the doors in slight fear and a few cried out in fright. What the fuck is this about? Naruto turned back to the knights with a fire raging in his eyes. This time no games were to be played. After asking the all-important question, it took them time to respond, time Naruto was getting impatient with all of the hesitancy from the knights. The captain was stubborn, the orange-haired girl was annoying and the other two knights were either timid or just staying quiet. Tio however does not know how to react with tense situations and just stood there with her charming smile and easygoing personality. But more importantly she was calming the girls down in the basement and she was doing a fine job with that like she was the mother hen. The girls seemed to like her as if she was their maternal parent or older sister and just needed comforting. Well, I'm waiting. Naruto said impatiently and not in the mood to mess about. The knights looked at each other contemplating on whether to tell him but were unsure. How do we know if we can trust you, said the captain. You don't, you decide. But I would choose carefully because the way I see it, these girls need help and you need mine to help them. Naruto explained in a matter of facts. The captain frowned as she knew he was right and he nailed the fact in hard into her head, with a reluctant nod she conceded and opened up. Fine, these girls here are the orcs prisoners for their own sick pleasures, there were male prisoners but they were all dead or eaten before we could reach them. We, the Knights of the Rose Order were dispatched to locate the hostages. Sounds noble of you, I respect that. Naruto nodded at that. Captain Ezra nodded back at the slight praise she received as it was expected of her due to her status. How many in the Knights Order are noble born exactly? Naruto asked her. Nearly all of us, why, 
she replied. Based from what I heard, knights typically from aristocratic families would not even bother to form up a search and rescue party for the common folk. So what makes these girls special? Are you calling us cowards, the orange-haired knight spluttered in outrage that Naruto had insulted all of them. Did I call you that? No what I really mean is that most nobles are uncaring about the lower-born citizens and rather care about them themselves. In a way I would call them selfish among with many other things I can relate them with. We're not like that. Ezra intervened before a shouting match could ensue. Then what do these people mean to you? Ezra all of a sudden looked uncomfortable in answering the specific question as her eyes briefly shifted elsewhere, to which Naruto easily caught her doing. Originally we came here to rescue some of the noble families that were also captured during a roadside ambush and a few of our fellow knights who were also taken prisoner. We managed to rescue them but the orcs killed all the males and ate them. So the civilians were just a mere coincidence? He shook his head in disappointment. Figures, they were originally here for the VIPs and nothing else should matter to them. Civilians? Tio Pond read with a cute head tilt and her index finger placed on her chin in confusion. Basically it's a more polite way of calling the common people instead of the term commoners or peasants. It's less demeaning but it's a term that refers to people who are not involved in military or political affairs, he explained before he motioned for Ezra to answer the previous question. It was our orders to rescue the noble daughters but I couldn't bear with the guilt of myself if I just left them and Tio was adamant that she will protect them. And heard the orange-haired girl mutter something but I could tell that it was something to do with not wanting to take responsibility. I'm sorry did you say something just now? Do you fancy sharing it with all of us? Naruto turned towards the girl. The orange-haired girl's tone then changed into a selfish tone but probably due to fear of the situation. We should have left the rest of them there, we can't move around with a group this large. Arnett. Ezra attempted to reprimand the now-named Arnett but Naruto beat her to it by moving to her position in an instant and choke slammed her into a wall. Arnett felt herself being caught unaware and felt herself winded from the force that she had felt from being slammed against the wall. She then looked up and straight into a pitch-black abyss that was Naruto's filtered lenses of his mask that made her feel fear from staring into them, as if she could feel death staring straight back at her from somewhere in the abyss. Ezra and the two other knights were shocked at how quickly he moved and they quickly drew out their swords while one of the younger knights who looked like she was sixteen was fumbling to draw out her sword. An obvious attempt to intimidate him into letting her go but Naruto ignored them in favor to reprimand and sort this troublesome night out. I find your lack of resolve very disgusting. To disregard human life in favor for someone of more importance or to save themselves is downright inhumane and utterly cowardly of you. He spoke in a cold tone that made her muscles freeze up and she could not avert her gaze into his eyes. He then pulled her off the wall and dragged her over to the cellar door and threw her straight at the top of the steps. Arnett collapsed onto the door feeling slightly winded while Ezra attempted to intervene. Cease this. Ezra commanded of him while pointing her saber at him but Naruto refused to back down. Do not interfere, he pointed at her sternly. Ezra did exactly that, reluctantly. She knows that Arnett was a troublesome girl at times especially during the academy and the formation of the Rose Knights that was formed by Princess Pina Colada herself. Arnett wasn't the best knight in the order like her captain, Princess Pina, Lady Bozas, Lady Panache, Sir Grey, and many others but she was skilled enough to wield a sword and stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with a larger opponent. Due to her skill and position had led her to become evidently arrogant that had sometimes gotten herself in a few bad situations. Arnett tried to get up but Naruto grabbed onto her neck and pulled her over to the trapdoors of the basement and pointed at the frightened girls. Look at them. Could you imagine what they must have gone through? The pain, the humiliation, the loss of their loved ones and the fear of dying. They do not deserve any of this. So tell me, why we should leave them behind, he told her in a cold hushed whisper in her ear. Arnett shivered as she looked at the many faces of the many frightened, traumatized and crying innocent girls that she considered in abandoning them. I don't know they are not our mission priority. 
she stammered when she looked at the many faces that looked straight back at her. But they are your citizens. You are supposed to set a good example for your people, not abandon them. She didn't reply as she knew he was right about that. You know what I think? I think you are glad that it wasn't you in their situation but at the same time afraid that it could happen to you, so you just want to run away and abandon them? To save your own precious and exquisite skin that I am sure the orcs would love to have a taste of. He said in a tone laced with iciness and apathy for what she was feeling right now. Arnett shivered at his tone and even more so when he mentioned the possibility of her being captured by those disgusting beasts and violating her smooth and elegant body that she was so fond of. But when she looked down at the victims that have suffered, she saw a lot of fear, anguish, some anger, hopelessness, and some under pressure of breaking. She even saw some of the mistresses and their daughters that she was tasked in saving, they didn't look so bad but some of thither women and young girls looked far worse. She saw that they were looking straight back at her, tears in their eyes, begging for help or scowling at her in cold icy hatred for her. You are supposed to be a knight right? Where is your honor and courage of one? I, I, it's because you haven't earned them Arnett, you are not even ready to become a knight with that mindset you currently have on. Now is the time to get your head on straight and prove yourself that you are worth a damn. Show them and prove to them that you are not a selfish coward. Arnett looked over her shoulder and looked into his eyes. You really believe I can do this? Having others believe in you in your job profession is what they expect out of you, although it is not a bad thing to have friends to believe in you but could make you succumb to pressure if they expect you to be the best at everything. Believing in oneself is to prove other people's expectations and opinions of you wrong. Naruto spoke to her softly this time. He lifted her by the arm, gripping it firmly, don't expect other people to do it for you, stand up on your own two feet. If those stare at you, stare right back at them and dare them to make a move that they will surely regret. Naruto then clenched onto her arm making her flinch, however if you do commit any one of the previously mentioned suggestions and abandon us and these girls. I will not kill you, but that does not mean that I will save you from them, he threatened her to which Arnett was sweating nervously as she believed that he was not fooling around. Bop, a hand suddenly chopped onto Naruto's head. Ow, he winced as he looked back or upwards to see Tio was looking at him disapprovingly. Was that her idea of a harmless smack on the head whenever a child behaves badly? That hit almost felt like it could cave in an average human's head. Does she not know that? Naruto thought while looking at her funny while rubbing his head. No, she pointed at Naruto. Her voice trying to sound like a scolding Ka-san or Wani-san, but her tone of voice betrays the seriousness in her voice as it sounds way too cute to be anywhere near serious. The fuck is she doing? He face faulted at her motherly slash big sisterly behavior. Bad. You are scaring those poor girls with your scary face, mask, thing. She scolded Naruto with a cute frown on her face and she even had a hand on her hip and bent over to look him in the eye while pointing at him. Do I look like I am six years old to you, he said to her disbelievingly. And you hurt my subordinate which was uncalled for, Ezra pointed out. Her actions were uncalled for and needed reprimanding. Naruto shrugged without a care. True but you could have left that to me. Ezra frowned in disapproval. If she was being a naughty girl then I could have given her punishment from what my mother would sometimes do to me whenever I steal treats from the kitchen. She does it to show her love for me and only to teach me the right way of behavior. And soon enough, Tio is now a good girl. She beamed with her innocent smile. And what punishment is that? I asked her to which she raised her left hand into the air. Why with a simple smack bottom? She responded so sweetly and raised her left hand and made a swiping motion to which it made everyone in the room sweat drop. You must be jesting. That could paralyze me from the waist down you imbecile, she yelled out paling while covering her backside in fear for her soft and firm backside. Nonsense, it never hurt me because she did it out of love. If I do the same then it will never hurt you. 
She said it ever so simply that it made Arnett scoot backwards towards a wall trembling in fear while Tio moved ever so closer to her with that loving and charming smile on her face and her hand still in the air. With that compassionate and caring smile of hers Naruto was actually willing to believe her. That and the girls were staring at Tio with sparkles in their eyes shimmering in awe some even had moved tears streaming down their eyes. Yua. Such compassion. I wish she were my big sister. Naruto heard them whispering quietly to themselves, she would definitely make an excellent older sister type or a mother were Naruto's thoughts. Probably because you are highly resistant to pain, wait what would her mother look like, he wondered. He was pretty sure he had met a few ogres out there and none of them were as good looking as Tio. Plus, they were brutal savages. As funny as seeing a giant give her a smack bottom. I think we need to get going shall we? Naruto suggested before the bottom smacking commenced. Ezra nodded at that, we were originally here to discuss on what our next planet before you interrupted us. Again sorry about that, and do we have a plan on where to go? Well. Tio mentioned that there are three exits in this mountain. One is the gate, one is the palace and the last is the Colosseum. Tio suggests that we take the Colosseum as they are not currently busy today. Naruto nodded at that plan. A sound plan with many possibilities of being a trap but it was better than staying here, okay, we have our destination. So how are we going to get there? That's the problem we have now, going out into the streets is suicide with the amount of people traveling with us. Then Tio enthusiastically butted into the discussion, who I know a place that Tio knows, she called out, waving her left arm in the air. How does she do it? We are being very serious here and she's not even affected by this situation at all. What did you have in mind? Naruto inquired to Tio. Tio nodded in determination and went over to the basement. Excuse me girls, she said politely, as the girls shifted to make way for her as she crouched down onto the basement floor. She felt stones on the wall and rubbed every stone for one distinct stone. Finally she found the correct stone and pushed into it. This released a door mechanism that opened a secret passageway. How convenient Naruto deadpanned at the level of cliché that just happened. Ta-da! This is Tio's secret shortcut I use all the time, she said cheerfully for helping us. Definitely infectious Naruto smiled at her cheerfulness. Impressive, where does it lead? Mmm. -hmm. I'm not really sure what it was used for but it's like a maze that connects to everywhere in the city, she explained while her index finger was poking her chin. And you're sure no one comes down here? Nope, just me. Alright then, lead the way. He nodded to Tio who grabbed her club and went into the passageway that was a little narrow for her but was able to squeeze herself in there without much difficulty. The others followed from behind while Naruto lead from behind Tio. The knights watched from the rear from behind them while surrounding the poor victims covering them on the left and right flanking points and the at the front and the back. Ezra taking the front, Arnett the left and the other two girls had the right and rear flanks. Pretty standard strategy although the one covering the rear flank looks to be a nervous wreck but very determined otherwise. The same goes to the other knight. From Naruto found out, they were twins. Sherry and Sherry. Both of them were fifteen years old. Fifteen. Naruto could feel a headache forming for dealing with the logic of this place, he was starting to hate this place already and he somehow knew that there is worse to come. So how did you come across this secret passageway? Naruto decided to start up a conversation with Tio. HM, I was a very adventurous young lady back then, more often I would get in trouble and my mother would tend to scold me for wandering into dangerous places, those orcs can be real mean and scary. What were your parents like? Naruto asked the billion dollar slash yen slash pound slash euro etc question. I never knew my father as he just left my mother on her own after he was done with her, whatever that means. Naruto and the knights flinched uncomfortably at that as their faces were nervously sweating. She does not need to hear that, ever, Naruto assured himself on that. Suddenly a thought popped up in his head. So is your father an ogre? Yep. 
She chirped although shifted a bit on that topic to which Naruto vaguely caught on. And your mother is. Human. Okay she is. What the shit? Naruto now felt really uncomfortable at this situation. I know I have recalled a memory of that Final Fantasy advertisement slogan that I liked when I was younger, Escape Reality. Live the fantasy, this was not what I had in mind. That's right my birth mother is a human although she had to raise me in a small cottage in the woods, mother said that the people there will not be friendly to us. But I didn't mind, I loved my mother as she does with me, she sighed in far off look on her face. And then she giggled. I always helped her around the house, especially the heavy lifting. Maybe it was not so bad in the end, Naruto nodded at that and left it at that. Ah, uh, here we are, she said as the group arrived at what looked like to be a dried up sewer with multiple pipes leading to dried up sewer. What is this place? One of the knights said. We are in a sewer. Naruto commented at the irony of the setting with a shrug. Sewer? What's that? Ezra inquired. Well basically it's a sanitary sewer that transports human waste. Speak basic. Arnett demanded. All right then. He huffed at her rudeness. It's basically a water network that transports all the human waste from people's houses and buildings through pipes leading underground and into this network that transports the waste to some place that will deal with it. It is a cleaner and sanitary method of disposing human waste rather than dumping it in the streets that I am certain that most places do in your local areas and cities. Wait you don't mean this place is. Arnett and all the girls had a tinge of green feeling quite disgusted and sick at the revelation. Is a place where you send all your shit to? Yes, that's revolting. Arnett wailed and tried to run back while covering her nose and mouth. Whoa whoa whoa. Hold your horses there missy I wasn't finished yet. Yes this place is a sewer, but it's a dried up one. So you should be fine with the smell. He said before grabbing her shoulder and had a dark aura emanating from him that was oozing off of him that made her a little nervous, in their minds that was what they though they saw. That information made them feel a little better as they could not smell anything foul. Wow sweetie you're really clever. I've been wondering about what this place was for since I was this high, Tio complimented him while measuring herself when she vogs a young girl, which by the way she held her hand to indicate how tall she was back then and she was at the height of a normal average height of a woman. So she apparently back then when he was a child but at the same size and height of an adult human female? Oh boy. Where did you come across such knowledge? Ezra questioned Naruto suspiciously. In these lands an intelligent human that is as clever and well-educated as an elf or a noble is quite uncommon. Most of the commoners can't even count to ten despite their age. You don't need to know. He simply responded to that question to which he got a frown in return from Ezra. The amount of information I have is far advanced for your mind to understand, a bit arrogant but true nonetheless. He mused inside his head. Also I should avoid blurting out sensitive information if I want to find myself as their prisoner. Wait if I hold so much knowledge from my world, does that mean I can become a messiah? No, too troublesome. Okay so where do we go from here? Naruto and the group had stopped at a cross section. Well, if we want to travel to the Colosseum we will have to take the right. Tio pointed out. Are you sure you know your way? Naruto asked her. Imichim. I even labeled helpful directions on the walls in case if anyone were to get stuck down here. She said pointing at the walls showing arrows scratched into the walls. How convenient, helpful in many ways. Naruto simply said bewildered at her generosity. She's even looking out for strangers? Is she some kind of saint? Follow me. I'll lead the way. She fisted the air to bring in spirit to the group. Slow down girl. I'm supposed to be the one who takes point, Naruto called out to her as she skips down the walkway while humming a cheery tune. After spending about ten minutes into the sewer and following the signs ever so helpfully laid out to us we reached a dead end. Air, Tio. Why does our path have a wall in front of us? 
Naruto said calmly. Isn't it obvious? We're lost. She led us the wrong way. Arnott was about to rant before being cut off by Naruto's stare. It was a rhetorical question Arnott now calm the fuck down before you attract unwanted attention onto us. Tio turned around still smiling in reassurance. For your information, we're not lost. We are definitely heading the right way, in fact we are already here. She smiled. Then what's with the wall? Naruto asked. To answer his question, Tio pressed on a stone slab that was sticking out of the wall. Wall in front of them gave a loud, clunk, and then the wall slid open. Tio, you are the greatest ogre I have ever met. Perhaps the only decent ogre I have met so far. Naruto felt astounded at the sheer convenience and resourcefulness that Tio has shown him. The knights were equally bewildered and shocked. Earlier they thought ogres to be the enemies of humankind, but Tio defied that logic with her kind and innocent personality of hers. Naruto then walked inside the room and inspected the area for any hostile creatures nearby. The room they were in looked to be an armory for the gladiators. The swords were placed on shelves, racks and barrels while the armor were displayed on mannequins and stored in crates. The weapons looked to be in semi-good condition, no doubt it's dwarven smithing, the weapons have to come from somewhere. The durability was still strong and sharp but it couldn't get rid of the grime, rust and dust that has smothered a large majority of all of the equipment in this room. Ezra? Naruto called out to the female captain. Yes? You said that you were here to rescue your fellow knights correct? I did. Are they capable of taking up a weapon and assisting us? Ezra turned to the group and looked at a small group of several knights, some looked incredibly spooked and paranoid, others were muttering out dark thoughts in their head about slaughtering the fucking pigs in their own colorful words. And some looked really determined for revenge. A tomboyish girl with brunette hair tied up in several braids that trailed down her back stepped up to Ezra and kneeled to the floor, just say the word and we will gut those filth and ensure that they will not be hurting anyone else again, she said sternly and with a raging fire in her eyes. As promising as you sound, I'd rather you didn't alert the whole tribe down on our heads. You are just asking for a death wish miss. Naruto commented with a raised eyebrow. She looks like a capable fighter but she just looked unstable. Freya. No offense to you but you are currently unarmed and if you were to arm yourselves with these weapons you would most likely get massacred if you were to challenge them all. Offense taken and I know this is reckless but this is something I, must do to regain our honor. She growled out. You can easily regain that by escorting these girls to their families and friends. We have no time for things such as honor or pride at the moment as survival comes first. Are these the words of a coward? She attempted to challenge his words against her own stubbornness. No, it's words from a logical point of view. Now shut up, swallow your pride and equip yourselves with whatever gear there is in here. Freya looked towards her commander to which she nodded in confirmation to get moving. There were not that many volunteers to take up arms. Many were but simple noble daughters of prestigious families both big and small, recruits of impressionable and once determined young girls now nervous wrecks and finally there were some simple housewives huddling children and acting as their shield. The ones that did volunteer were the ones with more experience in dealing with combat. The Rose Knights wanted revenge and the brave civilian women mostly villagers and farmers wanted to escape this place and fight their way out if necessary. Naruto looked around to find anything of use until something caught his eye. There was a metal-like bat-slash-club with multiple spikes on it or truncheons whatever they call it when he took a closer look. It held a strong resemblance to the Japanese samurai weapon the Kanabo except it was wider, longer, and it was made of steel with the truncheons carved into the body of the bat-like club which spanned most of the weapon par the handle. The weapon also had a ring as the pommel for the club and expertly crafted leather that formed the grip for the handle that was expertly made into something that would never slip out of the hands of the user. Naruto was impressed with the level of craftsmanship and wondered why such a lethal weapon was left here to rot in a dank dark armory in a coliseum used by savages. So, deciding to put the weapon to better use, 
while excluding the fact that he couldn't use it due to its size and the length of the weapon that was taller than him. So the logical answer to that thought would be find someone in the room who specializes with heavy weaponry. Hey Tio, got something here that might interest you. Naruto discreetly called Tio over while fishing the kanabo out of a barrel that was too small to contain it. Tio came over with curiosity and wonder covering her face. Thought this weapon might come in handy, it looks far better than your log club. Tio was definitely interested in the weapon but was put off from the amount of grime and dirt and dust that covered the majority of the weapon. Mao. But it's so dirty. Oh it's nothing to complain about, nothing like a good scrub down to get rid of simple grime. Naruto waved off her complaining. Luckily they found a disused water pump inside the room that was connected to an underground lake source that luckily still worked. Now Naruto was a bit paranoid in using an old water pump that was bound to squeak from the strain of the amount of neglect it had to suffer throughout the years. Add to the fact that nobody in this room even knew what a water pump was until Naruto had to demonstrate the simple-to-use device and what it does. They were clearly impressed and said that it could surpass the village and town wells, if anybody was willing to buy the concept and install them in those areas. Luckily not one soul was near the armory so everybody used the water pumps to freshen themselves up and revitalize themselves. Tio went to work in cleaning her weapon to make it look presentable which to Naruto he thought was quite pointless seeing that the weapon will be bathing in the blood and brain matter of its enemies soon enough. The weapon was now finally clean and was now a very deadly and awesome looking dark grey steel kanabo lookalike club that was just as long as an average sized man or a bit taller. Tio now beamed with glee at her new weapon like a child at Christmas. Then she turned to Naruto and gave him a big bear hug, that smothered his face inside her generously overkill bosoms of mass destruction slash fun. Now Naruto was not a super pervert unlike some people he regretted involving himself with, namely a few boys in his school and a dirty old godfather that always manages to piss him off and constantly grinding his gears about their shenanigans. They kept trying to convert him to the dark side of perverseness that Naruto would never dare to step into lest he wanted to be massacred by the female populace, they can be very vicious when they are pissed. If he did, he would die a sad and lonely death without a loved one beside him or instantly as he gets skewered by a female's righteous fury. Actually he was more likely to die on the front lines and in this world perhaps, and he never had a girlfriend before. Naruto would have been smothered to death if he hadn't worn his gas mask but her big and bountiful breasts was blocking the air filter preventing any air from going into the mask. Thank you. Thank you. This is the second time a person has bought me a present. She cheered while crushing Naruto's body like a cushion and flaying him around like a ragdoll. Why why you're we welcome. Naruto struggled to ease out. Ezra however found this amusing at the fact that Naruto was being manhandled by an energetic and happy ogre. Tio you can let him go now, I think Maelstrom here would like to breathe again. Tio looked down to see a Naruto trying to shift his head to try and allow himself to breath but it was difficult with the mask on. Tio's face lit up in a bright pink color on her cheeks and immediately let Naruto go. I'm sorry. I just get really excited easily. It's nothing, I've had worse. He managed to wheeze out whilst gasping in air through the air filter of his mask. But that experience did come close to the likes of my mother and my sister's hugs. He mused to himself, Tio may be a giant girl who is incapable of feeling anger but dealing with their temper once they are angry is like treading through a minefield whilst under fire. Once they are excited is like taking an overdose of Red Bull and just watch them cause havoc on many people in their joyous excitement of chaos. When Naruto got himself feeling comfortable again while getting rid of all the strains in his bones, he gave his neck a good pleasant clicking. And the group was now properly equipped with the appropriate gear and were on their way again. The gear mostly consisted of swords and shields bows and crossbows that were still in good condition despite the wear along with the odd axes and spears. The armor was nothing special but it does its job. The armor they wore was a mix between chainmail and leather along with a few ices of plated metal for gauntlets and shoulder guards. 
The corridors were fairly wide for a coliseum, seeing that they were filled with statues of the entire champions of the arenas that dated years back. There were many dwarven champions donning the full armor with horns on their helmets and chainmail and plated armor along with their battle axes and warhammers. There were even a majority of other races that were crowned champions. Humans, elves, beastmen, and there were even rabbit girls. Not to mention that some of these statues had female champions once upon a time. Pst, sweetie. Tio whispered to Naruto. Yes Tio? Wanna know something amazing? Surprise me. She pointed to a statue of a female that dated back a bit over a hundred years ago. That's my grandmother. She pointed out smiling proudly. And surprised he was. The woman in question looked to be fairly tall if the height of the statue was exaggerating the height. And she looked rather well muscled and toned like Cathal and Geislane level and she was about as tall as Tio but just under Cathal. She had long wavy hair that trailed down to her mid-back and she wore what looked to be a tiara band that went around her forehead. She didn't have much to worry about protection as she mostly wore a metal scaled bra with leather straps holding them in place. And she wore a fur skirt around her waist that was knee height and was fully open on her left leg to show off her plated metal boots. And her weapon wasn't something to scoff at. She wielded a mighty executioner axe with a spike on one side and a deadly blade on the other. The weapon looked to be taller than her and Tio. Overall, her looks scream Amazon warrior. Oh the lads back in Japan will be so jealous about this, or it would they be envious about the fact that I am the first human from Earth that has discovered the existence of several species, races, and cultures that are in many otaku sexual fantasies. Yes. Yes they fucking would. That is amazing. Naruto nodded in respect. Ezra walked up to the inscription on the statue and read out loud. She was the arena's third long-running reigning champion before she stepped down. Amicham. She would have done so sooner but she was getting a bit old for it then. By the time she stepped down was when she was expecting mother. So by then she settled down and taught mother what she knew in her ways. So did your mother turn out like her? Not quite but she could take care of herself. She said while looking a bit uncomfortable for some reason. Up until she met the father of Tio perhaps. Naruto concluded before signaling the rest to carry on as they have spent a bit too long on viewing the statues. Naruto and the large group of knights and captives then reached a Kari door that was blocked off by rubble. Was this done by natural causes or was this part of the attack 100 years ago? Naruto asked the group. The orcs and ogres can get pretty restless and may start fights. The fights mostly end up with a lot of collateral damage and then leave the mess to someone else, namely me, she muttered the last part out but Naruto heard it clearly. We're going to have to go find a way round this then. We can go through this door. Tio pointed out to a door that was nearby. This door will lead us closer to the escape exit located in the upper class stands where the nobility and the royalty use this to escape to the outside in case of danger. Wait here then. Naruto walked up to the door and signaled everyone to go behind him and stay quiet. He opened the door as silently as he can, not to raise any trouble onto them. Once he opened the doors and peeked in, he immediately straight after he took a peek in and shut the door and shook his head. Nope, this way's a bust. What's wrong? Ezra asked. It's a sleeping quarters. Oh for the love of. Ezra sighed while pinching the bridge of her nose. Are they all asleep? Arnett asked. From what I could see in there, I think all of them may be sleeping. Then let's kill them before they can wake up. Freya growled out while gripping her gladius sword tightly along with a few others. Too risky, there are some proper big ones in there too. Probably trolls, ogres and even a cyclops. Now that did put them at a bit of unease once they heard that. I'm sorry I didn't think that they would be using the quarters at this time. Tio looked down sadly. Don't worry about, we'll find another way. Something's coming. One of the twins of the knights with fully donned rose armor called out to the front of the group. Shit, patrol. 
Naruto cursed as he could see the illumination of a torch in the distance that was flickering in the background as the outline of shadows were indicating that they were nearby and he could tell that they were around a corner and would spot them instantly if they were to turn the corner. Change of plan, everyone inside. Everybody looked at Naruto as if he was insane and were about to protest but was interrupted with a stern glare through the visors. Now, he ordered them and they all reluctantly entered the humid and noxious room that smelt incredibly bad. It had the stench of unwashed possibly rotten savage males that did not care for their own hygiene. That was the smell they all walked into except Naruto who still had the canister attached to his mask that blocked out the repulsive stench but he wasn't going to tell them that. The varieties of races in this room were of a selection of brutal and savage races that Naruto could recognize among the crowd. There were the orcs, the goblins, something that looked similar to a goblin but was red and had horns and sharp teeth so it could be an oni or an imp if he were to gather up his knowledge in his secret inner otaku encyclopedia. There were also ogres that looked like an urukai but with horns, some of them long and some of them short but stubby. And lastly there was indeed a cyclopes that was taller than the ogres but just underneath the trolls, and ironically they were all asleep. But from the state that they look while sleeping, they looked absolutely shit-faced if the barrels and kegs of what looks to be and smells like mead, ale, wine and other alcohol beverages that smell incredibly strong were of any indication for them to be shit-faced. And now the problem was to reach the other side of the room without waking them up. Make that two problems as Naruto has to convince the girls to make their way to the other side of the huge sleeping quarters full of hostile beasts. It wasn't going well at first as Naruto, Tio and Ezra were having a hard time at trying to calm down the girls who were the most frightened or squeamish like Arnett and the recruits and the innocent girls and women. But the most difficult of them all was Freya as she could barely contain her killing intent and her bloodlust was slowly leaking out when she is inside a room full of multiple races that had made her suffer through torment and humiliation. Tio thankfully managed to calm down the girls who were near hyperventilating while Naruto and Ezra were manhandling Freya to prevent her from charging in and causing a massacre onto those monsters or backfire onto themselves. Let. Me. Go, she growled out like a wild wolf on the hunt. Freya, cease your actions at once. You will be risking everyone's lives up to this point. Ezra hushed sternly at Freya. Naruto grunted at the level of strength and power this young lady who was about the same age as him had in her. While the amount of strength was impressive in her frame but her blatant insubordination was just pissing him off. I thought your knights were well disciplined. Naruto deadpanned at Ezra who in return glared straight back at Naruto. We are relatively new at this, so we can't all be perfect in this job. Besides Freya is part Nord if her hot-blooded stubbornness is anything to go by. That makes sense. But isn't she out of place, as a knight I mean? Understandably so, but we made an exception for Freya. It's a rather complicated story with her. Ezra grunted out while Freya was inching closer to a sleeping goblin on one of the straw beds. The goblin in question was now stirred awake as he felt the need to go and relive himself. But once his eye fluttered open he came face to face with what in his mind looked like a demon out for bloody vengeance. He would have screamed out in terror to alert his sleeping friends but Naruto noticed that he was waking up and had decided to act quickly. He rushed over to the goblin and smacked his hand over his mouth to muffle his screaming. But that left Ezra to lose her grip over Freya who took that chance to pull out a dagger and dashed over to that goblin and plunged the blade straight into the goblin's heart. She didn't scream, but she was breathing heavily through her gritting teeth. Her rage and fury barely contained as she repeatedly stabbed into the little green goblin's chest while blood was spewing out of the wounds like a stream splashing everywhere on the bed and staining into the ragged sheets and straw. She kept stabbing the blade straight into the creature's chest cavity and was nearly about to lose herself until Naruto rushed up from behind her and grabbed onto her dagger hand and disarmed her while Tio came up to her, grabbed her and held her tightly in her arms, stroking her head soothingly. Hush now. You don't have to continue anymore, he's already gone. Tio whispered to her in a solemn and caring tone. 
Freya at that point was slowly calming down but she was still shaking from the moment of taking a life and the memories that came along with it. That moment when the goblin was staring into her eyes in sheer terror was what spooked her the most. I, couldn't help it, they deserve, their fate. She choked on her own sobs as she tried in vain to hold them back in. No one here blames you Freya but we need to get out of here fast. Naruto called out to the group that they need to get out fast. Although we were lucky that they did not wake up from that. Naruto, Ezra and Tio guided the group of twenty girls, seven of them are knights, three of them were noblewomen and a daughter of sixteen and the rest were civilians. They crept over a few limbs that were laid about on the floor and they walked around a few heavily drunken bodies while covering their noses in disgust. Naruto could imagine their discomfort in their position, they looked incredibly dirty and sweaty and oily which produced a massive stench that was sickening to many. Not to mention that a few of the obese pig men orcs were just farting in their straw beds. Oh that's just nasty. Good thing I'm wearing this mask though. Naruto mused while holding in a chuckle at seeing the discomfort and green tinges on the knight's faces. Tio however looked sort of used to it but she was pinching her nose and puffing out her cheeks to block most of the smell out. At last they managed to reach the end of the massive room and stood in front of a pair of big heavy wooden doors that was big enough to let the trolls in, and there was also a smaller human-sized doors built into the massive set of doors. The girls were eyeing those doors lie it was the gates of freedom, highly exaggerated yes but fresh air was a desperate resource for them at this moment. And not one of them has woken up from the twenty-plus group of females and male sneaking through the room. Luckily Freya was calm enough not to go on a bloody rampage, and none of the females annoyingly screamed out as if they got the silent message that translated from one of Naruto's stairs, you scream? You will die and you will doom us all and there will be no one else to help you anymore. That they understood, thankfully. Still, it could have been worse. S-E-R-E-C-H, Naruto you bastard, where are you? Squee. A lot worse. Ga. Naruto recoiled clutching his ears on the outside of his mask, fuck. Shit. Damn it, he grunted out loud trying to rip the mask off and take off the hood and collar on his neck and ears to reach the radio on his neck to stop the screeching feedback that was blasting into his ears. Finally he ripped the earphones out of his ears and massaged them not even realizing that he was showing his face to the whole room. I could have sworn I turned the radio off. How the fuck did they know how to switch it back on? Or even on how it works to be exact? Naruto muttered to himself wincing at the white noise that he was now hearing and the high-pitched sound that people would hear when subjected to high decibels of sound. Are you sure this thing is working Akane? I think he can hear us through this device, I'm not entirely sure on how it works which is why I am using this spell that the quest giver gave us. And that we were supposed to use it on the gate structure, not unknown devices. She is going to find out about this. Naruto easily recognized those voices, it was Cathal, Akane and Geislane in order. Secondly they did not know how it fully works as they have fiddled around with the features of the radio and in result they have turned the mix volume up way too high. Thirdly Naruto could feel the many stares of the group glaring at him in shock, horror, some anger, and strangely small amounts of lust and the feeling of enrapture at his Adonis-like face and hair. Ezra was the worst of all as she glared icily at Naruto like a blizzard chucking icy daggers at him. Naruto is it. Ezra coolly said while gritting her teeth to ease off the frustration. Shit. He cursed to himself. Yay dot. He awkwardly drawled out. I hope you have a plan for this. Ezra pointed at the inhabitants of the room. Naruto could see the level of shit storm he had stepped into. All of the monsters in the room were all awake and staring right at them in bewilderment. Tebow. They killed Tebow, cried out a goblin. Escapees. Get them, roared out an orc which made all of them all grab their crude weapons at their bedside. Run. Naruto shouted out to them out to them to which they all left the room running while Naruto stayed behind to confront them. What about you? Ezra called out to him in slight concern. I have an idea that could work. 
Naruto could not take on all of them and kill them fast enough with bullets alone. He needs to get them out safely and rejoin them as quick as possible. So he decided on a risky plan that could wipe out every life in this room. He picked out a frag grenade that was hooked to his vest and pulled the pin out and let the primer spring off the grenade and threw it straight at a stack of barrels full of suspicious-looking alcohol from its look and smell. Naruto grabbed Ezra and threw her out of the room, fortunately the rest of the girls were already waiting outside. The monsters however were looking at the weird-looking metal ball that had rolled in between their barrels of the strongest alcohol they currently have in possession. Hey look, he missed us. Baha. Stupid Humi. Can't aim for shit. But he was wrong. The three seconds it took to detonate the grenade ignited the payload it contained and the explosives inside and the shrapnel within it had scattered everywhere at a high speed from the force of the blast. The shrapnel was so devastating that it had easily penetrated through the shoddy armor of many monsters. The shards of metal punched its way into their chests and tore chunks of flesh and even limbs from the smaller monsters. But there was worse to come for them. The blast had also ignited the highly flammable liquid that was stored in the barrels of whatever alcohol they were drinking. Boom! What Naruto did not expect was how violent the explosion would be. The force of the blast had physically torn the doors of the room straight off its hinges and reduced it to splinters the pillars and the statues were reduced to rubble. Some of the walls were knocked down and the fire that came next consumed everything within the room. The fire acted like a mushroom and it came out of the double doors bring along a few orcs that were launched straight at the doors while the rest were either blown apart or sent across the room. After the blast all that was left were the smoke and the smell of burning from the flesh to the smoldering stone and wood. Naruto picked himself back up when he dived to the floor, and he also noticed that he had brought someone along with him. Ezra was underneath him trying to keep a calm and cool face but she wasn't handling the pressure too well as her lips were kind of trembling and her face was slowly lighting up into a reddish hue at the closeness that they both were. You okay, Naruto said with sincere concern for her well-being. Why yes I I am fine. She stuttered to which she scolded herself for that. Good, up you go. Naruto picked Ezra up off the floor effortlessly. And now we run for it, he said running down the corridor along with the rest of the group. Eh, was Ezra's smart response until she heard the alarm bells ringing. Ezra, come on. Our head start won't last for long. Naruto called out to her to which she nodded her head and caught up with the group. Intermission After the two demi-humans and one dark elf had managed to clear the long climb up the steep incline, they were lucky enough not to get caught in an ambush when they reached the top. They stood on a large mound of rock hiding within a shed on the top that was overlooking the city. They were fortunate that no orcs came their way and that the spiders were mostly wiped out in that blaze and Naruto's distraction. What they were trying to do was to get in contact with Naruto that Geislane had mentioned the device that he used to contact them. Their curiosity got the better of them and they took over 12 minutes in fiddling with the buttons and dials of the radio and mic slash earphones. After many minutes of tedious fiddling and nothing happening, Akane grew frustrated and decided to forsake the promise of using a specific spell that was supposed to be used for another magical device. Akane you know she won't like the fact that you are using that spell for anything but the gate. Geislane sighed at her teammate. Well it's not a one-time use spell or anything. I just want to know how this damn thing works, she growled in frustration before she casted the spell on the headset and radio. Scan. I do not know their language. A blue sphere covered the radio and many words and numbers that were either similar or unheard of that were floating around the sphere and then disappearing into nothingness. Akane frowned in confusion, okay turns out it is more complicated than it looks, but I think I do have the basics down. Geislane then put her hand on the sphere and closed her eyes to meditate. She watched images of the device and people that unfamiliar to her and sort of similar to how Naruto looked like in his uniform and armor. Could these people be the Isaias, she wondered. Then she saw more images of people operating dials and mentioning something called frequencies, and then a few letters and numbers appeared to her in front of her eyes in clear, bold and glowing numbers. 
Geislane opened her eyes and held her hand out. Let me try. She suggested. Akane didn't object and gave it to her. Geislane looked at the radio in wonder of what it was and then copied the actions of the people in the visions and started to input a number onto the screen until it matched the one in her vision. She then turned the radio on with a click of a button. While it is still in the sphere she can manipulate the device to do any task the user tells it to. It's working. She informed her teammates when she heard something happening in the headphones. Akane got a bit too ahead of herself when she grabbed the mic from out of her hands and ranted down the mic, Naruto you bastard, where are you? The only response was multiple swear words and a lot of noise like the mic was rubbing against something. Are you sure this thing is working Akane? Cathal questioned with a raised eyebrow in confusion. I think he can hear us through this device, I'm not entirely sure on how it works which is why I am using this spell that the quest giver gave us. Akane was now staring at the device expecting a response. And that we were supposed to use it on the gate structure, not unknown devices. She is going to find out about this, Geislane sighed when Akane just shrugged her warning off. And then they heard nothing as if it was cut off. That idiot, what did he do, she shouted at the device, slapping the sides of it. It's not working now. Must have disabled the device. Probably didn't appreciate you screaming in his ear, Cathal smiled as her response was laid back at best with the sarcasm with a sense of humor behind it. Akane glared at Cathal's jab and was about to retort when, boom. They all jumped up in surprise and fright when they heard a similar booming sound from earlier and they all peered out of the shed's window. What they saw was a plume of fire and smoke coming straight from the Colosseum arena along with flaming debris raining down onto the streets. That's the arena. That must have been him. Akane pointed out. That man has got guts, I will give him that. Kathleen whistled. Geislane then sniffed at a sudden scent that she could pick up from her nose. Dragon's breath, that's what caused the explosion. Geislane confirmed. Isn't that the highly illegal mead drink that you can purchase on the black market? Cathal asked her team. Yeah, that drink is seriously dangerous to an average human's liver and also it is said to be very explosive when near fire, well now we know why. Akane indicated to the fireball in the distance. Only people or monsters who have indestructible livers can survive that drink. Let's go. We're going after him. Akane looked at Geislane like she was mad. Yes, we owe him. You're right about that, so count me in. Cathal smiled. Oh never mind, let's go save his sorry ass. Akane side shrugged. They all nodded and then soon took off towards the arena. Geislane and Akane took towards the rooftops while Cathal followed behind in the alleyways while they guided her through the empty streets. The streets were empty because the blast had every monster in the city spooked and most of the orcs and monsters in the area headed towards the arena in search for the one responsible for the blast. The trio soon heard multiple loud popping sounds that thundered all around the arena and echoing throughout the inside of the mountain. What is he doing? That weapon of his is so much louder than his other weapons, Akane looked to Geislane. It sounds to me that he is starting a war with them. Cathal added in her thoughts. We shall see what his reason is for attracting the whole attention onto him is about shortly, let's get to him first. Intermission, Devil May Cry OST Public Enemy Naruto and the party of knights, ogre female and victims were now in a lot of trouble. That stunt of his he knew would no doubt attract a lot of them to their position and the girls would be in even more danger than inside that room when they all woke up due to a sudden call from his radio transceiver. They all ran as fast as they could through the corridors but the girls were physically weak, they had not eaten much in the past few days while others were worse off than them. Stealth was no longer an option as it would not work out with the amount of monsters that were now on full alert of their presence. Even if he hadn't set off the explosion they still would have known they were there because they would be screaming out intruder alert when somebody was to run out of the room. And if he were to kill everything in the entire room, he was not sure if his weapons would do much against the likes of a troll in killing it quick. 
So Naruto decided to once again take responsibility and be the main distraction again this time for the girls to get out as fast as they can. He took point armed with his L85A2 bullpup assault rifle and took down every threat that tries to attempt to harm them. Starting with the patrol that had come around the corner, Naruto whipped up his assault and aimed down the sights of his scope and pulled the trigger. The orc was just a standard sentry guard that was going to investigate the blast and the only thing he found was a blackout once the bullet penetrated through his skull and out of the back of his. His partner looked at the spectacle with petrifying horror and fear and then not a second later that he felt another bullet smash through his head. The girls recoiled from the sudden powerful noise and covered their ears from the loud thundering noise coming from the unusual weapon. G.O., he shouted to the girls breaking them out of their stupor, signaling them to run. They ran down multiple long corridors, trying to reach a specific room that Tio mentioned was where the secret exit would be. But getting there was proving quite difficult as the monsters were blocking their paths and had to divert through alternate routes to reach the room. The numbers of the orcs and goblins kept on multiplying. Sometimes there were an odd number of ogres that were tougher to kill if aimed for a body shot. They tried all they could to get close to them but Naruto's weapons were pushing them off their backs by a peculiar weapon spitting out high-velocity metal pieces that can pierce though their armor like paper. They tried intimidating them by blindly charging straight into the precise hail of bullets but they simply collapsed like a sack of meat. So they tried to send the ones with shields up front but proved to be little of success in their part. As their shields were either rotten wood or scrap metal that were heavily rusted that some of the fodder had equipped, while some other shields looked recently scavenged. But no matter the durability of the shields, they were simply no match for the piercing ability of a modern earth weapon. So in a last-ditch attempt, an ogre volunteered to act as a shield as he wore the most amount of armor. He was quite a smart one too as he figured out that I was mostly aiming for head shots so he covered his face with his arms crossed over it. He advanced with a small party of orcs behind him. Not bad. Thought Naruto as he loaded a high-explosive 40mm grenade into the underslung grenade launcher, but that's not going to help if you can't see what's coming next, this for example. Tum. Bang. The grenade slammed onto the chest piece of the mighty ogre and the armor did not help his one bit. The ogre could possibly take a few hits and shrug off the pain later, but the grenade had blasted through his chest cavity and out the other end. The blast had even hit the group of orcs behind him with a shower of blood, gore and hot shrapnel that had pierced through some of their heads and even shot through one of their eyes. Naruto took out the rest of the orcs that were lined up behind the ogre and a single bullet penetrated through two heads and a neck severing a vital jugular vein. Whenever Naruto inserted a fresh magazine into the slot in the back of the rifle, he had to count each time he fired a bullet and if he could help it and not go too crazy with the rifle and set it onto full auto. After that batch of enemies he had counted that he shot 22 bullets in the magazine. He decided not to be too picky and save each one for an enemy and make sure to be as accurate as possible and not waste any shots that they could take. He had noticed that they could take a few hits and still keep on going. Naruto reckoned that it must have been the adrenaline they must be pumping out. Geislane was right about one thing. They thrive off of battle. Naruto clenched his teeth together as he executed a grounded orc that tried to leap at them while it was on the ground losing a lot of blood. He kicked the orc in the head and slammed the bottom of his boot and pressed the barrel against his head and pulled the trigger. Alright that was all of them. Tio. Where to now, he called to Tio, asking for directions. Straight ahead. Tio was about to head off in front of Naruto until Naruto had to haul her back. No, not that way. Naruto yelled and pulled her and the group into another doorway that lead down a spiral staircase. The reason why was because he noticed that more were coming from the way that Tio pointed out judging by the flickering lights and shadows and the sound of armor and weapons clanking down at the other end of the corridor. Why are we going this way? Ezra asked Naruto. Couldn't risk it, there were more coming. Why not use your weapon on them? It's worked so far. Arnett asked him. Naruto shook his head in the negative, my weapons have a limited use. It does not last forever you know. 
It's like a crossbow and a bow with the arrows but you have are limited to a certain amount. I can't take them all on. We're going to die. Some of the girls whimpered. If you give up now then yes you will most likely die a lot quicker than running for your lives now. Naruto responded apathetically. Naruto please, they're frightened. Tio said sincerely. I know and I'm stressed, you have no idea of the shit I have had to go through in just one day. Neither do you know anything about what we had to do in one day. Ezra countered in disapproval. Oh please, I can hazard a guess on what it would be like but your predicament is nowhere near as bad as mine. Some of the knights gritted their teeth at the blatant disrespect but others were wondering what he meant by that. Look I am sorry for being an arsehole but I am really pissed off at the moment. But I swear I will get all of you out of here, even if I have to kill every ugly bastard to make my way out of here then I will do just that. Ezra and the knights were all now surprised by his commitment and could now understand why he was being harsh on the girls, he was pushing himself so much to rescue them and he does not appreciate it when others give up when he offers help to them. Finally they reached a door and Naruto barged straight through it to see an empty room of orcs, goblins, ogres, etc. But a massive room full of cages of an assortment of different animals and mythical creatures that Naruto could recognize a large majority of. Bloody hell it's like a zoo in here, they have everything I can possibly think of in here. Wolves, dire wolves may be due to the size of them. A manticore, I think. A griffin and even a bull-headed male minotaur that does not look friendly at all. Hey! Stranger! A hoarse voice called out to Naruto grabbing his attention. Naruto turned to the source of the voice and pointed his weapon in case it turned out to be a threat. What he saw was a humanoid man wearing rags and had a lot of battle scars. He had pitch black spiky hair that trailed down to his lower neck with hints of white on his bangs. What was the most strangest about him was that he had rabbit ears that looked a bit butchered as in it was missing a few pieces of his and had seen better days due to battering it went through. This strange person was sitting down inside her a cage like an animal and was covered in dried blood that Naruto wasn't sure if it was his or something else's. Peace stranger. I am no threat to anyone. The rabbit man coughed out. Well I can see that, what's happened to you? Naruto asked him while crouching down next to him. Meanwhile the girls were staring bug-eyed at an impossible sight. Impossible. A male warrior bunny. Ezra whispered under her breath. That doesn't make sense, they can only give birth to females. Arnett hushed to Ezra. Well apparently he is the exception. Well as you can see, I am their entertainment, their gladiator. The rabbit man muttered to him. He turned his head and looked towards Naruto with a piercing gaze into his eyes. Are you, escaping? We are, go straight ahead and turn right on the first corner. He pointed out. Thank you. Give me a sec, Naruto nodded his head before lifting up his rifle to the chain padlock and shot it off. Can you stand? Naruto asked of him. I'm already dead. What do you mean by that, Anaruto raised an eyebrow. I am the only male of my kind, those wretched bastards took that one chance for my race to prosper, they took away my offspring. He gritted his teeth. Naruto connected the dots in an instant when he spotted a large patch of dried blood stained into his ragged trousers held up by a thin but strong rope. Well I am truly sorry for your loss, I really am. Naruto said offhandedly, which it was what it sounded like to the rabbit man. He sounded like he didn't care. The rabbit man glared back at Naruto in fury. He suddenly forgot his fatigue and charged at Naruto by pouncing on him like a hunter after its prey. He clenched his fist and threw a punch that was like a blur. Naruto could see the punch coming but the surprising speed coming from him slightly threw Naruto off until he tilted his head out of the way only to receive a nick from the rabbit man's middle knuckle. The rabbit recovered from his slip-up and prepared his left his and spun around to connect it to Naruto's face, only for Naruto to counter by slamming the butt of his rifle into the back of the rabbit man's head. Coo, they recoiled in a wince of pain. Gotta admit, that actually hurt. 
Naruto said wincing and rubbing the bruise from his cheek. There will be worse pain coming for you yet. The rabbit man hissed at him BEF0 or he charged for another punch aimed at Naruto's face again. He's fast I'll give him that. Naruto brought out his left arm to intercept the incoming attacking arm and fist. But his rage is making him predictable. He then locked his left arm over his opponent's right arm and shoulder and punched his face to stun him with his right fist and then pulled him down and struck him in the chest with his right knee. A good classic move of Krav Mega that was formed by the Israeli defense force that Naruto picked up in his career. The move had left the rabbit man winded and stunned which to Naruto was a good thing. But the rabbit man had too much energy to burn through and went for another attack again at his face again. This time the attack has lost some of its momentum and was not as fast as it once was, so Naruto took that advantage and caught his oncoming fist with his left hand and pulled him towards him while raising his left leg and kicked him straight in the right side of his abdomen. The rabbit man was now clutching his side while his breathing was temporarily stalled. Naruto then, while still holding on to his opponent's right arm, he then landed his left leg on the ground acting as a pivot and then spun around and using his right leg to knock his opponent off balance by kicking the back of his opponent's leg. The rabbit man landed on his back roughly with a heavy impact, next he found that Naruto had pressed his knee onto his chest. His arm twisted around by Naruto holding his arm in a lock and had struck him in the face which then stunned him into a daze and blood streaming out of his mouth. Are you going to let me finish before you so violently attack me again? Naruto said coldly to him. First I have not introduced myself, due to a certain, friend completely fucking up my cover, my name is Naruto Uzumaki, what is your name? Jaeger, the now named Jaeger answered with a mutter. The rabbit man didn't say anything else but kept on glaring at him but Naruto ignored him and carried on. Are you going stay here feeling sorry for yourself and brood or are you going to take something of theirs in return? I have nothing to fight for now, but, just one chance, you let me kill either Osric or Kragas. Who's Kragas? Naruto asked of him but briefly in the corner of his eye he noticed Tio shifting a bit uncomfortably. Kragas is the leader of the ogres that came into power 17 years ago, he is the one who I want to kill the most with Osric the self-proclaimed orc emperor behind him and Gabura the goblin king and Trog the leader of the troll tribe. There are a few more races that are allied with Osric but there is hardly anyone as influential as those four in Khazad Lodhan. I can't guarantee that we will meet these four, but if you want to have a crack at them then by all means go for it. Why are you here? Naruto pointed at the large group of girls. I see. Jaeger said stoically before he looked back at Naruto. Why? Excuse me? Naruto raised an eyebrow at him. Why are you bothering to save them, they have no chance of survival in this place. So you're better off leaving them here and saving yourself. Naruto's response was to simply twist his arm with few cracks popping from his arm and Jaeger grunted in pain. Do I need a reason for it? Is it so wrong to protect the innocent? Is it unnecessary for me to save the unfortunate? I didn't do this because I wanted to, but because I must. Because if I turn my back on them then I will be betraying my own beliefs and promises that I have worked so hard to maintain. Jaeger's eyes widened at his words, now I see, perhaps he is not the same from the rest of the humans. All right. I'll help you, but you must help me in return. I suppose I can accept that, but I can't promise that we will meet them. Trust me, with the noise you made earlier assuming that were you. Then they will definitely want to meet you personally. Well shit. Naruto sighed before pulling Jaeger up onto his feet. Only for Jaeger to punch him in the stomach. The Kevlar armor cushioned the blow but the feeling of air forcefully pushed out of his lungs and leaving him winded slightly was still there. Consider us even. Jaeger rolled his shoulders. Noted. Naruto wheezed out. Jaeger ignored Naruto's pain and took to observing his party of victims to the orcs as he could easily recognize a few of them. Tio the strange ogre female that had a heart of gold. And what put him on edge were the knights looking at him like warily. Those knights, are they from the Empire? I think so, why? 
Jaeger's response was to rip off the chain padlock still wrapped around the iron bars of the cage and his rage was reignited yet again. Oh for fuck's sake what now? Naruto mentally shouted in frustration. You work for these scum. To get the innocent victims out yes I have teamed up with them but I don't work for him IIF that is what you are asking. The Empire does not care about innocence. When have they ever? These people do however. Jaeger still seemed unconvinced and decided to get answers from one of them. You. You must be the captain correct? Show some respect you fill. Arnott was about to burst out with another authority slash superiority rant until. Arnott. Shut up this instance, B.U. Dash, Arnott tried to interject but got cut off from a stern glare from Ezra straight into her eyes. You outbursts are not helping the situation we are in, you are only making them worse if you continue to shove statuses into people's faces. Arnott remained silent. We will talk later about your attitude problem, seeing that discipline is the areas you are mostly lacking at the moment. Ezra then turned back to Jaeger and signaled him to ask the question. Who do your loyalties abide by? Princess Pina Colada, founder of the Order of the Rose Knights. She spoke in pride. Pina? The fifth and youngest child born from a concubine? Ezra winced at that piece of information, Pina and the knights were always scoffed at and looked down upon. Sigh, the very same. I suppose I can accept you, she is the youngest after all and has never done anything to wrong anyone before. Does your princess know about the current skirmish happening with the warrior bunny tribe? Skirmish? We were not informed of that. Ezra looked a bit surprised, surely she would have noticed a detachment of troops leaving the capital. You mean you don't know that Zorzal is personally leading it? Ezra's eyes widened at that. No, we have not, Prince Zorzal tends to do anything he wants, and even if we did hear of it, Pina can't do anything against her brother. How disappointing. Jaeger shook his head. To which Ezra gritted her teeth. Hate to interrupt your friendly conversation, but they are coming. Naruto called out to them as he could hear the heavy boots and roaring down the staircase. Keep going, I have a plan to hold them off. Jaeger said while graping a rock and proceeded to smash off a few rusted locks from of the cages. Hey, are you mad? They could come after us. Naruto called out to Jaeger. Don't worry they won't, they hate them just as much as I do. He broke a few more locks from some of the other cages. The orcs arrived at the bottom of the staircase and spotted them. There they are. Get them bastards, roared out the leader of the group. When the orcs flooded the room, the beasts burst out of their cages and revolted against their former masters. Dire wolves tore through their flesh with their powerful teeth and body slammed into a few of the weaker ones. The larger beasts tore through their flesh with their deadly claws and the brutality of the minotaur smashing its way through the orcs with an improvised weapon by using the smaller cages as a club and projectile. The rest of the party left before the massacre began and were now running down a dark tunnel. They ran for a short while until they reached the end of it. But to Naruto's realization, they were now in the arena, on the arena floor. Shit we are too much in the open here. We have to turn back now. Naruto told them. The royal stand is just up ahead, all we have to do is cross the arena. Tio protested. We, are going, to get caught. It's that obvious. Naruto explained it like it was a cliché anime plot. Unfortunately we already have been caught. His ears picked up movement behind the stands. Suddenly all of the exits were cut off by iron gates that dropped and slammed down and blocked off all of the exits. Then they saw the arena and he stands light up and a crowd of monsters roared in anticipation. They all chanted together and pounded their chests and the ground with their weapons to add to the noise. Naruto, the knights, Tio and Jaeger circled around the girls to shield them. The victims were either petrified with fear or trembling on the floor cowering and shedding tears from the horror they experienced from them. 
The monsters then all settled down when a figure walked to the edge of a tall stand-slash-balcony that looked majestic and artistic than the common stands. The figure was a four feet nine inches tall orc and he was a frail, old and decrepit orc that was shuffling his way while clutching onto a spear that he used as a walking stick to the edge of the balcony to address the crowd. Osric the Besieger. Jaeger muttered out in seething rage. That ugly old green bastard is the legendary Osric from one hundred years ago. Fucking hell he looks like he can barely stand, look at him he belongs in a retirement home for fuck's sake. My great-gran looks better looking than him and she was over ninety. Who looked so much younger? Naruto snorted out. The whole stadium turned quiet as they looked at Naruto in shock slash horror. Impudent little shit. You dare address me the Emperor of Khazad Morgoth. The what? Naruto titled his head. Khazad Morgoth. It's what he renamed this city as. Is he serious? Of course I am stinking Humi, he ranted down the balcony before he started a coughing fit and wheezing for Guy's breath back. Don't cough up a lung Osric, in fact do us all a favor and just kick the bucket already. Said a taunting voice that came from hulkyish figure that walked up to the balcony from behind Osric. The figure was that of an ogre that was dark brown and had a lot of tribal tattoos covering his body. He refused to wear armor and went into battle bare chested with only an iron plated shoulder guard on his left shoulder. And he also wore a leather battle skirt. And the most notable feature OG him was the large horn that protruded out of his forehead, just like Tio's own horn. Speaking of Tio, she was trembling in fear at the sight of him. Shut it Kragas. I refuse to give over my position to anyone, not until I have the empire reduced to naught but ash. They will fall like this place once did. That was one hundred years ago and you have barely made any progress against the empire since then. In fact we are losing more forces than we are winning battles, many of us have been captured and used for whatever purpose they want with them. Then they are not worthy for being a true soldier of Morgoth. And you are? Look at you, you can barely lift up that spear you once used to slaughter the dwarf scum. You are nothing but worthy. Enough Kragas. You will listen to my orders. Kragas growled and walked straight up to Osric and towered over him at seven feet seven inches. I don't take orders from an orc, maggot, and before he was about to do something drastic he spotted something he recognized. He looked down at Tio and straight into her red eyes and blonde hair. Hmm, I recognize those eyes anywhere. You're Trisha's child aren't you, he called out to Tio grinning fiendishly. Tio flinched as she had hoped that he would not spot her. Naruto looked over to Tio in concern. She was now acting very scared and timid all of a sudden. Like this ogre was the boogeyman of her nightmares. Tio, who is he? Naruto asked her while caressing her arm to comfort and calm her down. Tio clutched onto her club tightly and was now refusing to look at the Kragas in the eye. He, he is my father. The monstrous crowd roared in eager anticipation for the sight and smell of blood to be spilt on the arena grounds. The arena was a grand piece of architecture built for hosting brutal, yet spectacular games. Once upon a time, the games which took place in the arena were more for battles of honor. People could still die, but they could also be granted mercy by their opponents. Fortunately for them, the gladiators were honorable people but that was a long time ago. Since then, the arena had long lost its grandeur. The statues in the arena were now used to chain up the losers and by the looks of the recent corpses, they looked to have been gutted, flayed, decapitated, and dismembered by all sorts of brutality that they experienced from these monsters and beasts. The arena floor was surrounded by a three-story wall that separated the dangers of the arena floor and the spectators. The arena floor was just a simple stone floor and there were two portcullis-style gates leading out of the arena, but both of them were closed shut, therefore denying the escape party's freedom. The spectating stands were made into stone-cut seats, but were more like giant steps to sit on, and the balcony that used to house the VIPs towered above the public stands and the arena floor. Speaking of VIPs, 
there was the ancient orc warlord and the barbaric and brutish ogre chieftain that gazed down at the unfortunate men and women down in the arena. Naruto felt concerned for the eccentric and high-spirited ogre girl. For her to feel very afraid of the hulkyish ogre on top of the balcony above them, he assumed that he must be someone who has hurt her in the past or perhaps someone close to her dearly. So? My beloved daughter returns to me. Tell me. How is Trish? The ogre named Kragas sneered at her. Tio remained silent, unable to answer him. Her whole body was trembling as if her father was the boogeyman of her nightmares, manifested in the flesh. Naruto hated this type of scenario where an innocent child confronts their deadbeat father. He hated it because it serves as a reminder of how he hadn't confronted his own father yet. If he did, then his father would get what he rightfully deserves and experience the worst beating of his life. However, the dad right above him deserved to get shot and put down permanently. Humph. I was hoping that you would inherit her fearlessness, but all I see in you is a spineless coward. How disappointing. It would have been better if I have been given a son instead of a worthless girl. Far more easier to train into a loyal warrior. Tio shrank at the degrading and hurtful comments aimed at her. Naruto stood in front of Tio protectively whilst placing a comforting hand on her forearm to calm her down. Tio flinched slightly, but then held on to his hand, careful not to squeeze it too hard. Kragas saw this action and was about to comment on it, until he got interrupted by Osric. You there. The one dressed in black and wearing the freakish mask. He bellowed down at him in his raspy withering voice. What do you want? Naruto yelled back at the decrepit, old warlord. Were you the one responsible for the destruction of the spider nests? Do you have proof that it could have been me? Some of the remaining spider younglings reported that you made the black powder go boom. Whoops. Naruto nonchalantly shrugged. Those spiders were our allies for over a hundred years and they were decimated in seconds. How did you do it? Magic. He replied nonchalantly and waved his hands in the air in a sarcastic motion. The youngling said you used something to make the black powder go boom. He motioned towards a barrel full of black powder that was being placed right next to Osric by two orc grunts. Tell me how you made it go boom this instant. He demanded. Hypothetically speaking, if I were to tell you, what would you do with it? Naruto questioned back. Simple, a weapon so powerful as to harness fire and explosions itself is a blessing. We could destroy many cities with a weapon such as this and the humans would be powerless to stop the destruction that will erupt upon them. I also want you to tell us how to make it as well. In that case... I'm not telling you fuck all about anything regarding it even if I did know how it works, how it's made or even what it is. Liar, you do know what it is and how it works. No matter, you will tell us soon enough. He raised his hand up and the portcullis gate in front of them opened up to reveal orcs leading in battered and bruised men. Their equipment was worn and old and varied from leather armor, to plain rags and dented iron armor. Their weapons were just as worn out as their armor but still looked capable of chopping off a high number of heads and limbs. In front of you are some of the many gladiators in our arena. These are the freshest of the lot, bandits, mercenaries, marauders, pirates, criminals and ex-soldiers of the empire. You name it, we've got it. The worst of the worst of human society that has been forsaken and ripe for the picking for our amusement. We have gathered them all to fight here against you. This sounds like they are gathering these guys for a mass execution. I guess the worst humans make far better entertainment for them than the normal law-abiding citizens? Naruto mused. Exactly, they gather them because to them, they are the most amusing to watch. If they were to gather farmers or peasants that are unable to fight or have no combat experience or training, then they would be bored very easily from it. They also use them as fodder most of the time. Jaeger explained. This lot in front of us look desperate. Naruto pointed out. They are, a fight to the death is the main rule in these gladiator battles. 
They keep promising them that they would be set free if they kill this person or that person or even a 100 people, but most won't even make it past 5 battles. I'm on my 36th battle and I still haven't been granted my freedom, so that's why he was so sluggy sh when we fought. It also explains his battle scars and fatigue. He concluded, but there was another problem that Naruto was concerned about. There are about over 37 gladiators in front of us. We only have several knights including Ezra, you, Tio and me and whole lot of innocents who can't fight, Naruto analyzed his side of the field. What's the plan? Jaeger asked, have the knights form a defensive circle around the civilians along with Tio staying close to them and make sure that the civilians are crouched low so that Tio can use her weapon's long reach to take any of them out in case they get too close. You, Ezra and I will be the main attack force in a triangle formation in front of the circle formation. Sounds good. You up for it Rose Knight? Jaeger nodded at the plan and turned to Ezra, who nodded at the plan and rallied up the knights. Of course, she nodded while her eyes shone like steel dipped in confidence and calmness. Don't spread too far out from the circle. Naruto called out to them while deciding to equip the kukri and leave his other hand free in case if one slips past to harm the civilian girls. If that were to happen then he could always whip out a pistol. He could always just shoot the old pale green bastard and his hulkyish henchmen, but he figured that it was best to lay off on the trained professional trigger finger for the moment because they needed a valid escape route laid out first in front of them and that probably wouldn't happen if he were to go all trigger happy on their arses. Plus, the warlord would be drooling over his weapons if he were to give him a demonstration of what they could do, which would absolutely suck for anyone else if they were to discover the deadliness of firearms. Naruto doubted that not everyone in this world could be seriously stupid or primitive enough to learn how these weapons worked as it was actually pretty easy to figure out for yourself. The gladiators themselves appeared to be a mixture of their professions. Bandits wore ragged leather armor with a ragged cotton shirt underneath with brown trousers that had patches on them held up by just a string and some of them even wore dull and rusted looking iron armor. Mercenaries had slightly better equipment which didn't look so scruffy and worn. Marauders wore what looked to be a desecrated version of an existing uniform, like from some type of military, and designed it to look more, brutal. As in the armor was colored in what seemed to be blood and was decorated in spikes and graffiti art. The pirates and other criminals wore nothing, but their own clothes on their backs or went in bare-chested. The only fighter that looked properly equipped was this disgraced military officer that looked like a Roman centurion, albeit a rather ragged version of one as the armor looked very battered and worn. Naruto could see that the man used to be a rather fat bastard himself if the slight excess skin on his face was any indication. He couldn't tell how fat he was, but he appeared to have lost a considerable amount of weight in this mountain. His arms, unlike the rest of the gladiators, were not as developed in terms of muscle. He could only conclude that this must be a noble drafted into the military using his own prestige or friends in high places to grant him the rank. Hey look it's one of ours. Arnett pointed out. Why is he looking at us like that, one of the twins pointed out. Ever heard of the saying, every man for himself? Naruto suddenly asked as he looked in understanding of the centurion's position and the look on his face. The girls and Jaeger shook their heads. When it comes down to the point where it's every man for himself, then people are going to want to save themselves from a difficult or desperate situation without trying to help anyone else except for themselves. Even high-ranking officials are not spared from this. He doesn't care who or what you are as long as you don't get in his way as he desperately tries to claw his way to safety using the blood of his subordinates to pave the way. But, he is of the great imperial army. He can't just do this. It's dishonorable. One of the twins gasped out in shock of the betrayal. He is a lost cause, nothing and nobody else matters to him as long as he obtains his freedom and stays alive to achieve it. Not that that they really care about releasing him. According to Jaeger, they'll kill him before he gets the chance. Naruto spoke logically despite the cold truth behind those words. And he was right. The look in their opponent's eyes ranged from desperation, to some of lust and apathy. 
Our opponents are mostly women? Ha! Huh. Easy match, some of the marauders cheered. Can we leave a few alive? I've not had any fucking action down there in months. Some desperate bandit leered at them. Who cares this is my final match? I don't care about some bitches as long as I get my freedom out of this shit hoe. A pirate was about to voice out his thoughts until he got interrupted. Shut up all of you worms. The centurion roared at them. Don't get distracted because they're women. There are plenty more of them out there when we get out of this place. You should all be honored to serve under Count Marcelo Dash. Shut the fuck up Marcelo. You're in the same position as we are and your position means horseshit to us. A mercenary captain interrupted him. Insolent little. Whatever just stick to the plan. They promise to release us after we kill them. 2. Whatever, the mercenary captain spat on the ground. That's not good. They've formed a temporary alliance, despite how shaky their relationship is between those two over there, Naruto clicked his tongue in annoyance. Didn't you mention it was every man for himself? Said Jaeger who deadpanned at Naruto. I did, but they all have a common goal and that is to get out of this place and they want to kill us for their freedom. The criminals, bandits, mercenaries, marauders and pirates were all led by the centurion with him in the back leading them, although something along the lines was what made Naruto suspect something, something tells me he's not the bravest soldier. He isn't. He's a colossal, cowardly bastard that would stay in the back and only fight at the last minute when the enemy opponents are exhausted or occupied with some of his men and then he'd take them out using underhanded tactics. If things don't go his way, he simply leaves the battlefield and leaves his men to die. Ezra spoke out as she knew of the officer's military record. And he's a ranked officer why? Naruto tilted his head at Ezra. Family and friends in high places. He or they can use their position to promote himself slash themselves into a high-ranking position in the Imperial Army. Naruto rolled his eyes, go figure, even though they may have a strong resemblance to the ancient Romans, scratch that, they do have a strong resemblance to the Romans. Judging by the negative history that the Romans had done in our world's past, who's to say that they won't turn out to be the same? As the saying goes, Rome wasn't built in a day, but with the blood of many slaves, torture, pillaging, prostitution, genocides, war, cruelty, insane leaders and more. They do it all in order to make it look grand on the outside, but the truth is that it is really repugnant on the inside. Who's to say that these people have the same ideology as the ancient Romans? I am really not looking forward to adventuring this world, but at the same time, the truth is that I am also eager for it. Naruto sighed heavily to himself. Marcelo. You dare to conspire with those foul scumbags. Where is your pride as a nobleman and a soldier of sad era? Arnett roared out against the disgraced noble. Who? You're from the knight order that Her Highness Princess Pina had formed. Don't worry I will give her my condolences after your noble sacrifice. He said without a care while he sneered at her and the rest of the knights. Arnett stood in her place shocked that one of her fellow soldiers in the empire would betray her and her fellow knights, all to save his own skin. She and the rest of the knights clenched their fists and grinded their teeth to barely contain their rage. Ezra stood calmly and still but the cold deathly scowl on her face barely contained her rage. Noble. Honor. Pride. Are those part of the job descriptions for your military? Because I would be worried if I had soldiers like that in my military, Naruto rudely pointed out to the nobleman. Silent scum, the nobleman screamed out in childish anger. Huh. Sorry did you say something? The mask is muffling my hearing, he mimicked cupping his ear to indicate that he didn't hear what he said. The arena went silent for a moment before the crowd went wild in a fit of bellowing laughter. The nobleman flushed bright red in an embarrassed rage. The gang, however, all sweat dropped at Naruto's actions, but were biting their lips to hold in their giggles. Enough, he roared which made the crowd quiet enough to hear what he was saying. Do you know who I am? I am Count Marcel Dash. 
Yes I know who you are, barely, and frankly I don't give a shit, he rudely waved off his attempts at arguing. Silence you impudent foul peasant. I am a noble you dull pathetic commoner, and I will not be insulted by Dash. Oh for the love of Kami is every person in this fucking empire seriously going to be as annoying as this prick, roared out the special forces soldier who was pointing rudely at the nobleman as he questioned the Rose Knights behind him. Suddenly, he realized he had made a minor slip up, whoops. My anger just slipped for a moment there. Slipped? You outright interrupted and insulted a noble who is an official officer of the Imperial Army of Sadera in a brief few seconds in that moment as you call it. Ezra said incredulously, normally such behavior could end up with you getting severely punished or even executed. Hey! In my defense, I am already under a lot of stress and I get a bit cranky when some people intentionally piss me off. Sorry about that by the way. I feel slightly better now. Secondly, that guy's an asshole because a, he is arrogant, self-absorbed, pretentious, and a sheltered, worthless man and b, he is going to betray you and forsake you here to your deaths. Ezra kept quiet about that statement, but silently agreed that he did have it coming to him. The Count stood in his place frozen in shock and then twitched with barely suppressed anger, and soon he exploded in a fit of rage and roared out his orders for the attack, like a demanding child throwing a tantrum. The captured criminals did not need to be told twice, three times or more by the ranting noble. They just wanted the deed over and done with. The bandits, marauders and pirates heedlessly charged straight at the group with headstrong overconfidence, believing that this would be very simple for them. Naruto stood in his place with a rather calm and cool composure behind his mask. Hmm, can't use a gun around here if that warlord is watching. Besides, these guys are not worth the use of my precious bullets. Hmm, they're barely capable of CQC, guess I'm just going to have to roll with it, but first. Naruto brought out a peculiar cylinder with a pin plugged in the top and the design had multiple circles in the base of the stun grenade. You should cover your ears and eyes for this. He warned to his companions. Question mark, the group looked at him funny and at the stun grenade with curiosity. Naruto pulled the pin out and he threw the grenade, hitting an oncoming bandit five meters away from the group on the forehead, causing him to land on the floor in front of the criminals. The one bandit toppled over and clutched his forehead, while wincing in pain. The rest of the scumbags all just suddenly stopped in front of the strange device in confusion as their curiosity made them stare at the device in bewilderment. Bang, a loud deafening bang exploded out of the small canister and with it, a light that illuminated the surrounding area in a blinding moment of a white flash that enveloped their sight. The bandits and the other outlaws stumbled back covering their eyes and ears wincing and crying out in pain, not that they could hear themselves. Naruto brought out his kukri machete to deal with them, but then saw Jagar and the rest of the knights and hostages rubbing their eyes and ears. Jagar however, was on the floor holding his rabbit ears and looked like a spooked rabbit. What did I fucking say? At least Tio has more common sense to listen to warnings than you lot. That was true as Tio did what she was told without question of doubt. Jaeger shook his head to shake off the effects of the stun grenade. What in the name of Hardy was that? A miniature sun? Doesn't matter right now. Here, take this, Naruto dropped his hunting knife at Jaeger's feet. Can you still fight? Heh, don't underestimate a warrior bunny. I can still fight a hundred more fights said the one who lasted about thirty seconds against me. Naruto chuckled at as Jaeger's face faulted. That didn't count I wasn't at my best then. He tried to reason, but Naruto waved off his excuses. Yeah, yeah whatever. Naruto said before he dashed over to the incapacitated group. Before one of the bandits had recovered some of his sight back, the last thing he saw before his vision returned was a flash of metal sinking into his neck like paper. His vision went spinning before he suddenly landed roughly behind a body that had lost its head. Wait a moment, the bandit had realized that it was his body that had collapsed onto the ground. He tried to scream out but he could not feel his lungs responding as they had been separated from his head. 
What really caught his attention was this man clad in armor like that of darkness itself. And the mask, that mask, the breathing, that man, no, that thing, it scared him. Even in his dying breath, he could still hear the breathing over the slaughter of his fellow outlaws. Naruto and Jaeger had quickly and efficiently taken out the main threat in front of them, while they left the knights and Tio to defend the innocent civilians. Naruto made quick work with his kukri machete as he aimed for the soft spots or exposed parts in their armor. The leather armor worn by some of the bandits and the brigands slash marauders didn't protect them at all as the deadly sharpness of the blade slashed through their worn-out armor with simple ease. When it came down to it, the armor was like paper to his blade, no matter how much they stacked into the armor. Naruto and Jaeger were well coordinated with their strikes as Naruto, with his kukri, had cut through fifteen inches worth of their chests, causing them to bleed out through massive gashes that were cut open smoothly along with their heads and their limbs. Although Jaeger wasn't at 100%, or so he claimed, he was just as capable of making short work of the gladiator scum with Naruto's hunting knife. The blade was a 9.5-inch black, cold steel blade along with a 5-inch rubber handle. Jaeger was hugely impressed with such a well-crafted, balanced and powerful combat slash hunting knife that fit snugly in his hand. It never slipped even once, and the serrated edges on the spine of the blade looked nasty even to him. Every cut, slash and stab into every enemy just sank in like a sack of grains, and not once did the blade get dulled or blunted with every strike. After flipping away from two simultaneous swings from a pirate and bandit, he flipped behind a marauder and punctured the blade straight through the dulled and rusted iron helmet. Surprisingly the blade got through it with ease, despite the blade being halfway, but the most shocking part was that the blade had also punched through the marauder's skull as well. He pulled the blade out and let the body collapse onto the floor in a bleeding and twitching mess. Jaeger inspected the blade and saw that the tip of the blade didn't go blunt from the strike. Hmm, this is impressive craftsmanship. Jaeger hummed to himself as he admired the blade. Suddenly his ears twitched and he spun around to see a pirate that was about to unleash a sneak attack on him only to get interrupted by a flying Sykes knife into his neck courtesy from Naruto. Admire the blade later, he yelled over to Jaeger before he threw his kukri straight into the face of an unfortunate bandit and ran straight over to the recently dispatched bandit who was about to fall flat onto the floor before Naruto yanked the blade out and slashed a nearby bandit who was standing next to his friend across the neck. Just keep on focusing on the enemy. They're not the only ones to focus on. How are we going to get out of here? Ezra called out from her side as she slashed through multiple people with her blade. That's what I'm trying to think of. Naruto answered back before musing to himself while also multitasking on combat. It was only until he blocked a sword strike from a mercenary that he get an uncertain idea. I could use the C4 to blast my way out, but I would be in clear sight of that old ancient orc up there. Trouble is I have only three quarters of a single pack of C4 left due to me using some of it earlier. Not to mention that the rest of the C4 is in my Bergen. He exhaled in frustration as this was not going well for him. While the gladiators were being slowly annihilated, some of the few groups of scum changed their tactics. Deciding not to charge head-on with the clearly skilled and powerful males and reluctantly acknowledging the one skilled female, they decided to target, in their minds at least, the lesser, inferior females. While some of the knights in the group were less experienced with combat, there was one threat that they overlooked that was clearly staring at them in the face. Before they realized their error, they were already a meter away from the knights, only to find themselves launched away from them. What happened was that Tio was standing in the center of the group and she used her tall stature, the long reach of her arms and her long steel kanabo like weapon to swat away the nuisances. The weapon struck one of the mercenaries on his left arm where his hardened wooden shield was protecting him, only to be reduced to splinters along with his forearm. The force lifted him up and then collided with his partner right next to him along with the third person right next to that person. Two of them collided with the arena wall either face first or upside down. The third man unfortunately landed in the spectator's stand only for that guy to get mauled to death by hungry orcs. 
The knights that were preparing for their assault turned to Tio in awe and gaping mouths, but she only smiled kindly and reassuringly in return at them. After seeing that smile they felt more confident in their own abilities and more determined to survive and protect one another. Even the ones that were shaking in despair felt a glimmer of hope rising up from the depths of their hearts. Even though three were taken out from the mighty swing, the rest of the group were not deterred as four more men threw themselves at their ranks this time to get behind the female ogre. Two of the knights saw this coming and drew their swords and cut them down with determination to protect the innocents. Ezra with her own skilled and refined swordplay that focused on speed agility and finesse, while Freya with her exclusive home-taught sword style exclusive to the Nords which focused on power, strength, and relentlessness. The results were quite deadly on the attackers as Ezra cut through their weak points, such as openings in their armor that allowed her to pierce through and puncture a vital organ or two, while Freya used her powerful toned arms that were condensed and packed with raw strength and power fueled by adrenaline to simply tear through her enemies. To them it looked like they had pissed off a berserker from the Nordic Highlands way up in the north slash northeast or west. The gladiators tried desperately to block her attacks. But they were too fast and brutal as she would simply smash through their guard and tear off their armor with such destructive attacks, while leaving them exposed for her blade to run them through. After all or most of the gladiators had been slaughtered, only four remained. There were two mercenaries, one bandit and the centurion. The mercenaries were disgruntled at the fact that the centurion did not even help and as he was just shouting orders at them from the back and the bandit was just a sixteen-year-old boy who made the worst decision of his life in joining the bandits because he could not handle the life of a simple peasant. Now, he was here forced to fight and was cowering in his boots not moving at all like he was petrified with fear. It was made worse when the man with the black mask with pitch black eye holes looked upon him with a blood splattered, curved, yet deadly machete in his left hand. That gaze of his looked like death itself was judging him, like he could see his own death by his own hand. After a few seconds of eye contact, he lost his nerve and turned tail and ran away from him only to bump into the noble who was furious with him. The noble inwardly gulped in uncertainty and fear as his own safety and life was now hanging on by a thin thread. Those pawns of his that he had planned to use as fodder to grant him victory out of the bloody arena were now decimated by two men. One of them, a filthy and savage warrior bunny man, and the other an unknown man dressed in black and donning a mask that completely hid his face, even his eyes. It was those eyes that made it so unnerving to look at. It was like staring into the depths of oblivion. The two mercenaries were still alive, yet gravely wounded with gash wounds courtesy from a cookery machete that slashed through their side armor and their arms and were bleeding heavily from large cuts or dismemberment. The captain of the mercenaries and his right-hand man were outright cursing the noble for sending his men and the others to die even though he was in charge and the coward was refusing to even help them. The noble was brought out of his stupor when the bandit that lost his nerve crashed into him. The noble's fearful face turned to fury of the boy's desertion. Despite the boy not being a part of their military, it was still a great offense to the military generals, officers, and commanders as any and all those that flee from the battle like cowards were to be executed. Where the fuck do you think you are going boy? Turn back around and fight you coward. Marcelo yelled as he grabbed him by the collar. No. Please don't make me fight him. I only joined the bandits because of my poor lifestyle and I wanted to be rich. I don't want to do this anymore, the boy cried out with tears in his eyes and snot pouring out his nose as he wailed like a lost child swimming in regret over his selfish and childish actions. Well it's too late for regrets now as you won't be going home unless you kill those bastards. Marcelo roared at him only to get a punch to the face in retaliation from a boy who was breaking into fear and desperation. Marcelo's grip loosened on the collar as the punch to the face loosened enough for the boy to be free and he ran up to the gates and relentlessly tried to pull slash push the gate open. Let me go. Please, he pleaded fearfully to the crowd and the leaders, but the monsters and beasts roared in laughter at the boy's pathetic display. It only got worse for the boy as the constant mental torture of the crowds laughing and pointing at him with harsh jeers on the tip of their tongues aimed at him and barraged him with insults and mockery, until his mind collapsed. 
Mommy. I'm sorry, he wailed and whimpered as tears and snot poured down his face as he collapsed on the portcullis gates completely unaware of an enraged nobleman walking behind raising his sword above his head and swinging it down. The slash ended his life gruesomely as the sword split the boy's head in two and bathed the arena floor, the gate and Marcello's armor in the boy's blood. While the crowd cheered and jeered at the boy's death as they found him irritating, the mercenaries, and the knights scowled, or in Tio's case, appalled at his actions. Naruto and Jaeger were somewhat used to it, Jaeger being raised as a warrior bunny from a young age, witnessed the countless deaths of young people. Even the deaths of children weren't new to him. Naruto on the other hand had seen a lot worse ways to go. All involving young teenagers and even children involved in war and death. In fact, Marcelo sort of reminded Naruto of Soviet NKVD officers in Stalingrad, where they would execute anyone who retreated away from the enemy or deserted from the main force due to cowardice or attempting to retreat from the point of attack even if it was a hopeless charge. Marcelo was hyperventilating in fury and madness flickering in his twitching eyes. You dare, to lay a hand on a noble you bandit scum. I am a noble. I will always be your superior and anyone who defies me will meet the tip of my sword. He growled at the boy and threatened to the mercenaries to which they frowned in disgust. You are not the boss of us Marcelo. The fight is already lost. It's no use fighting anymore as I would rather die than to take orders from you. Besides, what makes you think these bastards will let us go anyways, the gruff mercenary boss spat back at him. Shut up. I must get out of this cesspit of rancid decay. My title is on the line if I don't reclaim it back soon. Ha! <laughs> Good luck on getting it back now, because you will never be getting out of this place and I doubt that Emperor Molt would hold on to your title, lands, and prestige for you when you do return. You never had any family to begin with because you stabbed them all in the back until you got your way, but now here you are, in danger of losing it all, the captain laughed at his misfortune. That is why you will fight and kill them. And this is why you should die alone in this place. You are not my superior Marcello. If you want those people dead, then deal with it your damned self. You bastards, both of you shall pay in the name of Count Marcello the Dash, he was about to announce to the crowd until, boom, an incredibly loud and deafening explosion caught everyone off guard as the portcullis gates and parts of the stadium especially the spectator stands were blown to pieces in a blazing inferno of ignited liquid and powder. The explosion tore through the stone stadium as chunks of stone fragments of the architecture and bricks and wood scattered everywhere. Osric and Kragas were taken by surprise by the huge shockwave caused by the explosion and the torches that were hanging on the walls loosened from the blast. The torches fell onto the floor and coincidentally one of them landed onto one of the lids of the wooden barrels filled with black powder. Marcello, who was interrupted, had been the one to take the full force of the blast that erupted behind him had been launched six feet away from where he was standing as parts of the iron portcullis gate had impaled him through his chest. He was barely hanging on to his life as he lay on the ground heavily bleeding with bits of hot iron stuck in his body and searing into his flesh. Huh. Naruto blinked in confusion and surprise and the rest of the gang looked at him funny. What are you looking at me like that for? That wasn't me this time I swear, he shook his hands up in defense. Then who was it? Ezra questioned. Whistle, hey Naruto. Did you really expect us to leave you here, a voice called out from the smoldering hole, and lo and behold out came the three recognizable silhouettes of Cathal, Geislane and Akane. Well, shit, Naruto gave out a relived laugh. Five minutes prior. It's really rowdy in there. Is there an event going on? Akane questioned at the level of noise coming from within the arena. Judging by the building's architecture, this is a gladiator arena. Geislane pointed out. Isn't this the place where we heard the explosions and those continuous loud banging sounds that sounded like thunder up close? Cathal also pointed out. Don't tell me he is in the arena, Akane face palmed. It is a highly likely possibility that he is. Geislane grew concerned for him. We can't just leave him there, we must get him out. 
Kathleen also voiced out her concern for the brief companion who saved her life, as well as those of her friends. But how? There are hundreds, if not a thousand of those beasts inside the arena and he is trapped within the arena floor with no way out. Geislane pondered for a plan until a sudden idea appeared in her head, how about we, make a way out? Huh. Kathleen and Akane looked at her funny, not quite getting where she was going with this. Geislane walked up behind Kathleen and reached for the Bergen bag until she discovered a problem. How do I open this, she said while trying to figure out how to open a pocket in the back that seemed to be sealed by what looked like teeth joined and locked together. What's wrong? This pocket is what I am trying to get into and it's sealed by what looks like teeth and I am trying to figure out how to open it, she pondered on how to open it without tearing it open. Ah, I've seen Naruto open it with something. It should be this little strip of cloth or something and you pull it to split the pocket open. Cathal explained as she remembered Naruto opening the bag with some unique method of sealing it and then opening it again. Gilshan then spotted the thin strip and pulled on the zipper and opened the pocket to reveal several packs of C4. I believe this was the object used to blow up Baratham and those mine carts filled with the black powder. Cathal and Akane picked up some of the C4 and observed them. They felt the material inside it and opened up the packs to get a better look at it. Whoa! What is this stuff? It feels like clay. Akane said transfixed on the plastic explosives and then deliberately used the scan spell again. Seriously Akane, you are digging yourself further into the grave. Cathal and Geislain sweat dropped at their friend for once again disregarding the quest giver's orders of not to misuse the spell on anything, but the gate. Meh, what's she going to do? she shrugged without a care to which the other two sweat dropped further in concern for her friend. Holy! This stuff is amazing, she suddenly yelled out with sparkles in her eyes as her eyes shimmered in excitement and awe, forgetting her position that they were deep in hostile territory. Sure. The two demi-humans hushed her. Sorry, but seriously you need to check this out, Akane held up the scanned sphere to Geislane and Cathal to which they pressed their hands on the sphere and went into meditation to learn about this strange material. They learned that a single block of this, C4, has the capability of tearing through the armor plating of a wyvern or even a dragon if you stack enough of them up. It was mostly used for demolition purposes, but could also be used for sabotage and breaching. The explosives were not unstable which was a good thing as the only thing they needed to detonate it was a device used for detonating said explosives. Suddenly, Geislane's nose twitched as she picked up on a scent from a room that smelled really strong than the others. Curious, they walked up to the door and opened it. As soon as they did, they all reached for their noses as they reeled themselves back in disgust as the stench of dragon's breath mead was being stored into this particular storage room that was conveniently placed near the walls of the arena floor. Well I guess this place will do for making him an exit. Geislane examined the room and took out the explosives. Air. How much do we need? Cathal asked her companion slash friend. I'm not sure. How powerful do you think they are? Geislane scratched her head as she was still confused with the mystery behind these explosives. Screw the calculations, let's use all of it. Akane smiled in glee and grabbed several blocks of C4 and just placed them by a wall which no doubt led to the arena. Akane I don't think that this amount of explosives is safe. Geislane warned with her face slightly paling at the amount as Akane stacked them up in storage room filled with an abundance of dangerous and illegal merchandise that could prove hazardous to them, and everyone else in the vicinity, if handled improperly. Pfft. It'll be fine, she shrugged as she watched the instruction of how to use it on her scan spell and she got it primed and ready. All ready to go. Now, where is the, air, detonator? I think that's what it's called. She scratched her head pondering what the word meant. You know it looked like a handle with a trigger on it with a black stick poking out the top. You mean this thing? Cathal reached inside the Bergen and fished out a spare detonator that Naruto kept inside just in case. That's it. Akane squealed in delight and snatched the detonator out of her hands. Be careful with that you maniac. 
Cathal yelled at her comically as she started making her way out the door as Akane fiddled with the tool that made the blocks of clay-like material explode. Oh relax. It's currently on this, safety thing and won't explode when I pull the trigger. Then let's get out quickly before she blows us all up. Cathal rushed outside the door and far away from the room with Geislane following close behind her. Hey wait up I'm coming too. I'm not that mad. Akane whined to her friends. They ran up to about 15 meters away from the site where the explosives were placed at and they hid behind the corner. Think this is safe enough? It's as far as we can go, so it'll have to do. Then by all means. Akane said with glee as she took the detonator off the safety and was about to hit the detonator trigger. Wait, they both tried to stop her from jumping the gun before they were ready. Too late. This is more fun. Akane slammed her hand on the detonator and all hell broke loose as the explosion was a lot more powerful than they could realize in their massive error of judgment. Boom. The massive force of the blast reverberated through the walls and the pressure smashed through every nearby wall and collapsed the ceiling above the storage room that was right above the public spectator stands and near the VIP spectator stands. Then the fire that ignited the barrels roared through the hallways like a blazing inferno. All three of them fell to the ground by either the power of the explosion or from the closeness of it as they froze up petrified by the explosion and holding onto their ears as they could only briefly hear this high-pitched screeching sound. Air. I think that was a little too much. Akane scratched the back of her head nervously to which her companions glared at her. You think, they both growled. Hey at least we got through, she defended her actions, come on let's get that idiot out, she rushed for the hole where Naruto was with Geislane and Cathal following after her. Present. Naruto suddenly had a tick mark form on his head. Did you just use my C4, he demanded to know. Well, yes along with the barrels of dragons breathed to add along with it. Akane scratched her head nervously laughing. How much did you use? All of it, she muttered out but Naruto heard it clearly. What? That stuff isn't cheap you know and I don't know how to make it here, he roared. Hey at least we got you out, now shut up and let's run for it. Akane shouted back and urged him to escape before she took notice of the extra company accompanying him. And who are these people? Have you been making friends without us or maybe you got sick of us already, she accused. Long story, but as you said let's move, he waved her off and ushered for the group to head towards the hole. The spectators watched on in shock as their entertainment was walking out of the arena. Unfortunately for them, they were powerless to stop their escape as many of their kind had been killed as a result of the powerful explosion and those who survived were trying to recover from the aftermath. Kragas and Osric stood up from their seats as they recovered from the near-death experience as the ceiling caved in slightly. Don't just stand there gawking, after them you maggots. Kragas roared out and the orcs and ogres and other beasts were just about to comply with their orders until, boom, another fireball exploded but this time it erupted out of the VIP stand and balcony as the room inside housing the gunpowder ignited from the one burning torch that burnt through the wood of the barrel and ignited the powder within. The force of the blast wiped out the VIP stand and blasted it to pieces. Osric simply flew out of the stand on fire screaming in agony and landed with a crunch on the cold hard arena floor still screaming in agony as the old withered bones shattered on impact and his old withered and dry skin skin was burning him alive. Kragas was nowhere to be seen as the last thing that the orc saw were the flames consuming the building and collapsing on top of the chieftain. XXXX Tio rushed past the group and shouted at them, hurry. There is a secret passage underneath the crater that we can use to escape the mountain. Are you sure about this? Ezra questioned the validity of Tio's claim. It's our only chance of getting out of here alive. I'm willing to take it, let's move. Naruto yelled out and ordered everyone to run. OST Seldweller, Narrow Escape They found the secret passage slightly buried underneath some rubble but it was instantly cleared out with the help of Tio and Cathal. All the victims and knights were rushed into the tunnel first, followed by Akane, 
Geislane, Jaeger and surprisingly the mercenaries rushed into the tunnel as well not wanting to be left behind. Then Cathal and Tio being the second and third last people to go through and lastly Naruto followed in after them in case if any hostiles were to follow them. Suffice to say only a few orcs and ogres followed the orders to seize the escapees, but were quickly shot down by Naruto and his quick reaction times with his L85A2 firing accurately into their heads. He didn't have to worry about the warlords as that explosion would have sorted them out, at least he hoped so. With the orcs and ogres quickly taken care of, he ran straight into the tunnel but not before arming a 40mm grenade round to his underslung grenade launcher and firing it into the tunnel's ceiling about 7 meters away from him. The grenade blasted through the ceiling and tons of dirt and stone rubble buried the tunnel. Unfortunately, it also caused the tunnel to become even more unstable. Oh shit, he cursed and sprinted for the other end of the tunnel hoping to see that glimmer of light shining in the darkness to show him the way out. As he was running he brought out his MP5 with the torch attachment and shone it down he tunnel to use as his main vision, but it was quite difficult to see through the light when he was sprinting through the tunnel, while also trying not to trip over any rocks or stones sticking out of the ground or if some random asshole left something lying around on the floor that would cause a trip hazard. He didn't know how long he had sprinted for as he outran the soon-to-be-collapsing ceiling. But all his fears came to rest as he soon found a small glimmer of what was unmistakably sunlight at the end of the tunnel just around the corner. Oh thank Kami for that. Sweet freedom here I co, he picked up the pace and was about to relish in the sunlight just around the corner until, womph. Song end. He inadvertently wedged himself in between two sets of soft, yet firm orbs of flesh. This felt similar to what he felt before but he knew they weren't the same as these were packed with muscle, and he could have sworn that one of them had a tail as it was whipping him in the face. I ah. Uh, mo. Two distinct voices could be heard from the other end of the tunnel and from these immovable objects. Two voices he recognized. Sweetie? Is that you back there? Naruto. What the hell are you doing back there? Stop groping my ass. Oh for fuck's sake not this again. Naruto face faulted and a torrent of blood exploded out of his nose and pooled inside of his mask. He shook his head to remove the lewd thoughts from his head and went straight back to serious mode. Tio? Cathal? What the hell is going on here? Why are two blocking the exit? Isn't it obvious? We're stuck. Cathal yelled out back at him in frustration. Mao. It's really cramped. Tio whined. Naruto's sweat dropped at this situation until he heard a rumble deep within the tunnel. Erm. Naruto? What was that? Cathal called out to him in concern. Get out of the tunnel now. The tunnel's collapsing. Get everyone out there to pull you out. I'll push you out from here. What? Hey don't be getting any funny ideas back there, Cathal stammered and blushed fiercely at the close contact as he placed his hands behind her rear and Tio also blushed as well. No time for hesitancy now push god damn it. Naruto ignored her complaints and slammed himself into their backsides again and pushed himself into them trying to force his way through the hole before the ceiling could collapse on them all. At last the gap loosened and they broke free along with the help of the shockwave of air, dust and rubble that blasted them out. Naruto was launched into the air and sent flying, but instead of a hard landing on the rocky surface of the mountain or even the ice, he got a soft landing that wasn't a heavy build-up of snow, but straight into the waiting arms and bountiful chest of Tio, head first. My hero. Tio cheered and hugged him with gratitude and happiness. The hug was as powerful as a bear as Naruto could feel his ribs being compressed and the air from his lungs forcefully being pushed out. Oof. Tito, you're, see crushing me. Naruto managed to wheeze out. Oh, he he sorry. She nervously laughed and released him and instead gave him a softer hug that would have looked rather funny to some as if it was like a mother hugging her smaller child. To him, that felt really pleasant as if her aura of happiness was infecting him and he could just melt away in her warmth for a very long time. 
Thank you, she gratefully thanked him softly with a soft smile on her face. Thank you and everyone else for saving these poor girls. There truly is a good person out there after all, one who doesn't care about differences or themselves. She said with such passion, gratitude and honesty from the bottom of her heart that touched Naruto and everyone else's hearts which made them slightly blush a bit, excluding Jaeger and the two mercenaries who weren't really involved. Ahem. Ezra coughed out with dust of pink lighting up her cheeks along with the rest of the people. Arnett was noticeably red and looked a bit appalled of the close proximity of Naruto's head in between Tio's heavenly bosom. The recently rescued girls were also blushing, but also a bit jealous that they weren't getting a hug from their big sister figure. Akane was biting her lips to prevent herself from laughing, but the snorts were barely kept in. Geislane stoically watched, but there were hints of something flashing in her eyes and small tint of dusty pink on her cheeks and Jaeger was looking at Naruto with a funny look and a raised eyebrow while the mercenaries had both wide-eyed gapes on their faces of perhaps what would be shock and little bit of envy. Cathal however glared at Naruto with a furious blush igniting her face and a childish pout forming on her right cheek. Naruto jumped up from the spot, choosing to ignore the looks everyone was giving him and walked up to Geislane with a serious look on his face. Did you really just use my C4? You mean the blocks of clay? She answered with a tilt to her head. It's actually a form of plastic explosive, but seriously did you use it? Yes. Are there any more left in the Bergen sack? She tried to remain quiet about and tried to avert her gaze from his. How much? Naruto pressed forward while leaning forward towards her head with his. None, we used all of it. All of. What the hell? Do you know how expensive that stuff is to make? I only have three quarters of a single pack left. Well excuse me your ungratefulness. Said Akane with hint of mock sarcasm. Is this the thanks we get for saving your lives? I know I'm sounding a bit ungrateful, but I am actually glad to see that you girls are okay and unharmed. Naruto said sincerely which made Akane scratch her cheek a bit bashfully. But using that much C4 was overly excessive, what else was used in the explosion? Dragon's breath mead and I think there were some black powder stored in barrels in that storage room. Makes sense, but I think one would have been enough. Hey we were kind of rushing for time to get you out of there just so you wouldn't die during that death tournament. Besides, we were lucky to find that passage underneath all that rubble and crater if we hadn't used that much. Otherwise, we would still be trapped in the Colosseum with hundreds or thousands of angry orcs, ogres, trolls and goblins out for our blood surrounding us. Akane explained her reasons for the reckless decision she made. Alright I forgive you, but on another note. How did you know how to use the C4 anyway? Naruto curiously asked as no one should be able to learn how to use it on their first try, and it was diffused as well. When we were sent on this quest by the quest giver, she taught us this spell called, Scan. What it does is it feeds your mind with instructions on how to use, construct, repair and all sorts of information that you could learn to understand the concept behind an object. It can be used on anything like magical artifacts, supernatural relics, complicated mechanisms, tools, weaponry and so on, but the user must have a high understanding and is a quick learner in order to use it efficiently. Geislane explained. Still don't know why the spell was taught to Cathal though. Akane teased and Cathal responded with a disgruntled, hey. I'm not stupid I just tend to forget things. She yelled out in her attempt to defend herself, which is all the time. Akane said with a blank face and Cathal shrugged without a care. Who is this quest giver by the way? Naruto asked. She is the lands. No. The world's most powerful mage, as well as the most intelligent being in the world. Geislane announced with a bit of flair behind it. Naruto pondered about that in his head, wow, seriously, a real mage? Might be worth looking into. Do you mind if I tag along with you to wherever she may be at? He asked. I, don't see a problem with that. 
She would want your take on our report that we need to give to her on what happened to the gate relic we were originally supposed to find. I get the feeling that she will definitely take a certain interest in you. Geislain said with her index finger on her chin. How come? She is a bit, eccentric and obsessive when it comes to new knowledge she does not know about. Geislain sweat dropped. Ah. Okay, Naruto nodded as he took the caution into mind and he felt a tap on his shoulders. As he turned around he saw Ezra with a concerned look on her face. While I am grateful to be out of this mountain, we have a problem. She pointed behind her to show that the innocent girls were cold and the rags and ruined clothes they had on were not helping. We're on top of the tallest mountain in the center of the region of the mountain range of ice and snow. She motioned to the surrounding mountain peaks. I can see that, and why is this place called that? Naruto raised his eyebrow at the choice of name for a mountain range. Because that's what this place represents. She responded. Naruto resisted the urge to face palm and mutter out, there is no middle finger big enough or, no shit Sherlock. Naruto looked around the place until he spotted something he did not like the look of. I'm afraid there is worse to come, he pointed towards the horizon and they all saw dark clouds forming on the horizon. Ezra frowned. These girls won't last in that blizzard. We need to find some place warm. In that instant Tio entered the serious discussion and suggested her own idea. I know some abandoned mine shafts that we could use for shelter not too far from here. We could use those to set up fires as there should be some leftover wood in those areas. Are they infested with monsters? No, the shafts were originally abandoned due to instability and the parts of the mine shafts collapsed over time and there are some areas that are completely safe and away from cold drafts of wind. Well it's a start, we will take them there and we will plan our next move. Naruto agreed to the plan, but then turned towards the two mercenaries. And you two are. Name Sven and this is my lieutenant Ken, the old gruff seasoned mercenary introduced themselves. And what will you two do now? Naruto asked of them. We have no reason to fight you now. We are free from those savages and Marcelo's weakened leash. If anything we should get moving fast. We could probably get to ground level before that snowstorm gets here. He told them and the knights felt really disgruntled by that. So you're just going to abandon us here, some of the Rose Knights voiced out their outrage. No offense, but we do not know you, and you. He pointed to the man in the mask. If you want our advice? It's best if you leave them here if they can't fend for themselves. That blast will have certainly taken its toll on Osric, but Kraga's is one tough whore son. The other two monster bosses would no doubt be notified about your escape and they will be on the lookout for us. We do not wish to stick around if that bastard and his lackeys are on the warpath and out for your blood. Sven told him with conviction and genuine fear of sticking around the mountain with angry pissed off monsters that wanted to kill them. Fair enough, you can leave. Naruto nodded and motioned his head to the left to indicate for them to get moving and get out of here. You're not coming with? Ken asked of him. Why should I? I'm no monster and I am certainly not a coward to run away from responsibility. I made a promise to these people that I'd get them to safety and I never turn away from my promises. Even if I were not under a promise, I would still help them anyways. Naruto told them with a strong sense of conviction. That kindness of yours will get you killed son, that's not how the world works. Sven tried to convince him to stop his foolishness. Maybe in your world yes, but in mine your opinions and beliefs don't mean shit to me. Naruto said to them tensely until he pointed to them. Now leave, we won't stop you. It is your choice whether you wish to stick around and help or not, but don't expect me to help you if you leave. He told them before the old man just simply nodded and walked off with his lieutenant. Damn mercenaries, always caring about nothing but themselves and profit. Arnett growled at their backs as soon as they left traversing down the mountain path. I don't blame them, you can pretty much find that trait in a lot of people. Naruto shrugged at their reasons as he has seen their kind before in a lot of mercenaries and certain types of people in high places. 
And what does that make you? A special case. Naruto said wryly as he gave a light chuckle at the look of Arnett's face when she had a thoughtful and confused frown as her expression. Tio. Can you lead the way towards to the nearest mine shaft you mentioned? Naruto called over to Tio. Of course. This way everyone, she said with enthusiasm and produced an aura of motivation for the others to follow. Miraculously, the girls braved through the cold winds of the mountain peaks, despite the thin air that would made their lungs thirsty for air. They soon set off for the nearest mine shaft on the tallest mountain of the range of ice and snow which was the most generic name he had heard for a mountain range. Instead of walking on dangerous ledges of slippery and jagged mountain rocks, the dwarves from a century or a longer time ago had helpfully constructed mountain path and stairs for the group to walk on which was really handy for them to navigate their way through the mountain pass. The stairway sort of reminded Naruto of the same stairway in that one game called the Elder Scrolls Skyrim where you had to ascend the near endless stairs and pathway to reach the mountain peak or the throat of the world as it was called. The old ancient stairway was apparently barren and ancient over the years of the dwarves' absence of this place. The place had been left neglected and ice and snow was forming on the stairs, making it quite dangerous to walk in case if somebody slips. Not to mention heavy buildups of snow that could cause possible avalanches and rock slides from loose rocks or eroded dwarven architecture and cave-ins from unstable mineshafts as Tio warned him of the dangers of this mountain. Akane told Naruto that it was quite regular for dwarves as they are sometimes not that careful with their mining jobs as they never took health and safety seriously and would often get themselves into deep trouble. One of the possible dangers would be that they would dig too deep, but they would always shrug off the dangers because they were tough little buggers. They had been walking for a few minutes and Naruto was getting worried for some of the girls as not all of them were used to cold climates, especially the upper-class girls and women who were showing signs of possible frostbites or numbness. Fortunately for them, Tio had finally found the abandoned mineshaft. Naruto inspected the inside of said mineshaft of any possible hostels or any way they could get in but it was fairly deep into the mineshaft and there was indeed an area where the draft of wind did not reach. Further in, he found where the tunnel had caved in and he was certain that nothing would be getting through that. So he headed back to confirm that the mine shaft was indeed safe and they all rushed inside as all of them were desperate to get warm and get out of the cold. They found a desolate area where the draft could not reach and was deep enough for them to escape the bitter cold outside. They were now gathering up any sort of retrievable firewood they could salvage from anything they could find, like barrels, crates and other burnable materials. When Naruto returned with a sizable collection of burnable firewood, he saw Akane desperately trying to light a fire with some flint and steel. The sparks were just not enough to light the fire and she was just about to swear and curse at the campfire when Naruto crouched down and brought out his Zippo lighter and set the campfire ablaze using pieces of dried up wood and had set up a roaring fire that soothed everyone's skin with its pleasant heat. The girls surrounded the fire feeling slightly relived but they were still cold, asterisk growl, asterisk and hungry. The sound of growling beasts left the girls flushing in embarrassment. Ah crap. Of course they are going to be hungry. How long has it been since they last ate, he smacked the upside of his head. We can't go out now and search for possible food in these mountains, because the snowstorm would have settled in by now and I am not risking myself to get lost in these mountains. I doubt they could eat my rations and keep it down. It's not exactly filling as I would say. They need something to keep themselves warm, refreshed, and fill themselves up to last through tomorrow. A little warmth can go a long way, but where would I find a suitable source of nutrition? He got his answer at the corner of his eye as he spotted two gigantic orbs belonging to the Minotaurus. No one could see his expression or sweat drop as he stared uncomfortably at her breasts that were filled with enough milk to feed the entire room. How in the hell am I going to explain this? he face faulted behind the mask. He eventually decided to take the safer option in asking the level-headed Geislane about her friend's milk. Pust. Geislane, he whispered to get her attention. She turned towards the whispering Naruto only to come face to face with the scary mask that almost made her jump up in fright. Why are you still wearing that scary mask? 
And why are you whispering, she deadpanned at Naruto. Whoops I forgot I was still wearing it and I'm wearing it because dash, he was about to explain until Geisling just yanked the mask off and over his head with a strong pull. Ow. Careful with that, you could have pulled my hair out. He recoiled in wincing pain. Why hide that face of yours? What is there to hide? Geislane blushed at the Adonis-like face. My identity for one thing, but that's not why I am here. He rubbed the side of his head to ease the pain from his hair roots being tugged and decided to ignore the whole identity covering issue for now and focus on the task at hand. Then what is it? Erm. W what can you tell me about Cathal's milk, he asked awkwardly. Pervert, she stared at him blankly and responded accusingly, but misunderstanding the meaning of the question being asked. No 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 it's not that. The girls are starving and they are still cold and weak and I need something very nutritious and warm to keep them from freezing up or crashing out from fatigue. He reasoned. I see, for your information, a lactating female monotures and a female centaur's breast milk are a highly nutritious source of dairy food and drink. It is sought after by many for both good and bad intentions. It can also give newborn babies a higher immunity to diseases and stronger bodies when they grow up. I see where you are going with this and I agree with your plan. She nodded in agreement. Excellent and I am glad that you agree, could you get it? He asked her. Geislane went suddenly silent in a very awkward way. Her eyes just slid to the right and she suddenly turned silent and was lighting up a flush in her cheeks furiously. I, I do don't think I can. She hesitated. Why not? Naruto asked while raising his eyebrow. Because it's embarrassing, she said in a very cute way when her ears and tail twitched and lowered. You are friends are you not? How does she get the milk out? Can't she do it herself? He asked. No, she always needs help from a skilled person who can milk cows or goats or a certain suction tool that our quest giver gave to her because she does not like going to famers who may have some ulterior motives later on and try and take advantage of her afterwards, but she lost the tool earlier on, she explained. So how else are we going to get it out? She stared at him until it dawned on him. You're not serious, he stared at her in disbelief. I will admit that earlier you do have skilled hands in, milking. She stammered in embarrassment at remembering the scene a few hours ago. Yes, on actual real cows at a farm I visited a few times and volunteered to help at. Naruto recalled the times where he was issued to do voluntary work at a farm somewhere in Herefordshire. I'm sure she wouldn't mind you helping out with her milk problem. If she does not milk her breasts regularly, they will become swollen to the point of it becoming uncomfortable for her and even painful if left ignored over time. Also she will agree if her milk is being put to good use. I, see. Hopefully she won't kill me afterwards. Naruto muttered and went to find Cathal. He spotted Cathal who was sitting next to his bergen and inspecting her and his, borrowed, sledgehammer, comparing the two and inspecting the strange comfortable grip. Cathal looked up and noticed Naruto without his mask on. She didn't know what was up with him, but she liked the way his face looked a lot more than that scary mask. He appeared to be calling her over by doing ushering gestures with his hand. So she got up from her spot by the wall and went over to where Naruto was which was out of view from where the others were and were none the wiser as they had all crowded around the pleasant fire. She found Naruto and Geislane who were looking quite uncomfortable by the way they were shifting in their spots. Yeah? Anything you need? In a sense, yes. Naruto nodded. Just don't freak out on me when I tell you this. I won't, what do you want? She asked, apparently she looked quite laid back about it, or so he thought that she would be cool with it. Okay, I'm going to need to milk you. Back at the campfire every person was in a state of warm bliss, but that moment of bliss was interrupted by a loud moment of eeh, that they swore they heard deep in the caverns, but they soon ignored it and went back to focusing on the fire. Back to Naruto, he was being held up against the wall with Cathal towering over him and holding him against the wall like an angry bull. Her face was flushed bright red and her lips were twitching. 
Why why you want to do what now? Okay that came out a bit wrong. Look I'm not joking when I say this. But those girls are starving and we need your breast milk. I can't believe I'm saying that. Yes, we need your milk to help them strengthen their bodies back up. As they are now, they won't be able to make it down the mountain if they don't have anything warm or nutritious to help them survive. Naruto hoped he had convinced Cathal and thankfully she had calmed down. Lime warning. I see, well. She took a deep breath and unclasped her leather breastplate. Naruto froze on the spot when her breasts had popped out of the chest piece or leather bra thing. The pair of breasts were bigger than his head and they were pretty swelled with milk. He remembered what Geislane had said that it can get quite bad for Cathal and other lactating minotaurs, as well as for female lactating centaurs if left alone for too long. If you make it hurt, I will send you flying off of this mountain, she threatened, but it wasn't convincing enough with that bright pink blush on her face. This day just keeps on getting weirder. How the hell am I supposed to milk these? Naruto blanked out and did not realize he was still staring at the massive chest. D don't just stare at them like that. Cathal stammered out in embarrassment. Ha. Huh. Ah, okay air. Oh right. Naruto suddenly remembered what to do at his experience in milking cows and sheep the old-fashioned way when he was at the farm somewhere in Herefordshire. He pressed his hands on both breasts and they sank right in. Holy shit. They're natural. Wa shit. Pay attention to what you are doing sergeant. Moo, she moaned in what appeared to be pleasure. Naruto hoped he was doing something right. Naruto then ducked down to avoid a flying fist from an irate cow lady whose face was completely flushed at what she thought was him groping her lecherously. You son of a dash. I said milk me, not grope me you molester, she swung her fists around wildly. Hey. 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 Calm down. This is the way I learned how to milk without making it so rough on the animals that I was milking according to the farmer's wife I learned it from. He placed his hands back on the nipples and the areola of both breasts and started to massage them by pushing both breasts up and down quite skillfully and then pressed them together. Milk does not come out by forcefully squeezing them out of your breasts. First, you have to massage them in order for the breasts to relax enough to the point when it would make it easier for the milk to flow out. Well, that's how I was taught. He said concentrating on both of the breasts while not paying attention to the look on Cathal's and Geislane's faces as he was massaging the two breasts and handling the situation like a pro and not stammering, blushing and nervously touching them like a virgin boy or a perverted old man roughly manhandling them because he got lost in his own lust and then began to violate them. Cathal had never felt anything like this before as the tool she would use and the farmers that used to milk her before were incredibly rough and the farmers would always try and take advantage of her afterwards for their own personal pleasures or profiting gains until her friends would intervene or she would punch their lights out. But this young man, this Adonis warrior, was making her feel rather relaxed and his sensual hands were gliding through the soft orbs and she could feel the milk lobes and the ducts loosening up. She then could feel something rising in her chest and it felt as if a dam was going to burst. Ah, uh, ahahaya. En Naruto I I am gonna, ahahich, her breasts suddenly without warning had suddenly burst out milk from her nipple ducts and milk splashed all over Naruto's hands. There we are. Now Geisling could you get something to pour all of this milk into so we can heat it up. There should be a metal pot inside of my bergen with a wooden handle that you can use. Geislane had blanked out and her face was lit up bright red and there was a notable drool trailing down her lips. Ah. Erm yes will do. She shook her head trying to shake off all the naughty perverted thoughts plaguing her mind. She took a glance over at Cathal and her breathing had shallowed and she was noticeably twitching in some areas as she had now become really sensitive. As of now, her breasts were now leaking milk. Geislane quickly fetched the pot that was big enough to feed the whole group. Now could you hold the pot and catch all of the milk that pours out? I don't really want to waste any of this. Naruto asked of Geislane who didn't complain and held the pot underneath Cathal. Now we can squeeze. 
Naruto then placed his hands back on both breasts and placed both nipples in between his middle and ring finger and tweaked the nipples a bit before he squeezed the giant breasts together and milk just poured out like a raging torrent. Ha, huh, she moaned. Wow, that's a lot of milk you've stored up. The volume is quite amazing. Stop describing this. You idiot. She tried to sound tough but she could not help, but feel alive. He was a natural at this and it made her feel safe, like she could trust him. Almost done. Naruto kept on rubbing, squeezing gently and massaging sensually like you do to a lover that it made Cathal feel like putty in his hands, but Naruto was currently unaware and too preoccupied with the task than noticing what he was doing to Cathal. And we are full, well you still have plenty of it stored up but it shouldn't be problem anymore. He wiped his hands dry while also discreetly tasting the milk. Wow this is really good, dairy farms have got nothing on this. He hummed to himself while tasting the milk. He turned to Geislane and pointed back to the way where the whole group was resting at. Could you take that to the campfire and heat up the milk? Hopefully that will help with their nutrition problem and maybe heat up their bodies and help them sleep, he said to Geislane who nodded and carefully took the pot over to the campfire. Naruto then turned around and saw Cathal on the ground leaning on the cave wall breathing heavily with a few twitches here and there on her body, a few sweat droplets trailing down her body that seemed to give her a healthy glow on her skin. He then noticed that there was a small patch of dampness forming on the ground in between her legs. He then looked back up and saw there was glint of lust in her eyes and a look that clearly stated longing and wanting. Uhu crap! He gulped until he was grabbed by the collar and pulled in towards her now shorter eye cup sized breasts that mashed in between his face. Narukun, she moaned, you bastard, that's not fair of you, to make me feel like this. She said sensually. Oh Kami, I made her, aroused. If this was the result of doing this to so many cows back home then I would be really scared. See Cathal? W what are you doing? he tried to say to while moving his face to breath as his face was sinking into her breasts like quicksand and the milk was being rubbed onto his face from her still leaking nipples. You made me feel, so good. No one has ever made me feel like this when milking me. It would usually hurt. You are the first person to actually treat me with so much tenderness and care that I, want more, of you. She then kissed Naruto on the lips. Naruto's eyes then widened in shock, but then later kissed back to return her feelings. I don't know why this has evolved into something like this so quickly. I only did a simple favor for her and now she's, kissing me like I am her lover. Even human women back home are not this quick to evolve in relationships. They kissed for about a minute before they separated with a trail of saliva still connected with one another from their lips. Naruto then noticed the image of where he was at. He was straddling a 7 foot 7 inch FT woman while he was at 6, 1 slash 2, FT so he was reasonably tall and well built for a human but in this world he was far more developed and healthier than the men of this world. But Cathal had all the right muscle, curves, firmness, softness to not be considered unattractive. He looked at her face and blushed as he realized that she was actually pretty cute and beautiful with her sandy blonde and black hair also tied into a ponytail. Her horns, cow ears, cow tail, and her legs that had hooves and also covered in fur would repulse quite a lot of people back home, but not Naruto. He could never judge her by her appearance and he accepted the difference in appearance and simply didn't care if she was any different to him in terms of looks. He noticed his hands were placed on her toned and greatly defined six-pack abs that were smooth to touch and dense when they were tensed. Cathal grabbed onto Naruto's right hand and placed it back onto her right breast and began to make him knead it. Cathal, I. I don't think we should be doing this. He gulped as his cheeks were flushing up steadily. Please Naruto. I. I want this. Please don't reject me, her eyes shimmered into his as they began to moisten. But, they may hear us. Am I, that repulsive to you, she lowered her head down in sadness. You think that I look disgusting being part animal don't you? Where the hell did that come from? 
Naruto frowned and decided to put her concerns and sadness to rest as he could not bear seeing her all hurt and sad inside. He gave her a reassuring kiss on her lips that ignited the spark back into Cathal. He separated from her and looked her straight in the eye, Cathal. I don't know where that self-loathing came from, but I do not think any less of you. Who cares if you are a Minotaurus or that I am a human? You are yourself, a person, not an animal. I am not disgusted by your animal features at all, in fact I find it cute. He proclaimed to her. See cute. I idiot w where is this coming from? No human has ever thought of us demi-humans as cute or attractive, she stammered and looked away. Well then they are the idiots. If people are that racist and prejudiced towards your race and others then to hell with them. I hate people who judge themselves to be superior towards others whom they don't consider as equals according to racial differences. Naruto, thank you. She smiled genuinely and grabbed onto him and pushed him to the ground and mounted on top of him. Out of the lime, and into the lemon. My first lemon mind you. Oof. Whoa, he landed quite roughly on the ground and he stared right up to see a wet loincloth tied around Cathal's waist and covering her wet pussy and toned ass. She had quickly stripped off her leather quizzes and placed her crotch right in front of Naruto's face. She was fumbling around with the black kit of the tactical fireproof jumpsuit. How do I take this off? Oh it's one of those teeth sealed things again. H hold on I'll get that, said Naruto as he fumbled around to find the zipper to his black jumpsuit and pulled it down while detaching his tactical assault vest from his chest and placed it at the side. Once the jumpsuit was down to his waist he uncoupled the button to his combat trousers and released the beast that was straining inside his boxers. Cathal was deeply surprised when Naruto's thing burst free and slapped her on the chin. Her eyes widened in shock at the size. She was honestly not expecting him, a human, to be the size of an average ogre or minotaur male. Wah, how, how big is this? Erm, 10.5 inches long and 3 inches thick. Why is it weird, he was scratching his cheek nervously. Naruto, you are about the same size of an average adult minotaur. Really? I thought that it would just scare off women with the size of it. I thought they would be put off. Seriously, you are probably the most gifted male in all of these lands. How could you think that women will be repulsed by such a deliciously thick cock? Especially by a wonderful, strong and charming man such as yourself. Probably because I never thought it would fit and I would just end up hurting them. Naruto not every woman is as delicate as you think. There are some that are actually pretty tough and can deal with the pain. Why do you think us women can deal with our cunts being so stretched out when birthing out a child? Air, good point. As he would have blushed at such a blunt description of her vagina and just shrugged it off and thought of it as the differences in terminology as this world was similar to that of medieval Europe and ancient Rome so their terminology of things would be different to that of modern times. But Naruto did not mind as he socialized with the Scottish SAS members who were tough people and they would normally speak their minds and would often swear a lot in their conversations, plus they were a good laugh. Also it's not just the size that you should be concerned about if you don't want to hurt anyone during sex, it's also how you are treating them during sex. She explained. Okay, as he was curious as to her knowledge of sex. She must have been taught by someone. Didn't Akane say she was the forgetful one? For example there are a lot of males in these lands here that use sex as a way to relieve themselves for their own pleasure and not the females. There is no love in it as they just treat them as a disposable object and always go too far with it and end up hurting them or worse breaking them. They do not care if they hurt them or break them as long as they can get themselves off. Minotaur males are exactly like that and they always treat us females as nothing but breeding mothers. They would also fight one another for the right to mate with a desired minotaurus that it's become unbearable to cope with them treating us like objects. She slowly tensed herself as anger was slowly rising but suddenly, mo, she let out a high-pitched squeal as she felt a warm and wet tongue gliding along her pussy lips that made her jolt up in surprise and pleasure that overtook her coming anger. And Naruto? 
W. What are you doing back there? Oral sex. He answered simply as if it wasn't a big deal as he had pulled her loincloth aside. Why'd you ask, why would you lick my cunt? I pee from there and that is where offspring come from, she asked curiously. You don't know what oral sex is, he asked her in slight disbelief and ignoring her bluntness as she answered him with a no. He resisted the urge to face palm, just how backwards and primitive is this place, he sighed and explained it to her. Oral sex pretty much involves using my mouth or tongue to pleasure your clitoris, the inside of your vagina or several other places where I could perform oral foreplay on you. The same can be done with females doing it to a guy by using her mouth to suck on my cock or balls, whatever to get me off. Asterisk sigh, asterisk can't believe I am explaining it to an adult. Oh, right. Do your people normally do that? I find it as a way to truly express love for you and your partner slash lover. Otherwise, they really aren't getting anything back from it if it's just one of you performing it, unless they enjoy the taste. Naturally Cathal got curious and poked her tongue out and poked at the tip of Naruto's dick albeit quite reluctantly. Cathal you are going to have to be a lot braver than that if you want to make me feel good. Give it a good lick, you might like it. Naruto encouraged her. Cathal gulped nervously and this time glided her tongue over the tip where there had been a bit of pre-cum that had leaked out and she gathered quite a bit at the tip of her tongue and she found it quite delightful. It tastes, quite sweet, mmm this isn't so bad. She felt a little braver and placed her mouth on the tip and swirled her tongue over the tip of his penis. Why yeah, you've got it, ngh. Now try sucking on it, he suggested to her and she responded in kind and taken more inches of his penis straight into her mouth. That's it, for a first timer, ah. You are good at this. Actually, how the fuck would I know? I've never had this before. Mmm. -hmm. Cathal was bobbing her head up and down actually reveling in the taste by sucking, licking and slurping on his rod of steel. His taste was so intoxicating to her, his pre-cum tingled her taste buds and sent her mind in a haze and wanting more. I, he tastes so good. What would he taste like if he comes, oh by the gods. I want his cum, she thought greedily and began to pick up the pace and the effort and used her powerful lungs to suck him off even harder. G-U-H. Naruto groaned and clenched his teeth together. Holy sweet Kami she has got some lungs on her. I think I should return the favor before she makes me come before I can pleasure her. He thought with determination and then set out to work on her honeypot that was leaking sweet juices. Mmm, -hmm. she moaned in bliss with Naruto's penis still in her mouth, the vibration of her throat made Naruto groan further. He then traced his tongue over her clitoris before plunging his tongue straight into her sweet honeypot that was gushing out her juices. Just then, they began to feel something rising in their loins and it was calling for them to be realized. They both knew what it was and picked up the pace even further and they both reached their climax together. Cathal sprayed her love juices into Naruto's face and into his mouth that instantly filled up like a raging torrent as did Naruto poured his hot cum straight down Cathal's throat, who took big gulps as he still continued to come. Even after the average time for a normal male to come, Naruto and Cathal still continued to come into each other's mouths. After 30 seconds of non-stop coming, Cathal stood up with a shaky step and started to strip more of her armor and clothes off and sat herself down by the wall to take a breather. Once she spotted Naruto's dick she was pleasantly surprised to see it still attaining its hardness. Wow, you are definitely a real man. Most men would be soft right now then to be able to go a second round, even after how much you just released. Cathal please. I am known to have outrageous stamina that I could outlast anyone in a fist fight or a marathon. I will not go soft or tired unless you or I are satisfied. Cathal then giggled at that which Naruto found to be quite sexy and cute. She held out her arms to welcome him in. Then by all means, take me you blonde-haired sexy beast. At once my lewd dairy cow. He walked over and took his black long-sleeve shirt off to reveal his well-defined and balanced muscles that looked to be sculpted from marble, but had the hardness of steel. 
His jumpsuit was tied and hung low below his waist just under his penis and balls. Cathal opened her legs to invite him in and revealed her pussy that had a little blonde fuzz above it. The size of her vagina was actually pretty normal for a minotaurus, although he had expected it to be a bit bigger. Now he probably knew why Cathal and the other minotaurus don't like their male counterparts if they have overly large penises that could probably tear them apart. Especially Cathal's, as hers looked to be quite tight. Nevertheless he started to rub his tip around her pussy lips to tease her a bit, making her moan and then she started to groan in want until she grabbed him by the shoulders with her powerful hands. Oh stop pussyfooting around and fuck me already, she said aggressively as she positioned her hips towards his penis. Naruto raised his eyebrow and shrugged and brushed it off as not understanding the intent behind it. If she wants a fuck, then she will damn well get one. He then thrusted all of his length in one go until he froze on the spot as he felt what was like a barrier being breached and noticing her wincing and her biting her lip in pain and pleasure. Cathal? Are you? Why yes this is my first time. She confessed and did not look him in the face. Oh geez, look, if you are feeling uncomfortable with this we can stop if you want. Wah, but why? Don't you want to pleasure yourself? I just gave myself to you and you don't want me, she said with tears now pouring out from her eyes. It's not that, I am not a person who does this all for my own pleasure. I just don't want to see you or anyone else hurt because I was being selfish. Cathal's eyes really widened and moistened even further as she now felt butterflies in her stomach. Do you really not mind us demi-humans? No. Why would I? Plenty of people who I know would be ecstatic to meet one, even other races. No Cathal, I find you to be a beautiful woman, no matter what race we are. He caressed her face gently and she leaned into his touch. Cathal bit her lip and brought her face towards Naruto's and kissed him again. She separated after a few seconds, if only there are more men like you Naruto. Do you want to continue? Please, it doesn't hurt now, please make me feel good, like I am your lover. Then by all means. He pulled out and the tightness of her inner vagina muscles gripped and contacted and then Naruto plunged straight back in and Cathal yelped in pleasure and bit on the lip to lessen the noise. Let's go. He smiled while placing his hands on her curvy hips to prop himself up as he began thrusting inside her pussy. Eminem. Moo, she gripped onto the cave wall as Naruto dipped his head low to glide his tongue over her abs and belly button. Cathal was not sure why, but she didn't complain as she liked what he was doing to her. She greatly appreciated his tender care and concentration of her own pleasure as he seemed to be engrossed in her body like he actually wants her. Naruto then reached for her bosoms, grasped onto them and then started to knead them again and placed his own mouth on the right nipple. No no, I am sensitive th She couldn't keep herself quiet as milk started to flow out of her breast again and Naruto was stimulating the nipple bringing her over the edge as she came from her breasts as milk burst out of the nipple and into Naruto's mouth who gladly drank what she had to offer. He then looked straight into her eyes and she did the same and stared into those deep ocean blue eyes that seemed mesmerizing to her as it seemed to just go on forever. Delicious, he said sensually while smiling at her while her breath had hitched and her face lit up. This man was pushing all of the right buttons inside of her and she wanted more of him. Faster. What was that? Please. Go faster, harder. Beg me. Please Naruto-sama. Please fuck me with your magnificent rod of steel, she begged out loud out before really squealing in delight before she got what she wished. While after several minutes of constant thrusting inside of her pussy, Naruto then changed position and lifted her up with great strength and pressed her against the wall with her bent down and showing off her glorious orbs of her toned ass and glistening pussy. He plunged straight back inside and proceeded to give her his own thanks of gratitude for earlier. Forgetting where they previously were, they had gotten lost in their own pleasures of each other's flesh and Naruto was slamming himself into Cathal's ass as it jiggled and the slapping of her ass against Naruto's abs turned them both on and they put up more effort into getting each other to come. 
Naruto had one hand massaging her ass feeling every muscle inside it while he used the other hand to stroke and tease her tail while she moaned in increasing pleasure. She stubbornly tried to deny to him that she wasn't enjoying it, but it was clear that she was. Cathal got really excited and frisky when she turned around and pinned Naruto to the floor and straddled him and hovered her pussy over his dick, pressing her gigantic orbs in his face and rubbing her strong abs over his. She then slammed her hips down and pierced herself and began to rock herself to an orgasm with the help of Naruto who continued to feast himself on her breast milk. Minutes later with Cathal and Naruto still in the same position and Cathal slamming down with great force when Naruto could feel something stirring up inside of his balls and his penis was beginning to expand. Ah. Uh. Cathal I, I am gonna see dash, he tried to push her off but Cathal pushed him back down and started to increase her movement in her hip and tightened her pussy to milk him of all he was worth. Do it. Do it inside me. I want you. She purred into his ear. B but won't you get. I don't mind if it's you. I am glad I did it with you. She kissed him again to silence him and then continued smashing her ass and pussy onto his dick until Naruto could take no longer and he had finally burst and erupted inside of her awaiting womb. The volume and the amount of cum that came out had also triggered her ejaculation and she released herself and cummed on his dick soaking it and his waist in her own juices. After a few minutes Naruto had filled her womb to the brim. Coating it white with his hot sticky and sweet cum Cathal place a hand where her womb would be and smiled lovingly down at Naruto. Naruto. I low dash. Clang, a metal clanging sound had alerted the two and they spun their heads around to see a shocked Geislane who was peeking in on them and she looked like a spooked kid who had been caught stealing out of the cookie jar whereas she had accidentally kicked the metal pot that was used to feed the entire camp. She was visibly sweating and blushing at the state the two of her friend and accomplice were in. G. Geislane. H.H. How long were you there for? Cathal stammered and blushed furiously in embarrassment of being caught. S. Since you were at the part where you and him were joined together down, there, said Geislane who likewise was the same as Cathal. What are you doing behind there? Naruto asked as she was hiding the rest of her body behind the corner. And nothing, she tried to wave off his questions as she discreetly removed her left hand out of her shorts. They want seconds. Huh. A. Eh. Naruto blinked while Cathal recoiled in shock as she had to provide food for them. I think it's best if we can serve the milk for now. Naruto suggested. Why yes it's best if we do that. My milk can keep a person up for a whole day or two before they can get hungry again. It should provide them with plenty of strength and warmth for tomorrow. Cathal nodded bashfully as she tried to cover up her breasts and quickly gathered her clothes and armor before she rushed off in a blur while snatching Geislane and bringing her with her. Huh. Naruto blinked and scratched the back of his head. He then had a good long hard thinking session at what he had just done. Shit, mom's gonna kill me if I get her pregnant. Then again, the whole world of Earth will be shocked if they hear the news that I did get her pregnant. He groaned into his hand. This is going to be so troublesome. I just know it, he sighed when he tried to move, but he couldn't. Gah! My back! Jesus! Those hips don't lie! Yewa, CSI Miami, OW! Fuck! He winced as he could feel his back and pelvis disagreeing with him. End lemon. I'm actually surprised that I pulled this off quite well according to my beta. I wouldn't dare touch this subject until now. On another note, please don't make it sound really creepy in the reviews like the comment sections in hentai sites about this lemon. Seriously they are really cringe-worthy. Elsewhere, Geislane was tapping her foot on the floor and stared at Cathal sternly as if she was scolding her little, or bigger, yet little sister on what she had done. So let me get this straight, you just offered yourself to him while you were in heat? Why yes. Oh Cathal. She pinched the bridge of her nose. Does he know? I, don't think so. Will you tell him? No, she looked away. Pardon? I, Want this feeling to last longer. 
I don't want him to feel as if it had meant nothing. I want what the humans have with their mates, to be together. Whenever I am with him. He makes me, feel wanted. She blushed to herself and smiled gently. Geislane blinked and her mouth twitched in amusement at her expression of her strong feelings for the blonde attractive deity in human skin. At least she was glad that she didn't have to worry about him taking advantage of her friend. So. How was he? Huh, she froze and blushed heavily and turned away. You know? Was he good? He, is well gifted for a human. He is as big as an ogre's and a young minotaur. Geislane's mouth gaped open and her eyes turned into a white circle as she did not expect him to be of that size. She could feel her loins heating up after that comparison. She tried to resist rubbing her thighs together to not show that she too was in heat, but Cathal didn't seem to notice. RRGH. Damn this cycle, it couldn't pick a worse time for me to feel like I want to jump on that delicious RO, gag. Now I want some of the action she had, she bit her lip together and decided to sleep off her tension back at the camp. Back at the camp, Naruto returned fully clothed and armored and saw that the rest of the girls and the knights were sleeping rather peacefully. He sat by the fire to warm himself up a bit. Once he sat down, he was suddenly alerted by a presence that was looking straight at him. He turned his head and saw Jaeger looking at him funny. What's up with him? Naruto thought with a raised eyebrow. He soon got his answer when he pointed up towards his ears and he gave them a little twitch. Then he smiled devious shit-eating grin and gave out a chuckle and shook his head and Naruto blanched pale white. Fucking sensitive hearing, he cried out inside of his head. 